in advance so that's one of the reasons why it's so special final no, he's improving he's improving um, I just wanted to tell a couple of things first of all this is the first stage main stage it will be live stream and recorded then upstairs we have two stages uh, proof of work stage by BTC play server round of applause for BTC play server they have a lot and uh, it will open 30 minutes after uh, Giacomo will finish his presentation, then we will open the proof of work stage because we all know that he's going to deliver a very nice presentation. <laughs> and uh, uh, hopefully, or this is your last time here, right? Uh, we don't joke in Eastern Europe. So, um, and another stage very special for us, it's going to be a uh, cyberpunk stage. No recording at all, no photo, no video. If uh, the security will see that someone is recording the cyberpunk stage, making photos, doing the audio, you will be escorted and banned from Honey Badger forever. So that's very strict there. And um, also we will open the registration desk uh, a bit later. I'm going to announce that and we're going to issue a special swag for every member of this amazing crew. Overall, uh, welcome, enjoy the show, and I'll give a place to Stefan Livera, our MC. Thank you. Thank you, Max, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back here again. It's a fantastic conference, the most OG conference, so I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you're all excited um, for our talk. Uh, just get ready. It's going to be extremely toxic, one of our most toxic members. He's going to come up on stage. I hope you're all ready because, uh, you know, it's going to be explosive. I can tell. I can tell. All right, so everybody, please put your hands together for Giacomo Zucco. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So, yeah, Max, uh, uh, Max is right. I prepare, I always prepare my presentation in advance. Uh, in this case, it was a huge advance for me. Uh, two days ago, I was here in Riga, I was thinking, what the hell am I going to talk about? And, um, and I, I mean, there was 20 minutes is not much, so I cannot go very deep. And it's very early in the morning, so I have to wake you up. It should be something spicy, something about some drama. I mean, I could do, I don't know, 
drive chains are retarded, but I just did ordinals in Prague, so that would be repetitive. So what could, what could I do? And I started to read what I always, I mean, what do you read when you need uh, guidance and inspiration? You need, to, you need some kind of enlightening, enlightenment. You read, not, uh, what do you read? The, not the Bible, no. Bitcoin Twitter, of course. Uh, Bitcoin Twitter. Not, not Nostra, because on Nostra there's not much drama, everybody's nice. So let's, let's, we have to go to Bitcoin Twitter, where a crypto influencer was getting ratioed. And so our, our favorite space cat was telling him, okay, you got ratioed. And the, the crypto influencer said, uh, yes, uh, ATIQ plebs liking a tweet certainly is a directional indicator of quality. And so something beautiful. Uh, so uh, Twitter did his thing. And so uh, Dan Webb said, going to start seeing ATIQ in people's Twitter handles. And people started to actually do it. And I, I cannot put all of them here. But then even like, uh, uh, like shirts started to appear. So you can really buy this. Uh, this is just recently happening. And companies like this is Relay. I'm an ATIQ app. And, uh, and we did it. We make it trending in uh, business and finance for a while. I mean, good job. Good job. So one of the guys changing his uh, name with ATIQ was our favorite space cat. In this uh, tweet, he was uh, criticizing the current uh, drive chains uh, com political campaign. He was saying uh, it's a massive red flag. Uh, fortunately, thanks to ATIQ plebs, it will end in nothing more than tears and rage quits. Uh, it's, also, it's also interesting to see that he changed the name to uh, ATIQ 13 percenter. 13 percenter is another meme. It comes from uh, this alleged uh, survey in which uh, uh, only 30 percent of uh, Bitcoin owners don't own shitcoins as well. So uh, people that are not into shitcoin, they proud themselves at 30 percenters. And somebody noticed that uh, if you really try to uh, guess the, to integrate the curve of the distribution of IQ, basically, you have about 30% uh, of people with uh, the 80, 80 IQ, uh, inside the 80 IQ part of the course. So it's, it's fine, right? It's, uh, it, it really, uh, it, uh, it works. So people started to, uh, to think about this uh, IQ distribution, uh, this uh, Gaussian curve, this bell curve, and, um, and, and then something else happened. The people uh, behind uh, Drive Chain, uh, they, they just hired a new meme uh, employee. It's not very good. And so they tried to meme, and they, they tried to answer to Odelnaut with, uh, with this. So in, uh, in this attempt, basically, the plebs, like the, the low IQ plebs, which uh, is the people they are trying to answer to, they are, they are basically pro Drive Chain. The midwits, the, the guys that are not smart enough to get it, but not simple enough to be humble, the, the middle, the midwits, we will talk about midwits a lot. I will explain this meme a little bit. Uh, the midwits are, are actually very enraged against uh, drive chains, and then the really smart people are again uh, pro drive chain, which is clearly, I mean, it was, it was very bad. But what happened, which, is what, which was very funny, was that somebody immediately came up, everybody was commenting, I mean, this meme is bad, your meme game is weak, the meme, meme did a land. And, uh, and then uh, somebody created this. So this is a meta meme. So, uh, ATIQ plebs is like, no, the meme did, doesn't land. And uh, very smart people, uh, no, this meme doesn't land. And only layer to less account, they really think that the meme actually did land. And so, uh, so for me, when I saw, when I saw this, was decided, okay, the talk is about the problem of Bitcoin midwits. And uh, I will go a little bit to explain what, is, what midwits are, what is this meme about, and how, does it, uh, how it does apply to Bitcoin to some degree. Uh, let's go to the beginning of this meme. Uh, you all know that memes like this started back in uh, 1670, when uh, Blaise Pascal uh, published his uh, philosophical thoughts. Uh, so basically, what, is, uh, what Pascal is saying in this book uh, and uh, elsewhere is that there are basically uh, three, uh, in this case, it's, it's talking about uh, uh, social hierarchy. So he says the peasants, the plebs, so the, the, the simple people, simpletons like the small people, they recognize 
social hierarchy, like uh, they think that noble people are very brave and uh, all the priests are very wise because they, they have stupid reasons to think about that. They, they, they only follow tradition, superstition. They don't really know what they are saying, but they, they get it. They get social hierarchy. Then there are some people that Pascal calls the demi habile. Uh, I think it's, uh, the, uh, pardon my French, as they say. And um, uh, the, the Mia Bill, so basically midwits, they are too smart to just, uh, to just follow tradition, to just, uh, to just uh, use social heuristics, to just say, repeat what seems reasonable enough. They cannot use simple heuristics. They are too smart for that, but they are not smart enough to really understand the complex uh, evolutionary phenomenons that created some, not all, social hierarchies. And so they just go like, okay, there is no hierarchy. Everybody is equal to everybody else. There is no difference in strength, no difference in culture, no difference in um, property. So they, they just become commies. And uh, so uh, Pascal was, was already thinking about this. And uh, if, uh, a little bit later, so basically in 2017, Another guy uh, went to 4chan, and he basically landed this meme. In this case, it's uh, centered on American politics. I'm not even sure I agree very much. I don't like Republicans very much. But I think that I could basically pass it as, uh, on many things, uh, libertarian Republicans like Ron Paul, that I would consider on that part of the spectrum, agree on some things with very stupid libertarians, like uh, very stupid conservatives, like, I don't know, DeSantis on this part of the spectrum. So I think there may be something there, even if, I, I, even if I'm not that uh, into American politics. Um, then uh, another, uh, a few years later, in 2020, another guy uh, basically started, this is another version of the meme with the, with the, pre, with the, with the monkey and, uh, and a unabomber. And, uh, and then he started the midwit memes uh, contest, and so this exploded, and it was used everywhere, basically. And uh, this is the, the most common version. So you see the, 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 simple, the simple, simpleton there, uh, the midwit, which is enraged because he's, he's, he's too smart to follow the stream, but not smart enough to really get it. And then there is the hoodie, the, the shadowy supercoder, then in the, uh, with some kind of uh, Asian features. So um, <laughs> this. So, so, some, some caveats, some caveats. Uh, so, uh, first caveat is I don't really believe in uh, IQ theory, uh, IQ determin uh, deterministic social theory. I think it's mostly bullshit and anti-scientific. I, 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 the way I love, the, the reason I love this meme is uh, because I reinterpreted it in another way, which is uh, where the, the horizontal axis is not about really, not about IQ. Uh, but it's more uh, about how, how seriously you take yourself. How much did you study a subject, how much time and effort you put into a subject, into, into a topic, and how, how, really, how seriously do you take yourself and the topic. And I think that the meme really works this way, because if you don't take yourself, to, uh, to yourself and the topic too seriously, maybe you can use some simple heuristics to actually get it, because the word does make sense. And uh, if you take yourself or the topic too seriously, but not enough, you tend to, uh, to be very, very wrong in a very, very important way. And only if you really get seriously serious, then you can actually get it. And mostly, most of the, not always, but most of the time you will agree. Uh, so it's not really an IQ distribution for me. It's mostly like a seriousness distribution. Either you, you are just shit posting, or you really have to do your, your, your homework, basically. If you stay in between, it's not going to end very well. The second caveat is that I love this meme, but I don't love any applications of this meme. Actually, uh, many instances of this meme are like very, very stupid. Like they are, mo most of them are like, uh, many of them are racist. But, but I don't mean racist like in American sense, like, uh, oh, how are you? Yeah, that's racist. No, I mean like real, re really racist. I mean, the, the, what a sane non-American person would call racist. And, uh, and uh, other, are other, this is racist, but uh, <laughs> others are very intelligent, are very smart. So basically, it's like, uh, it's like uh, very stupid people and very intelligent people like this meme. So basically, yeah, <laughs> the only people that, the, the, the stupid people and smart people like this meme. Uh, midwits don't. 
uh, because they, they only reason in galaxy brain terms, so it's always, uh, it's always uh, going up. There is, no, there is no curve, there is no, there is no trade-off, basically. So it's a, it's a meme. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you apply to, uh, to Bitcoin, basically? Uh, first of all, let's try to, uh, to imagine who in Bitcoin terms would be the simpleton, the, 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 the guy that really is just parroting uh, like uh, party slogans without any kind of reasoning uh, in behind. And so this is a, an example of the guy. This guy was a speaker here at Baltic Honey Badger a few years ago. And look at, I mean, look at how, uh, how simple and clearly wrong uh, his statement were. Like this guy was saying, uh, everything which is not Bitcoin is a scam. Uh, I mean, there is no nuances in this sentence. It's very, it's very, I mean, it's just a slogan. Every attempt at changing Bitcoin is a scam. So wrong. And then every attempt at pushing people to spend Bitcoin is a scam. I mean, oh, circular economy, we want that. And we should not be nice to scammers, which, I mean, we should be nice with everybody. So it's, it's so wrong, right? But, uh, um, but let's try to, to uh, how would a, a midwit react to that? So... The midwit, let's zoom in a little bit. The midwit said, uh, so for example, let's say the, the, the first sentence. Everything, so the, the, the ATIQ guy is saying, everything which is not Bitcoin is a scam. And the midwit is, uh, no, actually, that's not right, because there are useful and beautiful things that are not Bitcoin, are not scams, like chairs and cars and antibiotics and underpants and flowers and butterflies and the starry night sky. Some of those things are maybe even ICT protocols, the internet, Tor, Git. There exist instances of altcoin not launched as intentional money grabs like Namecoin. So you cannot say that everything which is not Bitcoin is a scam. No, you are a toxic, poisonous, puritan, anti free market gatekeeper. So, thank you. But now I have to zoom. I, had, I, I, I am an IT, uh, IT IQ guy, so I, I can just imagine. I just can try to emulate what the real smart guy will answer to that, which is this. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, multi-quantum scarcity achieved by consensus of a central decentralized network was the discovery rather than invention. It cannot be achieved again by network participants aware of this discovery, since the very thing discovery was resistance to replicability itself. Initial network effect of brand awareness, financial liquidity, code review, in power constitute a shelling point that helps the market to price the absolutely scarce original differently from the infinitely abundant clones with power low distribution. Free markets tend to converge and not diverge for low level infrastructure like TCP and money. That this create misaligned incentives in clone creators who enable to rely on Bitcoin-like balanced design and organic adoption, have to resort to fraudulent claims and unrealistic exploration of radically different trade-offs and centralized based shortcuts. Such broken incentives adapt to historically evident temptation connected to money printing, future reducing the probability of the honest and rational cloning attempts over time, even if that... Okay, I will skip a little bit. And, uh, and they, but the, basically, the end is... Since all these subtitles are hard to convey to newcomers, especially within an eternal September situation, and more compact general slogans fulfill an evolutionary role in every realistic epistemology and are going to spread anyway, and since there is a strong asymmetry between the natural money printing incentives and culturally mediated long-term wisdom, it's preferable to corroborate nuanced analysis of this topic with easy to remember prima facie heuristics that approximate the default best practices, like, for example, Everything which is not Bitcoin is a scam. <laughs> so I, I can do it again, but <laughs> I'm a little bit tired. So I, you can, I will publish the, I did, really did write this text. So you can, uh, this was partly a quote of, uh, of um, uh, Knut, and now there will be partly a quote of Gregory Maxwell. So I really did uh, spend time writing that, but I will not write everything. Uh, but like every attempt at changing Bitcoin is a scam, let's just read the midwit. No, actually the current Lightning Network cannot scale to 8 billion people. Uh, we changed base, laser, uh, base layer consensus with Taproot, and you were okay with that. Satoshi himself changed the consensus with our forks, uh, and you will have to change consensus relevant code anyway by 2106 due to the block A overflow. Ha, gotcha. So you cannot say, no. Oh. Uh, so this is my attempt at, uh, and, and uh, I also, of course, and please uh, use my FTX referral link below. Uh, this, you, know, you know the guys, right? Uh, they, they always end up like this. Uh, so the answer in this case uh, is also very long. I will not read it all. It's, it's partially quoting Gregory Maxwell and other people. You can read it online. But the end is basically, it's basically the same. It's um, since... Uh, blah, 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 it's preferable to corroborate nuanced analysis of the topic with easy to remember prima facie heuristics that approximate the full best practices, like for example, every attempt at changing Bitcoin is a scam. 
That's not true in general, but it's, uh, I mean, there are reasons to, uh, that I explain here if you, if you care to read it. So uh, these two examples, like uh, everything which is not Bitcoin is a scam, this is a standard Bitcoin maximalism, uh, do not change Bitcoin, this is like ossification party, standard maximalism as well, almost. But there are some very good 80 uh, IQ takes that are not typically maximalist or not necessary. Uh, some uh, laser eye maxi may even, I mean, when you find uh, somebody who is using the term laser eye maxi unironically, you know it's a midwit, like 100%, like it's super perfect heuristic if you use it unironically. Uh, so uh, some of them may disagree. For example, uh, two days ago at the Noob Days, there was, uh, there was Tony uh, from, uh, from Odo Odo, and he was doing a great presentation about acquiring Bitcoin, and there was this slide with two sentences. The first was, not your keys, not your coins. And the second was, KYC bad, P2P good. And even if uh, some maximalists even may disagree with this, I think they are very good takes, very simple. There may be a lot of nuances about that. For example, about uh, not your case, not your coin. The, the media could say, current scalability limitation prevent assigning one UTXO to every single payment. Lightning doesn't fix this because there are still too many people on this planet to assign everybody just a channel. So people are using custodial solution for tips anyway. At this point, we should just dismantle Lightning entirely rely on trust and third parties. Alfine was okay with that and so on and so on. So uh, also, speaking of which, please use my FTX referral link below. Uh, again, <laughs> I will not read all the answer, uh, but I think it's, I mean, uh, I think there is a reasonable long answer uh, that uh, will explain why at the end a, a very pretty good, good enough prima facie heuristic is not your keys, not your coin. If you teach that to noobs, they will be safe enough for a while, and they will, they will, they will be exception. They will not really follow you, but that's the goal, that's the objective, that, that, that's, that's basically the, the, the simple uh, slogan that where you can convey a lot of very, very important stuff. Same goes for the second, like KYC bad, peer-to-peer uh, -peer good, but no, because privacy obsessed nerds worry too much. The political confiscation they fear is not going to happen. We're going mainstream and Bitcoin will be protected by my government. It's just game theory. A senator said he lost Bitcoin in TV. Also, the main point of Bitcoin is transparency. Nothing to hide, nothing to fear. Criminals will not rob me. Cops will protect me and help me recovering my sats legally. Avoiding KYC and creating privacy is too hard. We will never reach mass adoption with that. And there is risk in coin join. What if I mix with Iranians and then I lose my permission to spend my money? So uh, also, maybe you can buy it using my FTX referral link after completing KYC ML process, of course. So uh, again, I, I disagree. Uh, well, smart people disagree. I disagree from the 80% IQ uh, point of view. I, ju I just repeat the slogan. And, uh, and this is another example. I think that we, we, can, we can find a, f a final, uh, uh, like a, a general pattern here. The general pattern is that uh, as uh, 80 IQ people, we use simple heuristics but in a complex world, usually simple heuristics, if they, if they evolved uh, in an adversarial environment with enough time, they, they tend to work. I mean, people can use simple heuristics to make sense of, like, uh, uh, don't answer to the email from a Nigerian prince. I mean, uh, in Nigeria, there may be uh, some kind of royal family, and some of them may be nice people, and maybe they really want to. There, there could be exceptions, right? But in general, do not answer emails from Nigerian princes. Uh, on, and so people here, they like to, like us, they, we like to follow very simple heuristic. We are simple people. We don't, li we don't like to go too deep. We don't take ourselves too much seriously. We also, sometimes we like to exaggerate, like to be uh, ironically stupid. We like to not, like, uh, we also like to cultivate uh, misinterpretation on what we say. Like people will, will try to misinterpret what we say, we will laugh about that and even incentivize that. Like case in point, my shirt today. It's, it's fun, it's, it's fun. Uh, we, we, we like that because we, we, we do not take ourselves too seriously. Uh, but then uh, there are the people that, do, that, do, that really do their hormones and they realize that there is a lot of stuff to say but not enough, uh, not enough time, especially during an eternal September. So they have to simplify the message somehow because the complex messages with a lot of nuances is, is not easy to convey and it will just get people 
wrecked, basically, if you do. Because people will just understand one part of it and not all of it. So you should go with the uh, uh, do no harm simple heuristics. In between, you have two phenomena, the Dunning-Kruger effect. So people that uh, started to understand something more than the simpletons, but not enough, they will greatly overestimate their comprehension of the phenomenon. And also, uh, the, the midway position creates a lot of engagement. Because if you really go deep, you become boring because you take yourself very seriously, you have a lot of nuances, a lot of take and counter take. If you are simple, you are funny, but you are simple, so nobody can say uh, how, how smart it is. Uh, while if you stay in between, you can appear smart to people, but uh, actually you don't, you don't get boring because you're not really, uh, you're not really uh, becoming serious. You're just half serious, you're just a midwit. So this is basically the, uh, the general trend. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, so why do I think it's a problem? Well, I think it's a problem because uh, midwits will uh, usually uh, get people wrecked. Uh, almost always, uh, this uh, half hest um, uh, uh, analysis will be worst, it will end up in uh, buy my shit coins, use my FTX referral link, don't do self-custody, uh, just put everything on Celsius. This is usually how it goes. And uh, there may be exception, but that's usually how it goes. So midwits are a problem. Midwits are dangerous. Uh, maybe not to Bitcoin, I think. Bitcoin is resistant enough. But midwits are dangerous to Bitcoiners, especially newest Bitcoiners. So uh, we should fight the phenomenon. Uh, how do you fight it? Can you eliminate midwits as a, as a process? I don't think you can, but what we can do is flatten the curve. So basically, <laughs> we could, thank you, we could try to, <laughs> let's, ha, this is like another very midwit uh, sentence to, to say. I mean, uh, everybody will say that yeah, unironically is also probably. But anyway, uh, you can tell people, please, if you don't want to take yourself too seriously, Stay there, come on Bitcoin Twitter and shit post with us. I mean, it's fun. Uh, there's a lot of fun to have uh, in uh, shit computer or, or, or NOST eventually when it becomes toxic enough. Uh, on the other side, if you really want to understand stuff, don't stop and easy hot takes. Try to really understand also what your communication is going to create in a context of an eternal September. So try to really go deep and try to think about wh what the fuck you're doing. And, uh, and maybe don't stay there too much. So for me, the interesting the interesting thing is this is not necessarily just a distribution. It's not that there is people like these, like me, and there is people like, like that, and then there are the midwits. This is also a path. When we start, we don't take stuff seriously. So we always, we always start here. And uh, we, we are having fun, we, are, we don't know much. Then we have the, the, the then we, we, we have to pass through the midwit valley, but the, 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 the idea would be stay here as much as you're comfortable because you're creating less damage, and when you go, Try to go fast. So even as a, I mean, let's not just fight midwits. Let's fight the midwit within. So that's, the, that's it. Well, so uh, Max, how, I, I'm going with the time because I will have last, last one. Well, I will do it. So let's do it. So just hodl, just hodl, right? That's a very simple position. Uh, no, money has to be spent, hoarding is wrong, don't fall for this Austrian right-wing conspiracy theory. All serious economists uh, with a degree know that the economy must be kept alive with money circulation. Saving is not using. Not only you should spend more than you save, but you should also spend more than you earn. Borrow money, use leverage. You should learn and understand technical analysis to be able to sell right at the top in the bull market and to buy back cheaper. Also, with your whole obsession, you are going to miss out all of the sweet yield from DeFi farming. Our season is coming, and you should ride it in order to stack more sets in the end. And maybe you can do that using my FTX referral link below. <laughs> so I will finish with the last uh, uh, 120 IQ take. This one I will read it all because it, I think it's, it's worth it. It's from a very high IQ guy, which is a, uh, I am hodling. <laughs> I type uh, that Twitle twice because I knew I was wrong the first time. Still wrong, whatever. Girlfriend's out at the lesbian bar, Bitcoin is crashing. Why am I holding? I'll tell you why. It's because I'm a bad trader and I know I'm a bad trader. Yeah, you good traders can spot the heights and the low, pit, pat, piffy, wing, wong, wang, just like that, and make a million of bucks. Sure, no problem, bro. Likewise, the weekends are like, oh no, it's going down, I'm gonna sell. <laughs> and then they're like, oh god, my asshole. When the smart traders know what the fuck they're doing and buy back in. But you know what? 
I'm not part of the group. When the traders buy back, I am already part of the market capital. So guess who you are cheating, day traders? Not me. Those town strats saying, oh, you should have sold. Yeah, no shit. No shit, I should have sold. I should have sold moments before every sell and both moments before every buy. But you know what? Not everybody's as cool as you. You only sell in the beer market if you are a good day trader or an illusioned noob. In a zero-sum game such as this, traders can only take your money if you sell. So I had some whiskey. Actually, on the bottle, it's spelled whiskey. Uh, whatever, shoo me, but only if it's payable in Bitcoin. What a talk, what a talk. Who's an ADIQ pleb? I'm, I, I'm an ADIQ pleb. Yeah, who, who's a midwit? Anyone? Any midwits out there? No? Oh, okay, we've got a few. Are there any 120 IQ super shadowy secret coders out there? No? Okay, we're all either ADIQ or midwits. Okay. Yeah, uh, they're over in the Cypherpunk room, which is actually opening now. So that's the announcement. Cypherpunk room and uh, the um, proof of work stage are opening now. And a uh, quick announcement, just to make sure you're using the doors down the very back, so you guys can see in the back in the corner there, that's the door that we're using for entering and exiting the room. So coming up next... We have uh, a friend of mine known as John Carvalho. He has, he's the CEO of Synonym. Uh, I enjoy my conversations with John. I think he's a, a Bitcoin conservative, and he's got some interesting takes on things. We're going to hear from John on his experiences as a lightning pioneer. So everyone, please put your hands together. Welcome John to the stage. Thanks, Stefan. Good morning. So the presentation is called Diary of a Lightning Pioneer. It was actually designed to be much longer than I have today. So I'm going to take a probably uh, bad idea and a risk of kind of editing the presentation to focus on the actual lessons learned. And so I'm going to be skipping some things. You know my name, John Carvalho. I'm going to skip over to... The first part where we talk about the beginning of Synonym, um, you know, it all started with me wanting to build a wallet, getting this idea while I was at BitRefill. And a lot of lessons today are I'm sharing are going to be about building a wallet. And so we're skipping to the part where I've already figured out that you can't figure out that the company, you can't force the company you work for to build a wallet just because you think they should. <laughs> um, but you can convince other people to give you money to do that. And that's what I did. And so I teamed up with Paulo from Tether and Bitfinex, and we formed Synonym. And the first thing we thought about doing was, well, we need to build a wallet. Maybe we should look at buying one um, and aqua hiring. You know, like, we invest in companies. Like, why not? This is not a real thing. Don't do this. You can't aqua hire a Bitcoin company because all Bitcoin companies are overvalued. And so what happens is, is you have these investors that expect some sort of reasonable return if you acquire this company. Um, and this, that amount starts at like $3 million, $5 million. So why would you buy a wallet? So our attempts to do this wouldn't work out, didn't work out. Um, we ended up hiring two developers about six months after we formed the company. Um, so six months lost, you know, researching, designing the company. And then, uh, you know, trying to buy Blue Wallet, that didn't work. Uh, and then we have the two devs, and we're on our way, right? So that's the first lesson is aqua hiring isn't really a thing. Don't think about it even if you think you have the resources to do it. Uh, everybody has their own investors that they have to deal with. Now, uh, talk about some side quests that I had to go on during the creating this wallet and creating this company. Um, one of them being the Lightning Token side quest, which I don't know if any of you know or care, I pretty much started. Um, I was at BitRefill once again and was asking them, would it be possible to do gift cards as tokens on Lightning? And they said, yeah, probably, and that was it. I, I had my fire under my ass and I was going to make it true. And so I got together with Giacomo, um, who was like representing RGB at the time, Fulger Ventures, uh, Tether, Paulo was there at the Malta conference, and I said, hey guys, let's, like, RGB just lost Al Alakos, and they were, weren't sure the f what the future was like. I said, hey, let's revive RGB for Lightning, and let's get tokens on there, and that's all I want. Um, that didn't go so well. Uh, I ended up um, 
dropping RGB for incompatibility reasons on a human level. Um, <laughs> not with not with Giacomo, not with Giacomo. Uh, but it just it, it wasn't a good fit. It wasn't coming along quickly enough, and we had to figure out something else. And we looked at Omnibolt. We actually fully implemented it. Um, it's actually a pretty practical way to do tokens on Lightning. I would say it's probably currently the best way, including Taro, everything else. Um, but there's still a lot of risks there. When we got to the point where we had implemented it, we were thinking about actually Aqua hiring the team that made it and bringing them into Synonym and totally saying, we're going to go all in on this. We're going to do business development to get people to support uh, uh, Omnibolt and Omni again because they had a lot of them had de like removed support for it because Tether wasn't popular anymore. That was a lot of wasted time. That was a lot of lessons learned about collaboration, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then we moved on to pair credit. So basically, w when Tara was announced, we kind of knew like that it was going to be a thing. We had looked at some of the early designs when it was still called CMYK. And we had tried to communicate like, let's try to play along and let these things compete fairly and not use unfair narratives. And when I saw the narratives that were used for Taro, I immediately knew I would never be able to compete with the looming future of Taro existing someday from the wonderful $70 million raising company. And so I said, I'm not going to fight this battle. It's a waste of time. And around the same time, I got to learn more about the topography of the Omni network. And I realized there were some problems there we would have to deal with and I didn't want to have to do that either. So I like had like this like crisis call with Paulo, and I'm like, "All right, can we do this without a blockchain? And is there some way that we can have this token bearer instrument issued credit?" And now we formed pair credit, and this is going to have its first private, you know, proof of concept and design complete next month. But it could be another year, two years before we see it in a wallet. And so I guess the lessons here are: be careful with, you know, being first, cutting edge things. Uh, I'll get into more detail about some of this, too, as we go. Uh, fun little anecdote here. Uh, I had a call with Michael Saylor um, back in the first year, or maybe the second year, of Synonym. And uh, his, like, glaring takeaway from every... I was actually calling him because he wanted to kind of meet me first before being on my podcast. Because <laughs> I think he was maybe making sure I wasn't going to try to troll him like Roger Ver. Um, and uh, his only like takeaway was just like, forget about all of the, the web stuff, forget about the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, forget about everything that you've told me about your whole atomic economy vision, focus on Tether on Lightning. That's all you should care about. And I gave him a huge argument. I said, no way, man. I was like, I have such a huge opportunity. These people, these people trust me, they believe in this vision, and they're willing to fund it and would wait the time that it will take to build it. I, I have to respect that, and I have to like seize that opportunity. And so I just disagreed with him, and I didn't end up interviewing on the biz. I just never followed up, whatever. Um, branding. This is one that probably all of you neglect, um, if not most of you at least. You shouldn't, because there's a very like uh, country-centric you know, view where you think, oh, I, can, I, I got the trademark in the US or I got the trademark in the EU. But then you're actually creating an international product and you're not covered. And so I'm lucky where we have like a really deep lawyer, not, not always lucky, a really deep set of lawyers through Tether and Bitfinex that we can work with. And finding a name is actually really hard that you can actually protect. And you have to if you're doing a business because people will try to attack your brand. I don't like IP at all. I wish trademark law was just banished, but because it's there, you're forced to play the game. Same thing with like MIT license. Like because there are licenses, now you have to find weird ways to deal with them. Um, this costs us a lot. Um, time, money, uh, just like you imprint on these brands that you invent for the thing you make, and then you, people take them away. Um, before BitKit, our wallet was BitKit, it was Spectrum. And Spectrum was also the name for slash tags. And then our wallet was Backpack. And we actually got, we were able to think, secure a little bit of that IP. But then we realized after deeper effort that we couldn't. 
And so we had to scrap it. Same things kind of happened with Block Tank. We had Lighthouse, then we had Chain Reactor. And now with Slash Tags, we're in, we've been in this process of waiting for registrations to get confirmed, and they're not because Slash Tags is actually a generic term that was used for a little while in the early days of Twitter as a different type of hashtag. And so it's a generic term, and you can't keep it. So we're probably going to have to rename Slash Tags. And we have a feature within Slash Tags called Slash Pay. There are multiple companies named Slash Pay, so we can't use that. You have to think about these things. They're going to affect you. I see names for your wallets that are totally unsustainable. Like, you can't call your wallet something like Blue Wallet. It's, it's not. Maybe it's so generic it will work. There are rare cases where you hit a really lucky thing. Like, if you call your gym something that is like a business term, or if you call your, your app something that is a food term. Like, if you find these angles where something is extremely inappropriate, but maybe appropriate here, you can, might get a sweet spot. But focus on the sweet spot. Our trick is we try to use compound words. So we try to take two words that make sense about the product and combine them, slash tags, bit kit. You know, um, this, this is an angle that is not fully saturated that you can kind of work on. The other is inventing names, like keep. Uh, this is much harder, and for me at least. So we usually go with the compound word method. Um, let's see here, UX. Uh, so I, I know a lot of you won't agree with this statement, so let me add some context to it. Anyone can do good UX. And that, all that really means is if you are honest with yourself of what you, what you are building, you will just know that what UX is is removing as, many, as much friction as possible between, what the user is, between the user and what they're trying to accomplish. And that's all UX is. And so if you're building something that is useful for yourself, for example, which is a great way to start, is make is dog fooding, they would say, using your own product, you're very likely to be pretty good at UX for that thing. Now, this gets tricky because in the Bitcoin world, a lot of the people making decisions are engineers. But the products aren't necessarily for engineers in a majority sense. And so you end up, and this is like rampant in Bitcoin, every wallet, even ours, and we make a real severe effort not to do this. Um, has like they speak in engineer terms, they speak in protocol terms, and users just don't give a shit. And so you you can't be designing from an engineer standpoint. And so if you are, you need to learn how to find other resources that can remove your bias to improve your product. We have like the Bitcoin Design Group, for example, which is like spun off of, of a spiral project. Um, they'll audit and review anything. They'll they'll go into your Figma. Like you have resources available to you, but probably just hire a good designer, a good UI designer, a good UX designer. Um, let's go. So I'll, I'll steal Giacomo's joking style and I'll say, a really smart man once said, do not accept dependencies for tech that does not exist yet unless you are the one creating it. This is like a very important rule. That's why I put it in quote form because I think people should be quoting me on it. <laughs> and how, whether you think that's arrogant or not, I don't care. But it's really important. Like when you go and when somebody says to me, are you guys going to support ARC? I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, <laughs> ARC doesn't exist. CTV doesn't exist. There's no implementation. I have no idea when this thing will be real to me. Um, and then people will, like, build something on CTV. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, these are, and then they get really upset. This is kind of like with drive chain, like, Paul getting really upset that people are, in, in misbe and the way he's pitching it, misbehaving about it. Uh, you're, you're not going to have the proper incentives in place. And so just make sure, I'm probably, yeah, it's probably better info here. So here's some examples. Being early sucks. Uh, we were early to RGB. We started implementing it. We learned that that wasn't was going to work out. We, we accepted a dependency that somebody else was creating. Um, we were, everyone was neglected by L&D Mobile um, for a while. It looks like maybe they're picking back up lately. I, I haven't been paying attention. But... You know, there was like Breeze, like wanting, people wanting like support for turbo channels, people wanting zero conf stuff, and just PRs sitting for years. And so anybody who was dependent on that is now kind of at, at Lightning Labs' whim. 
Um, same thing with Omnibolt. We were early to that, and we were dependent on somebody else. We weren't building ourselves. At least in that case, we were entertaining acquiring that team, and we could have accommodated that. Um, and even with LDK, like uh, we saw that Blue Wallet implemented it in testing, and we thought, okay, it's safe. We 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 want an alternative to LND Moodle. Let's jump in. And it, that jump in has been like a two-year process. You know, it, it, it's a lot of work to implement Lightning. Um, and like I said, about ARC, CTV, APO, things that don't exist are totally ignorable from a product standpoint. If you're a protocol developer and you want to be interested and you want to contribute to making those things real, great. But don't talk to me about product. Don't say your app is going to support something, that, uh, whatever. Like I saw, who was it, Zion, saying that they're a Web5 app now, back when, back when Jack was still promoting it, and now he isn't anymore. Um, <laughs> and, and I was just like, what do you, I even DM'd, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you're obviously just saying this because you want to ride on Jack. And I won't say his response. <clears throat> um, Lightning on mobile and Lightning Mobile sucks. I, I already talked about why Lightning Mobile sucked. Um, maybe it'll be better going forward. But Lightning on mobile sucks. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this because this is mostly just some details that were part of the narrative of the greater presentation. Um, a quick little anecdote that's interesting here is when we, I was in uh, the UK with the team and we were all sitting there wanting to pay for our lunch. And we were like, oh, let's use Breeze. And we opened it up, and none of us had used Breeze in a long time. And so it was like we were all waiting for it to sync, and we were like, how long is this going to take? And then we all started sharing our stories of how this is how it always was for us, for Breeze, because we didn't use it often enough that to keep it in sync, and we, didn't, we couldn't keep the phone open long enough to sync. So it was just in constant sync state. And then, because you behaved that way, when it did finally sync, your channels were closed, <laughs> and now you're like in a, in a you know, reset state. And we said, basically, that was the day in that, in that lunch where we decided, it was like, we can't do this to our users, and that was the day we decided to get rid of LND Mobile and, and go into LDK. Um, okay, this is a good one. Here's, here's a picture of me staring at my awesome vision in the future. Um, but the thing is, nobody gives a shit about your vision. Like, nobody does. I spent two years trying to explain my vision on podcasts for atomic economy and slash tags and this whole thing that actually is a real mental model that really fits together for me. You can't get somebody else to just download that unless they're on the same path as you. You just can't. Um, don't think that you can. And the lesson here underlying is collaboration is a red herring. Like, you don't collaborate with people, you align with people. And so if you are trying to do business development or trying to do uh, spec development uh, across an industry, you shouldn't be collaborating with people that are safe. You shouldn't be collaborating with people that, like, are friends of yours. You want to collaborate with as direct a competitor as possible. That's, this is counterintuitive, but it's the only time it actually works well. The example, great example, is the LSP spec group. In the LSP spec group, we have people that are glaringly direct competitors. We're all believing that our LSP is going to be the LSP that seizes all of the lightning liquidity and you know, makes lightning a success. We're all trying to do the same exact thing, but we all are efficiently collaborating on creating a spec for it. Because the reason why this works is the incentive is, the reason why I'll collaborate with you is because I want your users. And that's how you make collaboration work. You combine people that want each other's users. It's a hostile environment, but it, if you remove the passive aggression, like you usually see, like for example, in Bitcoin core development, it would, would, you know, there's a lot of passive aggression, there's a lot of policing, these kinds of things. You're not gonna get collaboration that works very well. Um, which is good in the case of Bitcoin. We don't want <laughs> a, a governance structure to evolve. Um, but yeah, find situations where people want your users and you want their users and collaborate. Like for example, I get along really well with Breeze. BitKit and Breeze are a competitor. I love Roy. Like we talk all the time about we should find some way to work together. Think about that. <clears throat> This is mostly like some promotional stuff talking about our wallet. Hopefully you guys have checked it out. The wallet is like an expression of these lessons. You know what I mean? We're trying to really think deeply and rethink and start from scratch with everything. And I hope you guys uh, help us test it. It's still in beta. 
we've got lightning mostly working, um, but there's still there's still a lot to, long, long way to go, a lot of things to fix. <clears throat> yeah, what the world needs now is another protocol, so we have slash tags. Um, be careful inventing your own technologies and, and, and not really respecting what that means. Um, I knew what I was getting into in this case, but a lot of people don't. Like, they'll float an idea that actually would take an entire company and ecosystem to actually become real, um, like a whole Web3 protocol or a Web5. They'll just float something. And in the case of Noster, maybe you can have some success, but you don't have this like cohesive design going into it. And so be careful like being a victim of the XKCD meme, like just creating another protocol. This is a rule I do not obey. Um, I think that I believe in like meta protocols to be able to sum protocols underneath and that's something we work on. But it's something to think about. Regulations. Um, just like with IP, uh, I've had a lot of my babies taken away because of learning the actual legal requirements. Um, Nobody wants to talk about it, and like people want to give people like Wasabi a hard, hard time for complying. You cannot run a business without following the law. You're very easy to find. There are extreme risks to breaking the law. And while you may think it's anti-Bitcoin, the alternative is to do nothing. And so, like, yeah, you can do nothing and, and imagine that free open source software will save the world. But it's not going to happen without actual good product designers, without marketing, without a real effort in the ecosystem, at least not in your lifetime. And so if you want to make things happen, you need business. You need there to be money behind it. So you're going to find, increasingly, that there will be conversations, like with Lightning, for example, where certain jurisdictions have certain limitations for their LSPs because VASP limitations and whether or not they want to get a VASP license this is happening to us, for example, we're in the BVI, and there, if you are risk averse, and we are because we are part of Tether, um, we, we can't do some of the things we wanted to do as an LSP, because in order to do that, we have to be a, a licensed VASP, and we could get that license, but I have a, like a, a personal rule where I never want my company to be something where we're an arm of the government, and I just can't do that. Uh, but this removes a lot more business models than you might think. A lot of business models you see in the wild right now in Bitcoin are illegal and at scale will be shut down. I mean, this like, is it's an illusion you have to be careful of. Um, this is also interesting in that it pushed us to do the LSP spec because what we needed was we don't want to serve certain countries for reasons like this, including the US and Canada, um, from a business standpoint, but we do want them to use our software. We want them to use BitKit. And so we want there to be an LSP open spec, so when a US user opens BitKit, it uses a US LSP, or a US friendly one, um, and when somebody else uses it, it uses ours. And this way you can still get the same user experience. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're winding down now. I don't know if I went too quick by editing my, my presentation, but we're behind on time anyway. So um, I'll mention here uh, a couple more points. Recruiting isn't easy. Um, it's been difficult to find the kind of t caliber of talent that we want. I imagine that there are various reasons for that, a huge one being we don't hire from the US. Um, but the US is pretty overpriced, in my opinion. Salary ranges very wildly. So if you don't think you can afford something, keep trying and trying different regions and things like this, or if you think that you have to spend a certain amount of money to do something, you might be wrong. Um, there's a lot to balance here, but just generally, I have seen like one position where the, the, where the person applying their required salary range was like, in their, in their, their competence was not different. It was very similar. I've seen somebody, one guy asked for 70K and another guy asked for 250K for the same position. So there's a wild range for things and try to find what the actual market rate is. Um, people will quit. You will fire people. Keep that in mind. Try to plan for the future. Um, like I was saying earlier, you can't, you can't build on sand. Um, you know, if things are constantly changing underneath you, then you're not going to be able to have an infrastructure that can keep growing up. And so an example with this is the whole zero conf thing with mempool for full RBF. 
everybody thought I was like being like biased to my own product and crazy trying to fight this battle. And there's like very few people that wanted to even fight this battle. But recently, like Bitcoin lost a really, really useful feature for spending Bitcoin and for Lightning, which is that we were able to before mitigate and quantify the risk exposure to accepting zero confirmation payments as, as merchants and as LSPs, which makes a, you can provide like a full instant experience this way. Um, but because of mempool for RBF, all transactions can be replaced by default and just basically in, introduces amateur double spending. And so because now we're in amateur double spending and it actually requires a very, very small amount of the network to turn on this flag, it's just dead now. So this means certain user experiences that we had planned for Lightning are just dead now. Like we can't do them. It means things, utility that users would have gotten is dead. And so just, I really wish that Bitcoin Core and all of you and all your things, just think about what you're building. Um, you have to respect the user space. You know, if, if you disrupt the user space, you disrupt, you, you disrupt the ground, you, you turn everything into sand. So be careful with that. Um, there will be bugs. You will eat the bugs. The, uh, the, there's so many bugs. You're always going to be dealing with them, especially if you're supporting Lightning. Uh, you just have to have a really good uh, quality assurance, you know, set up. You have to have, like, testing for every release. You can't be lazy about this. You can't be irresponsible with your users with a wallet. I don't know what all the other wallets are doing, but just as my advice to you, you know, making these kinds of products, these are security sensitive, money sensitive, privacy sensitive, like, you should take it seriously. Um, that said, real men call their alphas betas. And <laughs> what we did was we released the alpha as a beta and we launched it you know, roughly a year ago. And I would say we're about to enter beta, truly. <laughs> but I did it on purpose. Uh, you know, I, I felt like I didn't want to go on stage and be like, here's what we're going to do. And we learned a lot from it and we totally changed as a company just by shipping the product and having it out there. Um, it forced us to form all of these structures, uh, project management, we just got so much more disciplined and that's something you know, that you should think about as well. Um, finally, talking about collaboration, I said that you know, a lot of things went wrong and the only thing that seemed, the thing that seemed to work was competing, you know, uh, collaborating with direct competitors. I will say, it seems like that we have found a good match in working with Spiral. Um, and it, you'll see there's some similarities here. I, I would say that um, if you look at Blocks stack, you know, Tidal and, and C equals and TBD, uh, Spiral, it's a lot like our stack. Like we're, we're, kinda, we're, we're almost like the closest thing that you could say are competitors in Bitcoin. Um, but we get along fine. We both, because we again have the same goal. They're making LDK, but there's also a lack of competition in this collaboration where LDK is just making open source software, not products. And so there's, because things were broken into separate companies or projects, we were able to actually collaborate and we were now able to learn lessons about how to collaborate better. And so the best advice I can give you on this level is make sure your devs are over communicating with the people they're collaborating with or depending on. Like it's really hard to get devs to behave uh, less independently. They always want to fix everything themselves or at least try first. But the truth is like I, I tell them, I say, all the things in your head that you're thinking, just type them all out in their chat because like things will happen. They'll notice that you have some kind of misconception. They'll notice that you don't know that there's a feature for that. And, and things will just get fixed magically. And they keep asking us to help. And this is very, very, uh, very different and very useful. So I, I think this relationship is promising. It could blow up too. I don't know. Uh, and you have to be prepared for that. So know why you're here. Know what your app is for. Um, know what your responsibilities are, know some of these lessons and incorporate them, and uh, good luck. Thank you very much, John. That was a great talk. Lots of interesting and real-world insights there. And uh, so we'll move on now. We've got a panel, uh, and uh, so it's going to be on Lightning. Our guests on the panel, well, our moderator will be Aaron Van Widdem from Bitcoin Magazine, uh, also writing a book, also a Bitcoin uh, podcaster. 
We have uh, Sam uh, Wouters. I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Sorry. Yeah, from uh, River. We have Taj Dryjar. We have Justin Litchfield from uh, Voltage as well. Hey, good morning. Is this working? I think so, right? Has everyone got a mic? Hey, John. Yeah, all right. So, my name is Aron van Wittem. I work for Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Let's go from right to left. Okay. Taj. Uh, hi, I'm Taj Dreitje. Um I've been working on Lightning since before it started, I guess, or I <laughs> uh, wrote the Lightning Network uh, white paper with Joseph Poon back in 2015 uh, and have been working on Bitcoin stuff uh, at MIT and now I'm at uh, LightSpark doing Lightning stuff. So, hi. I'm John Cavallo once again from Synonym. Been working on Lightning since it was actually on mainnet, but not protocol. I'm Sam Wouters. I work at River. Uh, I make content, do research. So, uh, yeah, super happy to be here. I'm Justin Litchfield. I'm the. I I'm at Voltage. We run lots of Lightning nodes. I've been working on it since uh, quite a while, but there at Voltage for almost two years doing that full time. It's a lot of fun. All right. So, uh, yeah, Lightning, which obviously is kind of a big topic. There's entire conferences about Lightning. We're going to distill all of that in 30 minutes. So, so I wrote down some topics. I'm just going to throw them in there, and you guys give your opinion. That's sort of a the idea of a panel. So let's start with uh, Lightning is kind of going through a thorough of disillusionment, I think, is what it's called. Like people are kind of at least claiming that it's not working as well as sort of originally p promised or no one's using it or not using it in the intended ways. What's your thoughts about that? Is it, how successful is Lightning right now? How's it doing so far? Who wants to go first? I mean, it's very subjective, depends on your measure, right? Like, the overall node growth and liquidity growth has gone up, but it's not, like, hugely significant. So you could be disappointed in that if you really wanted, but why? I don't know. Um, and there, ha I have noticed, like, a, a little bit, and it, it's not as bad lately, but a little bit of a lightning sucks theme, like you're saying, um, and people wanting to focus on its shortcomings. But those shortcomings were always there. It's just maybe now we can see them and talk about them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it works a lot better than it, you know, just I don't, not in terms of like nodes or things, but just in terms of the actual software and payments getting through and things not crashing, it's certainly not at the level like that Bitcoin Core is, um, but it works a lot better than it did two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yeah, like it's, it's definitely a more complex thing. There's a lot of, you know, gears and a little bit of a Rube Goldberg thing going on there. But um, yeah, it's, it's way better than it was. So I don't know, that's the right direction anyway. <laughs> but yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't taken over the world yet. So maybe we have to wait a little longer. <laughs> yeah, I find this kind of funny when people expect it to take over the world because lots of people have, like even in Bitcoin, have never really used Lightning or interacted with it for... A large part of Bitcoiners, all they know is their exchange. That's where they interact with Bitcoin. And lots of exchanges has never integrated Lightning yet. So how are these people, like, they're not as likely to go ahead and discover Lightning and go play around with it unless they take the initiative. So why would sort of Lightning decouple from Bitcoin adoption and do far better than Bitcoin adoption has for the past few years when it's gone down? Uh, that to me just doesn't make a lot of sense. So people like to be very critical and, and in a way Bitcoiners are their own worst enemy there. Like we're super critical of Bitcoin, it's, it's crazy. Uh, but really like why would Lightning be doing so much better than Bitcoin has been recently? Uh, that's part that I don't really get and, and why I think like if I look at the data, to me it looks really interesting and promising and I'm, I'll be presenting about it tomorrow a bit, some of my findings. Uh, on like how many people are using Lightning now, etc. And from my perspective, it's like I'm actually like n not being an engineer who's working on Lightning myself, I am proud of what people have built and how much adoption there is uh, even after these years. So. Yeah, I would concur with uh, most of that. I think that, the, I mean, we have, we can see in River, I know you guys can see payment volumes are up, like it's growing. Uh, the network itself is kind of weird. Like we had this, um, a lot of narrative, like everybody was gonna get rich running routing nodes for a long time, which I think was like fairly problematic. Um, and that's calmed down a lot, thank God. 
Um, but, you know, it's hard to use. Your Bitcoin's at risk, but it's easier to use than it's ever been. It works better than it's ever been. It's the best time to build on Lightning there's ever been. Uh, and tomorrow's going to be better, right? Like, uh, there's so many cool things in flight. So I'm super bullish about it, even though, you know, the narrative can be a little bit down, but we're also at 26K Bitcoin or something. It feels bad. I mean, is there any sort of foundation for that narrative? Are you seeing growth slowing down at least? Like, what has, how has it developed over the years? I think it's kind of noisy to be able to say, you know, I think it's a little too noisy to say. I think the, the foundation of this is that Lightning was oversold in the first year. Partly my fault. I contributed to it. Sorry, I didn't get it. Who? I said that was partly my fault too. I contributed oh, right, right. to that. Like there was the reckless meme, and I said, "No, be reckless." And lightning's ready now, and and everybody, like he said, like people thinking people would get rich or something like this. Like yeah, when you when you set up a whole technology to like make promises and that it's gonna like make Bitcoin pump. If it doesn't pump and there's not a million people using it, then you are disappointing. Yeah. Well, I, so to make the critique or the the common critique a bit more specific. Many people will say, yeah, people are kind of using Lightning, but everyone's using cu custodial solutions. So are they really using Lightning? Is there any truth to this argument? It, how, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort of the same as Bitcoin, where, like, I, I don't use any custodial solutions. You know, but, yes, it, it's a lot harder. You know, custodial is easy. You go to a website, it works, or you have some little, like, you know, basically web page kind of app, and it works. Um, but... It's certainly possible to be non-custodial, and, and it's, it's better and easier than it has been. Um, but yeah, that's the same as in Bitcoin. I, I don't know if like the ratio of like, okay, what proportion of Bitcoin users are just using an exchange and custodial versus Lightning users. Um, there's, there is this sort of idea of like people, okay, I'm gonna buy a Raspberry Pi and run a Bitcoin node and a Lightning node, and, and yeah, the, the, I'm, gonna run, I'm gonna route and I'm gonna make money with my Raspberry Pi and stuff and, and get a, like a return on my Bitcoin. That part I've, I've always been sort of like, oh boy, like I, I sort of was like, maybe we shouldn't have fees in the first version at all because people are gonna like, it's, it's kind of gonna be like mining where everyone's like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make money this way and buy tons of mining equipment and mine in my basement. And like, I don't know, maybe some people made money, but generally no. Uh, same with Lightning, like, you know, there's way more supply of people who want to like, buy a product and, and plug it in and then somehow make a return off of it, then there is actual demand for like routing and stuff. Um, so yeah, you're, you're probably not going to make money of it, but it can be still useful. Like it, it does work for payments a lot. So. Yeah, the idea that custodial, I mean, so we are very passionate, like we build non-custodial lightning stuff. Um, it boxes us in in a huge way. We have so many product design meetings and stuff where it's like, yeah, we just can't. Like, this is just right out um, because we're non-custodial. Um, but there will always be way more custodial lightning. There's going to be more custodial everything than non-custodial everything in, like, the whole future of humanity. Like, we're people. We live in, like, these trusted systems. Um, we will build the tools, and we want people to use the tools that are the better tools, um, to be sure. Uh, but I don't have judgment against people that want to use uh, custodial solutions, and I don't think we should. Like, that's just the reality of people and markets and all of this. You can't fight it too hard. It does, does everyone agree with that? Like, people will just use custodial more often than non-custodial? Is that an accepted so, truth here? So, so far, panel? it's what the data says, like, re kind of regardless of what our opinion of it is. Like, there's, like, a certain amount of activity that we can tell on the blockchain itself. Like this is how many users there sort of likely are of the blockchain. And that means that everything else, everyone else interacting with Bitcoin is likely doing it in some kind of custodial way. So there's like, that is the reality in Bitcoin today. And it's logical that that translates to lightning today. Doesn't mean we should, and like I said, we're our own worst critics. So it doesn't mean we should accept it and like just accept that as a future and not try to improve things and allow more people to self custody. But for a lot of people, Bitcoin's a really big leap. It's that taking that responsibility of their own money and, and, and their own actions in a way, and getting them started in a custodial way can make it far more accessible, get them at least excited about what the possibilities are, and then maybe, hopefully one day, they'll take the step further where they start taking their own responsibility. But without that option in between, without the custodial option, a lot of people will just look at it and be like, this is too intimidating for me. And that's just something that Bitcoiners might need to realize is that not everyone is as 
believing in the technology as you are or is immediately going to make that leap to self-custody. Some people just need to be held by the hand and gradually step by step build up their knowledge and start taking that responsibility. I feel a lot differently about it. I, not that that, you know, that is wrong so much as you have wallets and you have Bitcoin and you have accounts and those are just not Bitcoin. And so you have to create this you know, separation between them. Um, what was I gonna say, sorry. I forgot. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there definitely are things, like obviously you want everyone to like compile their own full node and know what's, you know, be really informed about what's going on and run their own full node. And like, yeah, that's what I do, but like I understand that it's not what everyone's gonna do. But there's a lot of things that are helping make custodial stuff, but, you know, like Cashew and Fediment and things where they're like, okay, there, there are levels of custody here and that can be okay, right? Like I, I have been a custodian for family members many times because they're like, you know, you're at Thanksgiving and they're like, hey, can you get some Bitcoin for me from like an aunt or uncle? And you're like, yeah, okay. And they trust me. And like, that's sort of fine. And so, you know, tools like Fediment and, and things like that w can be great for that. And, and maybe then everyone, you know, it, I don't know that the goal is everyone runs their own node on their own hardware that they understand and stuff. That, that is sort of my goal, but like, I understand most people aren't going to do that. And so we, we can work on also solutions that like, can be custodial, but like not as not in a bad way necessarily. Hopefully, <laughs> I was going to say the realistic side of what I meant was I see kind of two possible futures for Lightning. One where we figure out a good user experience where people can run a node themselves just by installing an app, and that the LSP handles a lot of the, the you know abstracts a lot of the complexity. Um, we figure that out and it goes well, and Lightning actually is useful and it go, it's used in retail, etc. Or we fail at that for various reasons. There's a lot of reasons we might, um, just complexity to abstract them. Um, or we end up in a situation where lightning is used mostly for business-to-business for, uh, business -business settlement, where, yeah, people are, most people are just using lightning as accounts, and the actual lightning that's happening is between businesses to remove credit terms. Um, that's always going to be a use case, and you're always going to be able to make a network out of that. That will be, like, the minimum success of lightning, I think. What right now are the most pressing or important improvements that can be made to Lightning to make custodial, no, non-custodial use of it more convenient? I, I, I think... Or Lightning, or, or, or using yeah. Lightning in general. I think for, for what I'm looking at is like offline receiving, async stuff. And then, you know, there's like groups working on that. Um, just because if you want to use a phone, phones are not online most, like all the time. Most of the, you know, they're, they're very intermittent. And the big thing is like you have to be online to receive. And so there's, you know, work on that with like LSP protocols to, to make it so that you can still receive all offline. I think that's a big one. It's a, there are different solutions to get there, is that right? Yeah, I think the one that, that people are, I'm, I'm talking to people, I know some people at Spyro are working on it where sort of LSPs message each other and hold HTLCs for longer durations in channels uh, and sort of coordinate that, that uh, you know, moving the HTLC. That, I think, it, you know, from on paper, looks great, but, like, we don't have code to do that yet, but we're working on it. Right. Does everyone agree this is the most important thing? Probably. I mean, that's uh, we, I think well, we all was, agree on our wish it, list, It was probably. a question for the rest of the panel, like, Touch. Our wish list is, is async, uh, splicing, you know, things like that. We all, it's like a, not a very long list, but things we know are coming that we can't wait for. Yeah, I think so, too, and the solution to that... Maybe like the eCash stuff, you know, make, maybe Cashew or Fediment just solves the async payment thing because we actually don't need async payments all of a sudden. I don't know. I think between the federated eCash stuff, uh, which is so cool, and, uh, you know, when dollars are on Lightning, you know, Taro or RGB or whichever one of those wins, like we'll have dollars on Lightning soon. And I think that changes so much of the rest of the landscape that it's really hard to sit here and, I don't know, complain or whatever. Uh, like, that will get people to actually use it in a much bigger way um, than I think a lot of, like, these very tiny details that we're looking at or arguing about right now. Uh, like, that doesn't matter, really. I think there's zero chance Taro succeeds. It's too much piled on complexity. Like, I, it'll take forever for us to get Lightning right, forever to get Taro right, to put those things together, and then that there are practical ways to accomplish the same goal that require less complexity, I don't think it'll ever really be a thing. I think you can pay to make it a thing for a while if you're well-funded, but I don't think it's gonna work. What about on-chain changes? So a lot of, uh, 
Lightning developers, I think, like this idea of L2. Is this, so this would be, this would require an on-chain, uh, a base chain, a protocol layer change for Bitcoin, right? Yeah, any pre -vout. yeah. Yeah. Taj? Um, so, I, I mean, I guess it's L2, but now I know one guy, you know, InstaGibbs or whatever, he's working on it and now calls it LN Symmetry because, and, and I understand. Okay, wait, maybe not everyone knows okay. what this is. So, maybe so this is a good LN Symmetry, uh, Greg Sanders is working on it. I think he just joined uh, Spiral. And the main problem, I guess, that they're trying to solve is the sort of justice transaction, the punishment mechanism in Lightning, where if, you know, you try to go back to an old state, uh, your counterparty can take all the money in the channel. And like, obviously I'm biased because like I came up with that part and I think it's kind of fun. And it, it, it felt very like Bitcoin to me. It's like, well, if you do something wrong, like you lose all your money. And it's very sort of pre Hammurabi code version of justice where it's not eye for an eye. It's like <laughs> you just do everything. Um, but yeah, that, that is problematic in some cases. There, that it almost never happens intentionally. So if you actually look on chain, you're like, okay, when do these transactions happen? It's all bugs. It's never like someone trying to do, or, or backups and restores and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, like in a real world scenario where there's bugs and stuff, um, you know, this, this is an issue. Um, I think maybe someday it won't be, but like the idea of LN symmetry or L2 is you don't um, take all the money if something goes wrong, you publish the correct state, right? So it's, it, you know, if someone says, oh, I have all the money, you know, I have this much money in the channel, instead you publish, no, here's the correct amount that we're supposed to have. And that actually does really simplify a lot of the software um, because you, don't, you only need to keep track of the correct thing, not all the old things in order to recover from it. Um, that does need L1 you know, consensus changes. Um, I think it'd be cool if some of those changes did happen, um, but it's you know, still an open question. There's still like pros and cons of these things. So it's not something that's gonna happen tomorrow, but it's really great that people are working on the software saying, you know, if we had this change, how would this stuff work? Is it really worth it? You know, how do, what does the complexity look like? Yeah, you, you mentioned though that you prefer justice transactions. So I mean, why, why, why do you prefer that? <laughs> Just I, because you're biased or is there actually so a reason for it? I do it? think it depends on the, so I think in a situation where people are friendly, right? Because in, in Lightning, it's not really battle hardened to the extent that Bitcoin is. Like in Bitcoin, you have people using like darknet markets and like ransomware where like the people who are paying each other really hate each other and would, you know, attack each other if they ever got you know, saw each other in real life. That's not really what you're seeing in Lightning right now, right? In Lightning, you have channels with people and a lot of it is things that like could be, you know, your friends, or I'm, I have a channel with my exchange and I'm trusting for this thing anyway or something. Um, so in many cases, when these justice transactions happen, if something goes wrong, you can call up the other side and say, hey, I must have screwed up my software because your side took all the money and yeah, I must have done something wrong. Could I have it back? And then they give it back. Right, like it's, it's versus if you're in a really adversarial scenario, you do want that thing where like, so Lightning is not yet in this setup where you can really have a channel with someone who like hates you, but maybe we can get there versus something like L2, you do sort of have this option to cheat and then if you get caught cheating, uh, nothing really bad happens, right? You, you just fix the problem. And so I think they're both useful in different scenarios. I think Lightning is, is useful in a you know, long-term scenario where you're actually like really adversarial. Um, so I think, I think it's good to have both, and that's why I think Greg is also calling it like LN symmetry. These are variants of lightning that we can all use. So it sounds almost like an American call option to cheat. <laughs> uh, kind of, yeah. <laughs> is that like a, but is that a valid argument against L2? No, I mean, I think it's great to have more options, and I don't, I don't think it actually matters as much. The, the complexity is the different part. That, that really matters. Like if it's simpler to implement, then that kind of outweighs these sort of game theory things. Because in practice, like the game theory stuff doesn't really come up much, but the complexity is just like, you know, look through, look through some of the code where there's like 15 levels of indentation. You're just like, oh man, we need to simplify this. This can't, I don't know, like that's what I worry about. Like can this really take off and get working really well if it's too complex? And you know, it, it, Lightning started as like kind of complex and then over the years it's gotten really complex. And so like, is, you know, if, if this is the way to simplify things and make the state machines easier, to me that's like definitely worth it. I would say I have two separate decisions within that, which is I just don't support Softworks as a default mode. And so if APO appears, I, I will use it. 
um, because we do have problems with backups, multi, multi device. Like, there's a lot of issues that are caused by the state management. Um, so I would use it, but I would not like advocate to make a soft fork so I could do that. All right. So, but you do think it would improve Lightning? I think it would make my job easier. I don't know if that would improve Lightning. All right. Wait. So it would improve Lightning because we and we, we know what to do Bitcoin, to fix the but problem. But still against it. Sorry, we know what we do to fix the problem with the situation we have. Like we know the work that needs to be done. We can we know we can handle it, but it is complexity, and we do have to make that work. And then everybody has to do it in a compatible way. So it, it's a lot to coordinate. Right. Any other thoughts on L2? Desirable, undesirable. Uh, kind of uh, to kind of go uh, back to Giacomo's talk. Like on that, I'm like. It's too uncertain that like I'll just take the like the dummy position on that one, <laughs> where like it's not necessarily I haven't dedicated the time and like there's so much uncertainty I don't know if it's worth it you know we're just trying to ship stuff, um, to be honest and like and coming back to like John's talk where it's like the like these unknown dependencies like you can't build on them so like sure like maybe we can opine on it about beers and I guess that's what this is. Uh, but for me, like we're just shipping software, <laughs> and like uh, it's it's going to be cool to see whatever the future holds. But I don't have much control. All right. By the way, so there's no clock here, Stefan. Are you going to tell us? <laughs> no, no one's going to tell us. <laughs> I I don't know what time we started. I don't even know what time, how long this panel is supposed to be. Thirty minutes, I think. We're in. Like yeah, what where, what time? All is right, it? Well, at some point, I think <laughs> probably someone get us off stage. <laughs> Um, John, you mentioned compatibility just now. So, comp so in the context of L2, that would introduce a potential incompatibility between wallets, right? That would be one of the problems. That's not what I mentioned, but you're right. <laughs> um, all I meant was that coordinating compatibility across many implementations doesn't always go so well, and that's what makes Lightning so fragile. Right. In its complexity. Well, so that was going to be my question. But I, that, I hadn't that's thought the question about I was that. working yeah. towards. That's so, how big of an issue is that right now? I don't know. I hadn't thought about that before. That, that you'll have two versions now. Um, this is also an issue with like going from HTLC to PTLC. Like you have these kind of two networks essentially. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so for for HTL, like if you know and an L2 channel and then a regular Lightning channel, you can pass HTLCs between them fine. You don't even need to know that the other person's channel is using this L2 mechanism. So that, you know, it's not like PTLCs where, PTLCs like, you can't jump a PTLC and turn it into an HTLC and back or something. You can't route end-to-end -end that way, but you could with, with L2 and, you know, with LN symmetry and LN penalty sort of, you can have channels and interoperable that way. But, you know, yeah, you have to actually make the, the software to, to interoperate that way. Yeah, like if my wallet uses the old backup method, now I have to sure. support maybe two methods or only the new method or convert people from the, there's, there's stuff that needs to be handled. Uh, some yeah, we saw that with uh, even like the Bitcoin core stuff and like the wallets took forever to adopt like patch 32. Like you still see really old addresses from time to time. Um, so that's gonna be like a huge complexity. Uh, and right now, even the, some of the implementations, you know, LND and Core Lightning are usually <laughs> like super compatible, uh, but we get RCs from time to time that it's like, nope, like half the channels just broke. Um, and so adding any of that complexity is so hard because this is a very, you know, it's a difficult problem. Yeah, so I think you might have some data on how many transactions in general kind of actually go through and how many fail, right? So what are the stats of that these days? Uh, I was actually just looking at that yesterday, I think. Um, but it's you know it's only from our perspective, I and and from companies that have shared data with us that we can look at. So from from uh, our perspective, it's like in general, 99% plus of payments succeed. So there's like 1% is there, and that will hover for month to month. This month, or sorry, August was only like 0.3% failed or so. So that's starting to look really interesting. But that's you know it's still a noteworthy number. Ideally, the number would be as close to zero percent as possible. Um, but like there's a variety of reasons there why payments fail. And I think like one of the ones I was mentioned earlier, like you know the receiver is offline, uh, is a big issue there where people try to send a payment through the network and they just can't really find the recipients as they're not online. Uh, that's still, uh, as far as I can tell, the biggest reason why this is happening. And the second one is just like timing out, trying to find that person and just X amount of time has passed and couldn't find them on the network. So those are the two biggest ones, not, e not able to find a route and taking too long to find one. 
So like to your question earlier of like what needs to be improved for more people to want to use Lightning Custodial, I think it, that's part of it. And then the other part is sort of some of the risk that we've been talking about where essentially your money is in a hot wallet. So how much do you want to risk to that? Uh, like, yeah, to kind of come back to that, I think like those are some of the main issues to make people feel much more comfortable. Also, what you were mentioning with the... Um, uh, Taj with people not wanting to necessarily put their money on a node to like start trying to earn money if there's not that much to be made It's also because there is a there's a risk to it if there was no risk at all Then everyone would happily do it because any money that you make is you know a nice added benefit But since there is risk people are just more apprehensive And that's also why we see that plateau in nodes and channels and capacity on the network because with the current state of lightning tech there's just you know, the people who want to run a node are likely already doing it. And until the technology improves and there's more adoption and there's more, like, higher on-chain fees, then, uh, you know, it's probably likely that this is sort of the number of nodes that we're going to be having in the network for a while until those things improve. So I get the criticism that people have of Lightning, like, oh, it's kind of stalling. But then if you look at the underlying data of payments just continuously succeeding more often and more transactions happening on the network with the same capacity, same channels, actually less capacity because River uh, reduced our capacity by like half and uh, people freaked out because people thought, you know, there's like an issue with Lightning because the capacity dropped a lot. But uh, we can just do more with less essentially as we're starting to find out with the network getting more and more efficient. Um, a couple of things on failed payments I need to inject is that there's a side of failed payments that we can't really measure, which is when they fail client side. And then there's also another aspect of why the network is probably improving is that uh, the statistics of people using Lightning custodially are huge, right? It's like 80% plus. It's actually less. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't have the statistics from yeah. me. I looked at something that gave me an impression that yeah. there's just an obnoxious amount of people using Lightning. It should Lightning be somewhere around like 60-ish 60, 60 percent or so. But so, still, that's sure. significant. Yeah. That would improve transaction you know, reliability, right? Because you, now you're only communicating between professional nodes and not end user nodes. And that's one aspect. But yeah, also the aspect that we have many payment protocols within Lightning itself. And you can have client-side failures. And you can't measure those. Like when I try to scan, like, like Wallet of Satoshi defaults to Lightning address. And so if somebody tries to scan your default Lightning address, I mean, your default QR code in Wallet of Satoshi, it, and that wallet doesn't support Lightning address, it just fails, you know? All right. Um, we have five more minutes, I just heard. <laughs> okay, zooming out. So we've discussed issues like compatibility, uh, improving bit, um, Lightning. Currently, there's a number of different teams working on this stuff, wallet developers, building implementations. How well is the cooperation going right now? How, is there a lot of cooperation on setting standards, on making it compatible, or is it kind of a mess? What's, what, what's your take on that? It's both. So in New York uh, in June, there was the sort of annual Lightning Protocol meetup, and yeah, it's you know people from working on LDK, people working on LND, uh, async, uh, CLN, you know, every, ev like a lot of the people, not everyone, but a lot of the people working on Lightning came. And it was really fun. Like it was, it, there was discussion and argument, but in a fun way where no one's really disagreeing on what to do. It's more like disagreeing on like, I don't want to code that. Like you code that. <laughs> or like, if you code that, I don't want to have to code that on my implementation. That's too annoying. Or like, and then, you know, or like an entire well, afternoon. Well, that sounds pretty important. Uh, that sounds yeah. more important than having fun, maybe. Oh, yeah, no, and, and, but every, like, it's never a disagreement of, like, I think this is a bad idea and we shouldn't do this. This is like, how about we talk about this later or next year? You know, so everyone's sort of on the same page in what they want to achieve. And it's a, a lot of debate about, like, okay, how do we get that? How do we simplify these things? Like, that sounds cool, but, like, I, you know, that seems impractical to, to program stuff. So I, I think at that meeting, some of the really interesting parts for privacy we were discussing were like, right now, there's a pretty strong link between your sort of L1, uh, you know, UTXOs and your channels where you sort of point to your UTXO and say, that's my channel, and then build the network graph that way. Um, and it doesn't need to be, right? Like, that, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, but you can definitely say, okay, I have a Bitcoin over here at a UTXO, and also I have a channel. And and it's some other UTXO I'm not going to tell you about. Um, you need some way to prevent someone from spamming the network and saying they have a trillion channels. 
Um, but you don't actually need to couple between the sort of L1 and L2 stuff. And so a lot of the discussion was, okay, how do we make the, how do we update the messages so that you're proving you have something so to prevent denial of service, but not actually, you know, showing the, the, the linkage there. Um, and I, it was kind of funny because a lot of people are like, oh, this is great, but like, yeah, I don't want to do this work right now. And then there are some people who are like, you know, I think it's Chatham House Worlds, but you can probably figure out who, um, you know, like, really pushing for it. It's like, no, we need to do this, right? Like privacy is important and like, yeah, I know it's a pain and there's all these other things to work on, but if we don't discuss this now and like, let's get a simple way to do this. And so, you know, it, it, it is a process and, and people argue and stuff, but I think we're all, you know, trying to get the same thing. So it's cool. So it sounds like the vision is more or less, more or less aligned, more about priorities. Yeah, no, no one's, there's not much of like, oh, you really, we really shouldn't do that, and then people like splitting off and making completely different protocols. It's like, and you see that in development now. Like I know um, Lightning Labs is really working on taro ch uh, or taproot channels with, you know, Musig too, and that's really hard. And every, I think a lot of the other implementations are sort of like, okay, you guys, you guys get that to work, and maybe we'll copy some of your code. Uh, and and like CLN and async are working on splicing, and other people are sort of watching them, and then maybe bringing in some of that code. So, so people are working on different areas to focus and then it's, it's a lot easier once someone else has gotten it to work to sort of look at how they did it and then implement it in your own. Right. I haven't been too close to Bolt or, or Blip development, but we did start the LSP spec group and we kind of started it in a ragtag way and then uh, once there was demand for such a thing, like Matt Corallo and C equals came along and they basically said, your, your spec sucks and we, we didn't put much work in it. I said, well, let's fix it. And it turned into a real spec group and that's going well, so yeah. All right, well, I hear that's our time. So thanks for being here and thanks to the panelists. All right, thank you guys. Um, so we are running a little bit behind, so just push everything back by about 20, 30 minutes, but we should still be mostly all good. So uh, we're, gonna move, we're gonna move pretty quickly now. So our next speaker, fellow Australian, Nick Farrow, and he's gonna be talking about next generation self-custody. I hope you're all self-custodying, and everyone, welcome Nick. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, clicker. All right, hello Riga, good morning. Still morning, just. Uh, today, I'm going to be giving you a vision for next-gen multi-sig. Secure self-custody for everyone. So first, I'm going to start with how self-custody today is often flawed or is too difficult. And then I'll talk about multi-sig as it exists today on the Bitcoin network. And then finally, finish with our vision for the future of multi-sig for everyone. So. Self-custody is easiest with keys connected to an internet-connected device, but we know this presents serious software risks. So, we use hardware wallets. But commonly used, this is your hardware wallet, and this is your plain text seed phrase that you keep you know, in your sock drawer, sock drawer or buried in your backyard. Users of hardware wallets often have their seed phrase backup close by. And this is terrible for actually protecting your Bitcoin. It's very inviting for wrench attacks. So you might have seen this classic comic, you know, the crypto nerd's imagination. We've got this hardware wallet. It's got a super secure pin. If you get the pin wrong so many times, it's going to wipe itself. It's going to be impossible to brute force. But actually what's going to happen is bad guy's going to hit you over the head with a wrench until you tell him where your seed phrase backup is or you tell him your pin code. So security for pre protecting Bitcoin funds must not only be digitally secure, but must also be strong enough to deter crime and coercion. This is where we enter multi-sig. We need to be able to say, I could not send you my Bitcoin even if I wanted to. This is the security we need. So e this is the, the only way that an attacker is like, just gonna leave you alone. You know, they've, they've tried their best and it's physically impossible for you to access your Bitcoin. This is, they're going to be like, all right, I just, it's too hard. I'm going to move on. So what is Bitcoin multi-sig? I'm sure many of you are aware. Maybe just a quick hands up. Who's tried multi-sig? A few people. Who's found it pretty scary as it exists today? Bit of a, bit of a complex thing to set up. It's getting better. Whoops. <laughs> uh, so multi-sig locks Bitcoin behind multiple keys and requires some threshold of keys to sign in order to spend. So for example, you can have a two of two where you have two keys protecting your Bitcoin and you need 
both of these keys to sign in order to spend. You can also do something better, a two of three, where you can say have a phone, a laptop, and a hardware wallet, and you need any two of these three keys to sign in order to spend your Bitcoin. This is good for backup redundancy as well. If you lose a key, you can still access your funds. You can also do other crazy things, like a four of 10, five of eight, uh, so on and so forth, whatever suits your needs and your personal security setup. Bitcoin multi-sig is incredible. It is the first time in human history that we're able to have distributed risk for private property. For individuals, this looks like having uh, your, your wallet protected by multiple keys, and you can geographically distribute these keys. So you could have one key at your house, maybe one key with a friend, one key on your phone, maybe one key with a lawyer. It's really up to you. And to access these funds, uh, you can make it really as difficult as you like, or as easy as you like. This can be an incredible wrench attack deterrent. So yeah, if you geographically distribute the keys, you make it really hard to access funds. It's really hard for an attacker to, uh, you know, they're gonna drive you around to all these places in order to access your Bitcoin. For organizations, we're able to distribute responsibility between multiple people. So if you have a, a small team, say three people, Lloyd, Adam, and Nick, and to spend funds out of the company's treasury, you maybe, Lloyd doesn't sign, but maybe Adam signs, and I sign, and then we can spend this Bitcoin. So Bitcoin multi-sig, as it exists today, is in the form of script multi-sig. Now, script multi-sig is like codified contracts that must be conditions that must be satisfied in order to spend an unspent transaction output. So this is a, a witness script for a two of three multi-sig. And the important takeaway here is that you can see these public keys in blue. Uh, you can think of script multi-sig like n smaller locks comprising a much bigger lock. And you need to unlock some threshold of these smaller locks, in this case, two of three of these smaller locks, in order to unlock the bigger lock. But because script multi-sig uh, has these public keys in the witness script, it, this causes a lot of problems and complexities. So one of the biggest is footprints. Spending Bitcoin from a script multi-sig reveals how many public keys and what threshold is protecting your Bitcoin. If you've ever looked on mempool.space, you can click through a whole bunch of transactions and you'll eventually come across one that mempool.space will just say, this is a two of three, this is a three of five. And this makes clustering and tracing on-chain Bitcoin quite easy if you're using a multi-sig. It's terrible for your privacy. Uh, one article I really like is analyzing the fallout of the BitMEX lawsuits where uh, when one of the BitMEX uh, executives got arrested, someone was able to sort of compare the times of who, which, which keys were signing and which keys were not signing, and they were able to figure out which executives held which keys. This is really scary if you're you know, running a, an operation with hundreds of millions of dollars. Not only do we have footprints, but we have foot guns with script multisig. The common, the biggest one is backups. Uh, so because we have these multiple public keys protecting the Bitcoin, you have to uh, not only back up the, the keys to unlock the locks, but you also need to back up the locks themselves. So if, say you have a two of four, it's not just sufficient to have the two private keys, you also need to have knowledge of what all four sub-locks look like. If you lose any, you're screwed. Another issue with script multisig is that they're static. You cannot add, remove, or replace keys after you've created your wallet. If you want to change your multisig, so say you're in a company and uh, someone leaves, someone who has a key leaves the company, and you want to add a new employee into this multisig, you have to just completely scrap that multisig, make a new one, sweep all the funds, costing you a whole bunch in transaction fees and possibly privacy too. Script multisig also leaves you footing the bill. So script multisig has big scripts. This means larger transactions taking up more block space with larger fees. It's okay in a low fee environment, but if uh, you know, the mempool gets really hectic again, then you're going to be really paying for it. Um, and for an example, in a two of three multisig, this is roughly uh, double the fees of a single signature wallet. You can imagine how bad this gets for like a three of five, a five of eight. Uh, it gets really, really expensive. 
So, how can we fix this? Can we make Bitcoin multi-sig for everyone? And in doing so, can we avoid the cost, footprints, and foot guns of script multi-sig? We can, with next-gen multi-sig, Frost. So you might have heard of Frost. It's a lot of big words here. So flexible, round-optimized, Schnorr threshold signatures. I'll go through what these means quickly. So Frost is a threshold signature scheme. Participants choose a T of N threshold. So they choose like a 3 of 5, 5 of 8, whatever suits their needs. And importantly with Frost, the threshold nature comes from mathematics as opposed to programmed conditions in Bitcoin script. And this has huge flow and effects, as we'll get to in a moment. Frost uses Schnorr signatures, uses Bitcoin's taproot upgrade. You'll have those BC1P taproot addresses. And probably the most important takeaway about Frost is that you have a single Schnorr public key to represent the entire multisig. Frost is also round optimized. And all this means is that you can sign your Bitcoin transactions in a single round. Uh, and this is important because in the past, there have been other Schnorr threshold signature schemes, but they might be like three or four rounds. And if you have like your hardware wallets distributed, you know, different locations, different places with different people, you don't want to have to go around, uh, you know, sign in my wallet, sign in my hardware wallet, sign in my phone, sign in my laptop sign on my phone, sign on my hardware wallet, sign on my laptop, do that again, this sort of circle over and over and over. With Frost, you can do it in one round. So Frost is made up of two main components, key gen and signing. So key generation, uh, your devices will interact to create a single joint public key with some threshold. Each device shares a, a share or a fragment of the joint Frost key. So you can think of it like a key being broken up into little pieces. But actually with Frost, these pieces are all interchangeable with one another, and they all look the same. And here you can see they have the single lock for a single public key. For signing with Frost, you take a threshold number of these secret shares, and they each sign with their, their individual secret share. So we can take three of these secret shares, we can sign on them one at a time, creating three partial signatures. And then we can combine these partial signatures, adding them up in a, uh, pretty much just adding them up in a special way that forms a complete single signature. So single signature for a single public key. So Frost, single signature supremacy. This, we get enormous benefits from this. Firstly, you have private single signature spends. Frost transactions look like any other taproot transaction on chain. On mempool.space, you will not be able to tell whether something is a multi-sig or not. Uh, you can use, and it doesn't matter of the threshold or the number of keys. It could be a three of five, five of eight, or one of one. Who knows? You can't tell. You can blend into the crowd much, much better than script multi-sig. No one can tell that you're using this multi-sig on chain. Frost is also block space efficient. Because we have this single signature and a single public key, we really save on transaction size. And this means the transaction fees are the same size regardless of how big your multisig is. So it's really awesome that you can have like a, a one of one, a two of three, five of eight, 50 of 100, you'll pay the same transaction fees regardless. Frost also allows for simpler backups. Because we have this single public key, we just have a single XPUB. We don't have to keep track of all these uh, N individual locks or what they look like. We just have to keep track of one and back up our individual secret shares. So who's working on this? I heard yesterday uh, there was some skepticism that Frost is, you know, might be years away. But uh, I'm here to say today that our team, FrostSnap, uh, is building next generation of Bitcoin self-custody solutions. These are our dev prototype boards, and uh, they fit together in this neat daisy chain fashion. At FrostSnap, we envision software and hardware that makes multi-seek easy, personalized, and secure, and brings self-custody to everyone. We hope to see many people in the near future using multi-seek in their everyday Bitcoin setups. We're rethinking the Bitcoin experience from the ground up, with multi-seek at the core. 
Frostnap devices plug seamlessly together in a daisy chain. So you can get one Frostnap device, get a second Frostnap device, plug them into each other, and then you can plug these Frostnap devices into a coordinator. This coordinator might be a laptop, or it might be a phone, uh, whatever your Bitcoin wallet is on. This coordinator instructs devices to perform actions. So for example, we've plugged in our Frostnap devices, you could plug in two, you could plug in three to each other, and then you could get the coordinator to say, do keygen, create a Frost key. The devices will then talk to each other and will create a Frost key, and you then on each device can verify that they have the same view of the key generation process. When we sign with Frost, we can sign on each device one at a time, creating partial signatures one by one. So you get your coordinator. You sign on one device, you unplug it, you, you've created your first partial signature, then you plug your second device in, sign, unplug it, and you've got your complete uh, Frost signature. At Frostnap, we're envisioning cypherpunk power tools for the everyday person. One neat feature we believe possible with Frost is that you can have malleable multisigs. So after key generation, you can actually add, remove, or replace signers. So if you lose a device, you can easily add a new one. If you, uh, people change in your company, maybe an executive leaves, you can uh, make the old keys incompatible and make uh, and add, enroll a new key. And all while doing this, you can keep the same public key, same wallet, you don't have to sweep the funds. At Frostnap, we envision signing things in Bitcoin and beyond. So we think you should be able to use the same workflow that you use to sign your Bitcoin transactions for other things. For example, Nostar. Currently, Frostnap is the only way to do Nostar multisig. There's no way in Nostar to uh, you know, share an account with someone else or, or have your Nostar account protected behind, say, your phone and your laptop and having this sort of two-factor authentication. We're also looking at maybe just signing documents, signing communications, all kinds of things with this cryptography. One thing I've been working on uh, the past week is private collaborative custody. So if you, you might have heard, collaborative custody is where you give a third party a key in your multisig. And at the moment, uh, collaborative custodians have pretty bad privacy. Like if they wanted to, they could spy on all your transactions, they could see everything you're doing, even if you don't need their help. With Frost, we believe it to be possible to give a third party a secret share without them learning anything about your wallet or your transactions. Even, it might be possible to even sign things blindly that you can ask them to sign a transaction, but they can't even see what they're signing. This is very good for your privacy and also their obligations as a collaborative custodian. So, get excited for the next generation of Bitcoin multisig with Frostnap. Tap me on the shoulder uh, this week if you see me. I love giving live demos. I've got uh, some prototype boards that we've got printed recently. Um, I would love to share. We can, we can sign a Nostra post. Uh, look like this, the latest ones. Um, so yeah, just tap me on the shoulder and we'll, I'll get my laptop out and we can, uh, we can do some cutting edge cryptography together. So thanks for listening. Uh, thanks to you, the audience, the Frostnap team, Lloyd, who many of his ideas I regurgitate and his uh, mentorship has been incredible. Adam, our uh, hardware and electronics engineer, teaching me uh, you know, which wires, uh, the, electric, uh, the five volts in the ground. Uh, it's very, very helpful for me. Thanks to Bunny, uh, Baltic Honey Badger team and to Wizard of Oz for the intro to speak today. We have powerful self-custody tech on the way. You can follow us along at Frostnap Tech on Twitter, frostnap.com, or my personal website, utxo.club. Most importantly, stay frosty. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Great talk there. All right. So uh, just a minute while we're setting the stage for the next one. We've got one more chair, right? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so our next one's going to be a hardware wallets panel. Uh, so I'll just quickly move on. So our host for the panel will be Lunaticoin. 
And joining him on the panel will be Vivek from CoinKite, Salvatore from uh, Ledger, Douglas Backham from uh, Bitbox, I, I, Shift Crypto used to be, the, I think it's the old name, yeah, Bitbox, Pavel from uh, Satoshi Labs, the creative Trezor, and Lawrence Nahum from Blockstream. Um, Luna, Luna, let's uh, get, everyone please put your hands together. Let's have our hardware wallet panel. Okay. <laughs> Hardware wallets. And we have a, a lot of people in this panel. Uh, we have 30 minutes, so I know it's uh, going to be tight. And uh, when I was thinking how to get to talk about hardware wallets, there is so much to talk, and we all love to play with them, to learn what is the new feature. It's a little bit sometimes overwhelming, because if you follow Twitter uh, or whatever, uh, X, uh, Every week there is something new and, and it's at the end of the day there is no time to try everything. So I, I thought I, I have three questions prepared. Let's see. I have a fourth just in case uh, for backup. There is one spicy topic to talk so maybe uh, we will even not get to the third. Uh, but the first question I wanted to ask you because uh, when I talk with beginners uh, they uh, always tell me uh, Look, I have Bitcoin, but I want to level up my security. So I'm going to buy a hardware wallet. And I see that in the, in the mentality of beginners, it's like hardware wallet is like a digital safe. Okay? But then it's a very special dig digital safe because uh, you get to do coin joints in some of them. They, they get to uh, be stateless, so they forget the secrets, some others. So, uh, you can do, for example, BIP85 and, and you get other, it's, it's, you get a tool inside a, a hardware wallet. So I think that the hardware wallet is not just a simple digital safe, it's much more. And this changed and evolved in these uh, 10 years of history. So my first que question I wanted to ask you is what do you think is the function of a hardware wallet in 2023? What's the, what would be the main function? What should do? Let's start maybe here. Wow, uh, there's quite a bit, I guess, a hardware wallet needs to do, like you said, uh, whether that's the coin join functions or uh, keeping all the derivations for any other multi-sig you have, uh, all the other X-pubs like uh, Nick mentioned. Um, I think at the very minimum today, uh, everything should support PSBT. Uh, luckily, we have HWI uh, in core, so we don't have to worry about that too much. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Miniscript. Uh, big shout out to Salvatore for implementing it first. Uh, I think, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, I think that's, uh, that'll be interesting to see how people, um, you know, come up with new script with the composability. And then I think then in turn, we'll have like an iterative cycle based on whatever uh, new primitives, uh, whether that's MPC using uh, in these um, mini script, custom scripts, you know. So this is very exciting, uh, yeah. Pavel, you've, you've seen it all. You started the industry, you've seen it all. So you probably have a very good perspective of uh, what people thought it was a hardware wallet and what it's supposed to be a hardware wallet nowadays. Yeah, so li like you said, we, we started the hardware wallet industry uh, 10 years ago. And the funny thing about it is that we didn't want it to start the hardware wallet industry. We had, we had a problem with Slash that we wanted to solve. We wanted to solve the self-custody for normal people because we were, we were geeks and we were able to secure our laptops. But we, we recognized that if there are uh, seven other billion people on the planet, they are not able to do this. So from that need of, ma make, uh, from that need of making your Bitcoin self-custody, the requirement for having a hardware wallet evolved and we recognize that this is one of probably the, the only good way how to solve this issue so that's why we started uh, this thing and this ultimately hasn't changed that much so the main goal of the hardware wallet is to provide a good self-custody for users and since there are many different people in the world there are different needs 
and uh, also there are different uh, features that they uh, are after. So I think it's very, very good that we have this space of different hardware wallets where everybody is exploring uh, something different while the, there are like uh, signers which do basically nothing else than just sign PSBTs. Then you have uh, like more uh, full stack solutions like uh, Trezor which might not be for everybody but I think this is a good way for uh, regular people who really care about having a good user experience. And then there are maybe even more uh, obscure solutions or on, uh, I d and I didn't mean that uh, in a bad way. I mean that uh, like uh, uh, I just wanted to stress the thing that there are different different needs. But from uh, I guess you can kind of anticipate the answer uh, from each p panelist by what they are actually doing because uh, everybody does what they do think is the best. So for us, uh, the most important feature is self-custody, but this is true for every any hardware wallet. And then on top of that, we are trying to build a good user experience so everybody could use that. And also uh, along the line, along, along the evolution, other, uh, other priorities appeared as well. And we were trying to solve fungibility by adding conjoint and so on. So we are trying to, to fill the the triangle which is like uh, security usability and privacy and try, try to approach all these three points while not uh, compromising the mission of uh, being self custodian because uh, being using a non self custodial solution is uh, is possible and it's easy to achieve all these three points but that's not the goal of bitcoin the goal of bitcoin is to be self custodial Douglas, you, you were saying yes the whole time, too. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you agree on that? Yeah, is, this is working. Okay. Yeah, uh, completely agree. I mean, yeah, the, the fundamental thing is keeping your private keys secure. Um, you know, that's the basis. Um, and yeah, I think that's really important, not only just for you personally, but for uh, Bitcoin, the ecosystem as a whole, because it's founded. What makes it powerful is its decentralization. And so I think hardware wallets are designed to allow you to do, uh, contribute to that, to hold your coins decentralized. And I think um, the goal of the hardware wallet company uh, is to make that, uh, of course, secure. That's a given, but also easy, as easy as possible. Uh, so to enable this, to enable the whole ecosystem uh, to, to flourish. And I'd say the, the private key being the foundation then uh, puts, like looking at the future, puts hardware wallet companies, I, can't, I think, in a unique spot because um, whoever is controlling the private key um, basically is kind of at ground zero of the whole uh, user journey. And so hardware wallet companies then can start to incorporate other features uh, in, in, a, in a unique way. Um, you know, uh, basically the whole, the whole user journey could be uh, started through a hardware wallet app. Lawrence, now you have the, the stateless uh, uh, functionality of uh, Jade, and, and that's like, I suppose that for beginners can be shocking no, or, or confusing. And shout out to SeedSigner, because uh, they were the, the ones to really stress this uh, functionality. Um, uh, uh, do you agree? Do you still think like this, uh, the private key is the foundation, and how, how do you see her walls to think? Uh, I was going to say that that's ha half of the story, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, keeping the private key secure is very important, but it's only half of the story. To me, the other half of the story is uh, approving and verifying transactions. That's, that's key to me. Um, I if you're just keeping key secure, but it's always signing without, no matter what uh, you're signing or approving, no matter what uh, transaction is coming to it, then, then it's not so useful anymore. And it's, uh, it doesn't really matter that you have the key protected if you're signing away all your funds to someone else. So having the key protected is only half of the story, in my opinion. Uh, Sid Signer was a pioneer in, uh, in you know, signing without holding the keys. Uh, part of the reason is because they're doing it on a platform which doesn't really help too much in, in protecting keys. And so the fact that the keys is not stored on the device, uh, it, it's what helps uh, in, in using the device in, in that way. However, you still need to keep the device secure because otherwise, um, you know, someone could um, change the firmware such that next time you use it, all your funds are gone or things like that. So. There's, uh, there's things to consider, to be considered. 
And Salvatore, he was saying that it's not only about signing, it's about also verifying what you're signing and being sure uh, what you do. I know that you have been doing a huge work with Miniscript in Ledger and, and, and how hard it is to verify now that we're talking policies. No? Uh, before it was just checking a few strings. Now, no, now we have to, to uh, figure out if we are signing the policy that we approved uh, like a month ago. So uh, I'm curious because you put a lot of functionalities this uh, last year, I would say, in, in Ledger. Uh, um, what is the main function of a hardware wallet? I mean, it's so hard to be the, the last to, to answer this question, like after all the things that have been said, you know. Um, well, for me, a hardware wallet is, is a self-oriented device, so if you want to say it more generally, right? Uh, securing keys that you use for Bitcoin is one of the use cases, uh, but then the, the, the job of these devices is also to make sure that you can do what you want to do, what want to, you want to achieve with these keys. So there are challenges, of course, in UX. There are challenges in how to make it easy to program these devices and all, and all these things. Right? Um, so with Miniscript specifically, since you're mentioning it, um, so now we're getting implementations that are uh, widely available. Uh, I did some initial work on try to make the burden as minimized uh, as possible for now. Um, and the way it's done for in, in our implementation, and Bitbox, uh, I think, is following a similar uh, approach, is to, to limit the additional burden only on a one-time event, which is when you register the policy on the device. And in this way, the user experience past this initial moment is the, the same that you're used to, either with a single signature or with a multi-signature wallet. Because the wallet, once you register the policy and, and you call it, for example, Liana wallet, uh, then the next time that you spend or receive on this wallet, uh, it will be able to tell you that you're spending or receiving from Liana wallet. So you don't have to worry about the, the scriptor anymore. You don't have to worry about uh, anything because you know that the, the change is going back to your wallet and all these things because the hardware wallet will take care, uh, care of that for you. Uh, definitely, it's not uh, a finished story because there are, uh, like, ideally, we would like the hardware wallet to be able to really understand the policy and not just have to show to, to the user a descriptor. The descriptor is not something that in the long term we hope to have to show to the user because uh, the hardware wallet could, for example, tell you this is a two of three DK multi-signature that becomes a one of three after three months or something like that. You know? uh, and so definitely the, the challenge now once we get people to start using these things is to iterate on the UX and figure out ways that without, without limiting the generality of the proposals um, so that people who are more tech savvy can still do whatever they want, but for the majority of the users, you want to hide the complexity as, as much as possible. So the, the way I like to say it for Miniscript specifically, since you mentioned it, is that uh, we change self-custody first by implementing Minisheet, Miniscript, but then by hiding it from the user at all completely. That's, that's the goal. Yeah, uh, it was like an introduction question, but uh, we couldn't hold talking about Miniscript. It's like in the atmosphere. And I don't know if you know, uh, this question maybe is more advanced in, in shit posting and also in technical, but uh, there is a, a technical battle out there. Uh, there is the MPC gang side of things, and there is the team script side of things. OK. <laughs> So, um, yeah, there, is, uh, there are uh, some of you already implemented uh, or are working in having Miniscript functional soon or already working. Um, some of you are still, uh, I think, Trezor, uh, as, as far as I know, I haven't seen anything happening there. Uh, but there is also MPC protocols, so multi-party computing protocols that, uh, I mean, music, I mean, Frost, we just saw an amazing presentation by Nick. Um, uh, this is this is uh, starting to be complicated because uh, at least MPC, for example, script is, is is more Bitcoin native, but MPC is demands a lot of interactivity, or at least some. No, so uh, what what should hardware wallets do in the future? What's your opinion? Should they embrace all this evolution, all these new things that appear? Like, should all of uh, your hardware wallets be able to do all of this stuff at some point in the next five years? Or um, yes. <laughs> so, no, my question at the end was, or, or no, or we will have like two divisions of hardware wallets, like some that will be MPC hardware wallets and some others will be like the more classic script hardware wallets. What's your take to whoever wants to talk? Uh, managing nonces is, is extremely frightening. Um, and then also all the Schnorr aggregation stuff. Uh, 
if they're being used in MPC and they're also being used for something else, um, you know, all the potential issues with Wagner attacks or people that are observing the session, I think that's very frightening. Uh, I think down the line, I think we all will support it, but maybe we'll have multiple different wallets for the specific use case to reduce some of the friction. Uh, like you said, uh, because of the interactivity, it's kind of a shit show right now, but maybe Lightning will help uh, champion some of these things early because it's so interactive anyway. Uh, I think a good team to maybe focus and observe is the verified Lightning signer, the VLS team. I think it'll be interesting uh, potentially if they proceed with a nested music path or whether they do something with Frost inside the music. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. It's very exciting. <laughs> I will provide maybe uh, again a high level answer like if if you if you have a look at how iOS and Android looked in 2008 they look they couldn't be more different but now if you if you look at the recent versions uh, of their operating systems they are kind of very 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 similar and I think that ultimately since all of the hardware wallets have the same goal to provide perfect self custody for users we will converge to a point where it wouldn't be so much different but right now uh, our focuses are are different, and uh, it might sound funny, but we as Central Shell Labs, we are still a relatively small company when you compare it to Microsoft and others, and we really have to be carefully selecting what we are implementing or not, because otherwise we would just, uh, you know, we would just run out of developers because they would be so burned out, and uh, so far our priorities where conjoin now we are looking having a look in lightning and then i think the priority number three is miniscript but the great thing is that other hardware wallets are already exploring that because by the time we arrive at the point we have capacity to do that it won't be it won't be a quicksand and there was a really good uh, talk uh, earlier uh, today by john from synonym and he ex ex explained the, the the path that they took that they, they really learned, learned the hard way that building on quicksand is not, not very, very good. I mean, it's exciting, and I am a technology geek. I love learning about new technology, but also I have a certain responsibility to my team. And uh, like I said, we, we have to carefully select the features we are working on, and I'm excited about Miniscript, but so far uh, we are not looking into, into that area. And uh, multi-party computation, it's even more... Uh, sci-fi from my point of view like uh, I, I would rather the technology to settle down a little bit before I say my people hey I want you to work on this Nick if Nick Farrow is here uh, yeah. Powell needs to check the sci-fi devices that you have around. Yeah, I'm pr very much aware of, of, of that the device and I'm also uh, I'm excited about every advancement in the field and like I said ultimately the goal of all of us is the same. Let's 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 make self custody easy so people don't store their bitcoins on exchanges. So that's it's as simple as that. Uh, Douglas, I'm, I'm gonna even add something else here because um, with the MPC, I think that uh, uh, devices that are not air gap, they have a, a, an advantage. No, whenever they want to uh, adopt it. Uh, because uh, yeah, there is a cable, or there is, so they are connected directly to the computer, so it's going to be easier. So, will we have like all of this fancy stuff in Bitbox? And uh, when? Put, putting me on the spot. Okay. Um, I think yeah. So if you get to more complicated um, security mechanisms or multi-signature setups, um, anti-klepto is another example where it requires communication back and forth. Uh, it's it's great for the general users to hide as much of this under the hood as possible, and so a connection where you can do that uh, make makes a lot of sense. If you're switching SD cards or QR codes, it can become quite tedious. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Maybe we go into it later. Um, but I think as far as like the general um, the general state of affairs, you know, we're still early, and so it's exciting that there's lots of different um, types of things out there. I guess. Uh, I completely agree with Pavel that you know resources are a limitation. How we go about that is um, we find that the dev resources for the firmware is orders of magnitude lower than the dev resources needed for the software app itself. And so our kind of approach here is more so make it available in the firmware and then work with third parties to uh, kind of 
uh, work through it, see, see where the use cases are, see how improvements can be happening. And so with Bitbox, we did just implement Miniscript, and we're very excited. Um, the Liana wallet team has uh, you know, a bunch of great people, so we're happy to work with them and see, you know, see where this goes. Um, I'm really excited about Frost, and I can't wait to, to get to the point where we can start developing um, some solution around that. We're not quite there yet, and we're still finishing off uh, Miniscript, and then we also have to look into uh, supporting Lining more explicitly, um, and, and also possibly some other things that uh, we have in the, in the pipeline. Uh, in terms of MPC, I never really liked it, especially ECDSA-based. Uh, the implementations are often uh, uh, full of bugs, but also I, I, I don't believe they're uh, mathematically provable, while uh, on Schnorr it's uh, possible to do so. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about Frost, not so much about old-style MPC, ECDSA-based. Uh, yeah, for me, um I like to see hardware wallets assigning devices more like a Swiss Army knife uh, with a lot of simple uh, capabilities that they have that then people decide how, how they want to use. Uh, and the reason is that uh, hardware wallets in the, in the last few years have been kind of like the bottleneck because people cannot really use any feature that hardware wallets, uh, any self-custody feature that hardware wallets don't support because uh, otherwise nobody's going to, going to use your wallet, right? Um, and so all of these things are primitives that can be used for simple uh, self-custody schemes, can be used for very complex self-custody schemes, and uh, it's, it's totally fair and, and expected that uh, different companies will put priorities on, on different things. But in the long term, uh, I do expect that all hardware wallets will uh, support all these primitives, uh, and also because uh, the, long, the more time passes, the more it becomes easy to support all the primitives because the, the design space gets, gets a little bit fleshed, uh, fleshed out and people understand how these things should be implemented. Once, once there is a library which is already implemented uh, and then you just call some functions and you get some signature back uh, and all the complexity is handled somewhere else, you know, then, then it's not so much different if you're doing MPC or if you're doing signi signing with an um, all-style multi-signature or, or something like that. I, I want to add one more thing to, since we are uh, discussing about interactivity, uh, we were trying to solve multi-sync uh, issue uh, like back in 2013, very, very early at the Trezor beginning, and we, we realized that it's, it will n never be a good user experience unless there is a very easy way how to coordinate uh, the signers. And we were trying to experiment with uh, Jabber XMPP protocol. I'm not sure if you still remember it, but it, it didn't feel like a good way. And then we discovered WebRTC, where basically different browser instances can communicate over the internet, but this still felt a little bit like quicksand. But now, fast forward almost 10 years, we, we have Noster. And I'm super excited about Noster, but maybe for a different reason than most of other people. It's not because there uh, is no L on there, but because I find not that Noster is a very gr great communication platform for uh, sending arbitrary messages between uh, parties. And by parties, I mean non-human, but uh, it can be a treasure basically sending a message to another treasure because all you need is the public key. And on the Noster, nobody cares whether you are a dog a person or a treasure, you know? So it just, you just need a public key. And I feel that this is one of the part that has been missing, but we didn't really know that this, this was the part it was missing. It just felt awkward. And Noster can possibly open a new way of uh, how to solve not only the multisig problem, but also other interactivity protocols such as MPCs. So yeah, I'm, something you are just missing something. Uh, so sometimes you are just missing something and it will appear and now suddenly everything starts making sense. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the MPCs as well. Maybe this is the missing part. You wanted to say something, Vivek? Uh, yeah, just continuing where uh, S Salvatore said, uh, we're kicking back the can back at the SecP guys. They need to figure it out first, and I guess we'll follow up on that. <laughs> the battle, the technical battle continues. Um, uh, uh, Stefan, how many minutes we have? Five, okay. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna drop a little bit the, the bomb or the elephant in the room. This year, uh, it was a, a year where some people uh, got stressed because uh, they realized that uh, maybe not on, on clear text, but maybe there are ways to take the seed out 
of the, your device. No, that is the. I'm talking, of course, about ledger recovery um, announcement, and a lot of people started to think, uh, "Oh, is that possible? Should it be possible?" So that's my question: uh, Is it possible? Should it be possible? What can we make to make people be more calm about that? Whoever wants to. Well, I will happily take this first off and thank the team at Ledger. You know. Uh, They've done amazing marketing for us lower devices that are less known. Uh, it, you know, without a doubt, Ledger and Trezor have catered to the broader crypto industry. So they're solving solutions for people's, you know, first time into whatever this is. They, forget about Bitcoin. They just don't know anything, you know. For them, it's just like, oh, I made money. So I guess in that sense... Um, I don't know how much of it was a feature or a bug, or maybe it was poorly communicated. Um, I don't think it should be possible, but if that's what users are willing to pay Ledger for and they communicate it, then I, I don't know. I don't see anything wrong, but I don't think anyone in this room would use it. I think it would be if we, if it would be just fair if we gave words Salvat or because it would just feel unfair that we would be answering and then we, he would have the last word, so. Salvatore. Well, um, so I think that it, there are two aspects. One is product decision and one is the technical aspect of uh, should it be possible to extract the, the seed, right? Um, so hardware signing devices, uh, they have one job, which is signing what you want to sign, right? Uh, so the idea of making it technically impossible to extract the private key for whichever purpose you might want to extract the private key, uh, I think it's technically nonsensical <laughs> in the sense that uh, if you cannot extract the seed, but then you can still extract signatures for whichever purpose, which anyway the hardware wallet has to be able to extract signatures, you didn't solve anything, right? So designing the hardware in such a way that you cannot physically extract the seed, even if it's possible, does not really solve any problem because what you want is the device does what you want it to do. So there could be some use cases for extracting specific private keys. For example, there is the new BIP for silent payments, and one of the things that silent payments need to do is to have a private key that is used for, for scanning for receiving payments. So that's a hot private key that needs to be on, on your computer. But by uh, extracting possibly one of the possibilities to extract a private key from the BIP32 tree, and so in this way, if you define a specific private key as a standard that that's meant to be exported, there's nothing wrong in exporting a private key in that case, right? Uh, in terms of uh, pro product, should people uh, use something like that? Well, I'm being working on Miniscript. I think that's, that's a better option for Bitcoiners. So use Liana if, if you are interested in recovery solutions. Uh, something like Ledger Recover could be interesting for people who have 10 different altcoins and they, don't, like, they cannot use Miniscript. Uh, I, I'm per I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use it myself. Uh, yeah, for Bitcoin, there are definitely better ways. Yeah, I, I think this idea is worth exploring. And I think the main issue with the whole thing was the combination of several facts. And one of them, and this is where I think was most really the problem, is that the solution couldn't be audited, whether it does what we think it should be doing. And that's because of the close, close source nature of, uh, of the chip that was being used. While uh, on, the, uh, on the other hand, if this was completely auditable and it, was, it would be opt-in, it would, might be swallow, swallow, uh, it might be able to, uh, it may be possible to swallow for more, more, more people, basically. So that, that was the, the, the main issue which started the whole, you know, the, the, the discussions, uh, to put it mildly. And... Uh, whether I would use it, uh, probably not. But we we at Trezor, it got uh, got us thinking about like what what are possibly the other options. Like should we allow something like that? We are now at the point that we we want. But maybe if if there uh, would be like a clear indication during the uh, setup of the device that hey this seed you see now might be exported in the future. Do you want to do it this yes or no? 
then it, it might be an interesting thing to explore for maybe uh, other hardware wallets, but it should be really well communicated to the user, and on the other hand, it should be really easy to audit whether it, sh it, it does what it's supposed to be doing. Um, yeah, so ledger recovery is one aspect of, of this, and, and it's for purpose of recovery, and it covers uh, Bitcoin as well as uh, altcoins. But uh, at some point, we're going to get into the topics of like inheritance and things like that, and the hardware wallet is going to enable you to spend, uh, verify, and spend your, your funds, but also um, there has to be some, some rule or, or, or some um, way to tell... Um, Script the blockchain or something that at some point someone else can can also be able to spend and this is a similar problem in the sense that you would uh, you would think oh I, I can spend with my hardware wallet and that's the only way I can spend with plus maybe my my backed up private key but at the end of the day um, we're going to have uh, more solutions that will uh, support different use cases especially inheritance I think which will change uh, and will remind people of this topic in a way because it's a, a similar uh, aspect. Yeah, uh, oh, we're out of time, I think, uh, but uh, I just uh, want uh, to give a last chance. I know maybe Douglas, uh, or maybe if it's fast, we can do it also, but uh, you were, when he said that due to the closed source nature, uh, we couldn't verify it, you were like, meh, meh. Yes. So I'm a big supporter for open source. I, I hope Ledger open source as much as possible in the future, including open system, like the more the better, right? But I disagree that open source solves the trust problem for hardware wallet because the, the hardware itself is not practically verifiable for, for users ever. So uh, you can never be sure that the vendor doesn't put a backdoor on the hardware itself. So even if you see the source, you could easily, on the hardware level, modify what that open source software does in specific places and still hide the backdoor. So, uh, I think a better approach for actually solving this problem is to uh, assume to some extent, to the extent that it's possible, the device itself not as a trusted device. And this is something that with uh, MuSig or MultiSig, for example, you can do because you can replace your one key that you have on your hardware wallet with one key in the hardware wallet and another key that the hardware wallet has never seen. Uh, and now you need two signatures to sign. So the other key can be, for example, in the software wallet. And, and because you need both keys to sign, you kind of prevent a backdoor from being usable, which also removes the incentive to put a backdoor in the first place. Um, and I, I wrote a blog post on exploring this design space, uh, and that's one of the things that I'm most excited, like by, by allowing people to use more keys and more devices, uh, uh, you can actually build uh, solutions where no single, part, no single part in this setup has to be trusted. And with Miniscript, there are some exci exciting ways where you could do this without really making the user experience worse. That, so that's one thing that I'm particularly excited about. We're out of time. But... So that's a wrap. Uh, it was an amazing talk, and I think we could go for 30 minutes more easy. <laughs> but we have to finish up here, so thank you. Thank you, guys. So uh, we're going to keep it moving quickly. So uh, coming up next is Dylan Leclerc. Dylan Leclerc is uh, work coming from Bitcoin Magazine and UTXO Management. He's going to be talking about Bitcoin and financialization. So everyone, please put your hands together. Let's welcome Dylan Leclerc. Check, check. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Dylan. Thanks for the intro, Stefan. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. We're going to be talking about Bitcoin's financialization. Uh, we're going to talk about Bitcoin's native cycle, the interplay between Bitcoin and TradFi. You're going to see a lot of charts. This isn't telling you to trade. It's not pitching you to you know, buy a sell strategy. Uh, this is just kind of how I think of Bitcoin, how I think of its interplay with TradFi, the narrative of you know, BlackRock's ETFs are coming, the suits are coming. Uh, kind of was said last cycle, but I think this time uh, is going to be kind of another order of magnitude larger whenever that time frame comes and the good, the bad, uh, and the, inevitable, the inevitability of it all. Uh, you know, is it a bad thing that, that Larry Fink and the, and the boys from Wall Street are going to come into Bitcoin? Uh, well, we don't really have a say. Bitcoin's permissionless, but I guess how do we, how do we think of that all? All right, so this first, uh, this first chart's pretty obvious. Just draw down for Bitcoin all-time high. Uh, Bitcoin, notoriously volatile, right? That's kind of one of the main talking points of skeptics uh, is how volatile it is, right? Okay. 
Uh, here's Bitcoin's price, realized price. What is realized price? You can also think of it as like market cap and market uh, realized cap. It's essentially like the realized market cap of Bitcoin would just be all of the supply at the price it last moved. Whereas a market cap is just the circulating supply multiplied by the price it last moved. So realized price is just the average cost basis of all Bitcoin. It's the price at which every UTXO last moved valued at that price instead of just the current exchange rate. Right? And so what you notice is it's a lot less volatile and it's kind of just going up in this lockstep fashion. Um, so here we have those two same data points and MVRV Z score, what the heck is that? Uh, market value to realize value, it's just a ratio of the two, standardized. So it's a Z score kind of layered on top of that. And you can kind of see a really distinct uh, boom and bust cycle, right? We can all intuitively feel Bitcoin's boom and bust cycle. You can, you know, whenever you open up a linear chart of Bitcoin, it's either a massive bubble or it's dead. And there's basically no in between. Um, well, this is kind of contextualizing what's happening here, right? The interplay between that average investor cost basis that really doesn't draw down all that much and, and kind of moves up uh, in exponential fashion in a bull market versus, you know, the hyper volatile day to day exchange rate of Bitcoin. Okay. Um, so here is the one year realized volatility of Bitcoin. It's, it's annualized volatility, one year basis, and the realized price annualized volatility. And you notice that that realized price annualized volatility, you know, big words, right? But how much is it, it's fluctuating is a lot, lot lower than Bitcoin, right? So, so Bitcoin is hyper volatile, you know, that's a big narrative. Bitcoin's 80% down from all-time highs at 15,000, you know, after FTX collapse, down from the high of 69,000. But like those metrics, those, those kind of, you know, eye-grabbing mainstream media stats aren't really indicative of reality, right? Like not everybody, barely any, any Bitcoin moved at 69,000, right? It's just like, you know, it wicked up there, it wicked down. There wasn't really that much like capitalization at that point, right? And so we can kind of see with this average cost basis what's actually happening. Bitcoin's not that volatile, you know, on average for all the users in the network, that cost basis. It's just the mark to market exchange rate. So here is that's the same stats, but the drawdown from all time highs, right? You know, Bitcoin, again, the narrative is like, it's so volatile, no one could ever touch it. It's, it's a misrepresentation of what's actually happening underneath the surface. So the exchange rate, you know, boom and bust, minus 70%, minus 80%, keeps on happening. The realized price, that average price, that drawdown from its all-time high, it basically only ever goes below, you know, 20% maybe. So, so that, that, you know, kind of like, you can think of the realized cap metric, that realized price, you know, average price of all Bitcoins are like, the real, it's, it's not a perfect measure, but like every Bitcoin valued at the price at last move is a pretty damn good measure of like, you know, the, the vitality of the network, right? It's, it's, it's far better than actually just, you know, multiplying the circulating supply by the price, which is how you, you know, a traditional like equity market cap would be calculated, right? So with Bitcoin, we have a, a really transparent UTXO set, transparent supply, so we can do some, you know, cool things with it. Uh, so here is the realized cap, the 90-day the percentage change, right? And, and without the exchange rate layered on top of it, just the realized price, right? And so, again, far less volatile than the ex daily exchange rate, and it's showing that 90-day percentage change. And what you can notice, right, is really diminishing returns here, right? And so, I mean, it makes sense. It's a lot easier to pump Bitcoin at a dollar than it is $10,000 or $100,000 if we get there one day. Um, but this is just kind of showing that. And now I'm going to show the absolute the absolute change in realized cap, right? So, so what to know? The realized cap percentage change is obviously diminishing, right? But the, the absolute change is not. It's actually getting a lot, lot larger, which obviously makes sense, right? More capital is coming into this, into this asset with every cycle, you know, with, with new adoption waves, with better tech, right? The Lindy effect, we know these things, right? You can sense this, but this is just kind of putting a visual on what's, what's happening. Um, and, and so we're going to change pace a little bit and we're going to kind of move to uh, what drives these cycles. But here is uh, long-term, short-term short holder supply. This is just long-term holder supply, right? So as a percent of circulating supply, uh, Bitcoin that's basically haven't moved in six months, UTXOs that haven't moved in six months, uh, less short-term holders, less exchanges, right? And so we're basically at like 80%, this all-time high. You can kind of see, you can kind of feel, right, the, the interplay of like hodlers and the cycle, right? Stack sats, stack sats, stack sats, never sell. All of a sudden, there's just not enough Bitcoin to go around. Some capital comes in and Bitcoin's price goes parabolic. And to the mainstream you know, media or to you know, the legacy financial analysts, it's this random thing that comes out of nowhere and no one can expect it, right? But 
really, right, like Hobbler set the floor, that's actually happening. And like, you know, that doesn't stop, you know, minus 20% daily candles, doesn't stop, you know, uh, some like massive liquidations or wipeouts. But this is, what sets the, this is what sets the stage for the next bull market, right? Supply gets so constrained, gets so tight, that all of a sudden, you know, a small amount of capital flows in, and Bitcoin can do nothing but just go up. Um, and you can kind of see that, you know, that long-term holder supply draws down into these parabolic bull markets. What's that saying? Well, I mean, you stack for three years Bitcoin 5Xs, you take a little bit off the top. That makes sense, right? Okay, so, you know, one of the popular narratives and what I was trying to show with this previous chart of kind of that, that holder supply becoming more constrained and then drawing down as Bitcoin goes parabolic is, you know, often like the halving is, is attributed to like Bitcoin's price runs. It's like, oh, well, you know, halving happened, I mean, the number go up. And, you know, like I admittedly, like stock to flow is, a, you know, very great for showing that kind of like absolute scarcity. It was, you know, one of the things for me in high school, I saw the stock to flow ratio and was like, well, great. You know, the, I, the difficulty adjustment, what is all this stuff? And it kind of sent me down a rabbit hole. I, like, won't lie, it's... You know, it's, uh, it's good content, but it's not really, we have so many other things to look at as to what's actually driving this, and the halving is a really, you know, pretty, you know, oversimplification of what's happening. So here's Global M2. It's taking a bunch of different, uh, the M2 money supply of a bunch of different nations, putting it in dollar terms, so not the local currency, it's, it's normalizing in dollar terms. And then the middle pane is the, the year over year percent of change, right? And you can kind of see when there's a, there's a massive expansion of the, the monetary supply, and admittedly, like, M2 isn't the perfect measure of money supply. It takes into account bank reserves and all this, you know, financial jargon, whatever. We're not going to get into that. But really, like, the rate of change is, is what is uh, important here. That's what, you know, kind of uh, what you should take away. And, and look at that rate of change of the money supply, the global money supply in dollar terms, and the Bitcoin price, right? There's something there. Coincidence or not... Who knows? But uh, <laughs> there's obviously something uh, happening there with that chart, right? Bitcoin's, you know, just recently became this macro asset, but it's kind of always been one, right? Even though there wasn't, you know, the big TradFi funds and Larry Fink talking about it, and, you know, five years ago they were saying, it's a money laundering index, and now they're saying, oh, Bitcoin's a global asset. Well, Bitcoin's always been a macro asset, right? It's always kind of gone with the, with the tide of this. Um, so here's Bitcoin and, and the U.S. PMI, Purchasing Managers Index. That's just a month-over-month -month change of, of basically manufacturing activity, right? Above 50 is expansion, below 50, contraction, right? So you can kind of see that with the green and the red. Um, and you can kind of see that also, you know, aligns with the Bitcoin cycle, right? So just another kind of one of those things that, like, Bitcoin has actually been, uh, you know, when this interplay of the TradFi cycle for a long time. This is not a recent development. So, you know, it's like, oh, it's the halving, and, you know, Bitcoin's this asymmetric thing that has no relation to anything else, right? It's uncorrelated. Well, not really. And that's not a bad thing, and I'll explain a little, I'll explain why in a little bit. All right, so here's global debt. Uh, you know, we've all, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the talking points of, like, you know, fiat's going to devalue forever, and it is. Uh, it's a mathematical certainty. That's just how the, the credit-based system works. It needs to expand forever, uh, otherwise it's going to collapse, right? It's a debt-based, fiat-based monetary system. Um, so, you know, it would be better if this was shown in log chart, but I actually do like the linear chart here to kind of show that exponential uh, sort of debt, debt burdens. Um, this cannot go down. It just, it just can't, right? It, the, the only way to pay all this debt down is more debt, uh, paradoxically so. All right, so here is U.S. equity market GDP or U.S. equity markets as a percent of U.S. GDP, right? So there's a lot of different things here. This can show a whole bunch of different stuff, right? You know, attribute it to globalization or attribute it to whatever you want, right? But the, the valuation of, of just U.S. companies, never mind uh, global companies, has continued to in increase relative to our productivity. So, like, what's happening here, right? Like, stocks only go up, right? Like, you know, your financial advisor will tell you, like, yeah, well, you know, equities go up 10% a year or, like, 8% a year, compounded forever, right? And that's like a relatively recent phenomenon that's just like taken as true. It's like, yeah, you know, stocks just DCA into stocks, right? Like don't save money. Like saving money is not a thing anymore. You know, it's like, oh, you know, go, go to Fidelity and they'll get you into a 60-40, a right? Like that's the modern day equivalent of like saving money into your mattress. It's just like passively DCAing into, you know, an equity market index at any price, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what companies you're buying at what price, just save in equities, right? So 
this equity market is a percent of our total economy, right? Like the value of businesses, another way to put this, the value of businesses relative to like what we're actually producing continues to go up, right? New paradigm or what's happening here? Um, here's kind of another, uh, another one of those, uh, you know, these secular charts, right? This is US public debt to GDP in blue. And then the, the, the red and green is the Fed's fund rate minus the year over year inflation rate, okay? And so, yeah, CPI, is it the perfect measure of inflation? No, right? Everybody has a different inflation rate, of course, and they probably understate CPI, and they've changed the definition a whole bunch of times, but we'll just take it at face value, okay? So what's, what's, you know, what do you can kind of think of this as? Well, real yield, essentially. Yes, I know, like Fed forwards, uh, the Fed fund rate is the current interest rate. CPI is trailing 12 months, I get it. You know, the bond market people would get all upset at me for, you know, showing this graphic, but, it's a real yield, right? So when it's green, that interest rate is above the level of inflation, positive real yield, red, negative real yield, right? So what can you see here? And if you kind of overlay these two charts, right? Fed funds rate, 1980 to 2010, 2020 really, 2021, down, lower lows. The cost of capital goes from 20 to zero. At the same time, debt burdens, in, in absolute terms, obviously, but in relative terms is what matters, relative to our productivity, we continue to see debt explode. Right? So, so the valuation of housing and equities and everything, it's up only. And people kind of like just, you know, think this is like the norm, right? We, you don't know anything different. Um, and it's, continue, it's, it's actually facilitated in the, in the back half by basically a negative cost of capital. Um, and inflation is like 2%, it's 1%, they can't get any inflation quantitative easing, print a bunch of money, inflation doesn't manifest, right? So they we kind of just like assume this is the way things go. Um, obviously COVID and the, the response to that and the, the following inflation burst the next few years changed that dynamic, but we'll get into that. Um, okay, so before we get into that chart, uh, a lot of people, it's kind of, you know, there's, there's this uh, notion, right? And I agree with the notion that, you know, Bitcoin and leverage don't mix, agreed, right? Don't leverage your Bitcoin. Like one, like derivative trading and all that stuff, like you'll probably get it wrecked. Some people can do it, right? But like not an advertisement for that. You know, there's like collateralized Bitcoin, uh, you know, loans and all that. Never mind the counterparty risk associated with that. You know, some are far better than others. You know, like the BlockFi and Celsius of the world, like they all got wrecked, we know this. Um, but Bitcoin and leverage is like, you know, almost immediately being like, yeah, that's bad. And it's true on face value, but let's break down why it's actually inevitable and actually a good thing and should be embraced if you think about it a certain way, right? So if you think of the global balance sheet, assets, liabilities, obviously, right? Calculate it however you want, a couple hundred trillion bucks of, on both sides of stocks, bonds, real estate, you know, sovereign debt, other side of, you know, nobody really knows, like this, this is just an estimation. They have no idea. Right? There's, they, no one has any idea how much debt's out there. It's a complete black box, which is fine. You know, we accept that. Um, but if you just think of Bitcoin, right, this little $500 billion blip, right? This is U.S. equity markets, U.S. public debt, gold, Bitcoin. I could have added, you know, other equity markets. It's all just kind of an estimate, right? Bitcoin's just a blip. It doesn't matter. Tiny little blip on the asset side of the balance sheet. And right now, essentially, it's just a bunch of big laser-eyed Bitcoiners that are stacking sats and, and, you know, preaching Satoshi's gospel to their family members at Thanksgiving, and people think they're crazy, and for the most part, they are. Um, but it's relatively irrelevant on the global balance sheet, right? And every boom and bust cycle that we've seen, if we go all the way back to the first, first slide, every single boom and bust cycle we've seen is mostly just like, the first one is like cypherpunks and nerds, and Bitcoin's exchange rate wasn't a joke, it was just a joke, and it was just not Gox. And the second one was like drug dealers and you know, Silk Road users and like the, cut, the cutting edge of like software developers. 2017 was like the first like speculator cycle really that hit the mainstream. You know, the crypto natives-ish and you know, they, all the altcoins came about and it was like, first time it was like more of like a financial asset than anything. I mean, it was always obviously a financial asset, a monetary asset. First one hit the mainstream and 2021 was the first time it was like a real macro asset, or at least perceived as such. Obviously, there's, there's people that have always kind of understood that this was the natural trend, but these are kind of the development phases of the cycles. Okay, so now we're gonna go 
to, I guess we can go to this one, but still talking on that balance sheet asset to liability side of things. Right, so, so what is Bitcoin doing? It's monetizing, it's growing in value, you know, 5x, 10x every four years. I mean, that's not a given, right, but that's kind of the trend. Um, even if it diminishes in, in its percentage growth terms, which it will, which it already is, it's monetizing, it's growing on the asset side of the balance sheet. And what is this fiat game, this fiat system of perpetually expanding credit, perpetually expanding debt burdens, right, as we've shown? Uh, well, it's essentially, this just a boom-bust cycle of, uh, you know, of uh, an asset bus cycle, a business cycle, and the more and more debt that we stuff in the system, the more extreme the deleveragings become, right? So in 2022, Bitcoin kind of had its own, and as you know, as it's had plenty of times, crypto Bitcoin had its own deleveraging, right? A bunch of yield firms went bust, and hedge funds, and neo banks, and whatnot. We kind of saw this, a similar dynamic in, a, in the legacy system. With a couple banks, they you know, also happen to be Bitcoin crypto banks, um, and long duration bonds went down 30%, right? And you know, we still probably see a recession. Everybody knows about 08, everybody knows about the tech bubble, right? So these like, you know, asset bubbles are a function of like human psychology. It's not obviously native to Bitcoin, as we all know. So like, when you think about the maturation of Bitcoin as it increasingly becomes financialized, and that's like, you know, kind of like maybe a, a bad word for some like, you know, really like cypherpunk uh, style maximalists, which I, which I understand, right? Like, don't buy the BlackRock ETF, right? <laughs> buy your own Bitcoin, hold your own keys, non-KYC, BIS, coddle, hodl, etc., right? Like, 100%. But the suits are coming, and they're not going to buy on, on BISC. Uh, they're going to buy Larry Fink's ETF, and that's fine. And let's go through why. Um, so here's, here's just, uh, you know, this is another example of, like, kind of the craziness of the past 20 years, right? Negative yielding debt, not in real terms, not, like, adjusted for inflation, before inflation, right, there was 20 trillion bucks of debt instruments where I'd give you 100 bucks and then 20 years from now, including all the interest payments I got, I would receive 99 back total, right? So you can kind of see that Bitcoin, the relative trend of, of this negative yielding debt, the size of this negative yielding debt, Bitcoin mirrored it quite closely. Now with this, with this interest rate rise, with long duration debt getting absolutely killed, there's, there's almost no nominally yielding negative, negative yielding debt. So before, inf before adjusting for inflation, there's really no negative yielding debt out there anymore. And you know, obviously you see Bitcoin crash at the same time. But in real terms, there's still a whole bunch of debt instruments, right, adjusted for inflation in hindsight, that's not gonna give you a positive ROI. <clears throat> um, okay, so here's, here's just the same chart in long terms, just change of perspective. Obviously, I'm sure you know what the Bitcoin chart looks like. Um, here's another kind of comparison, right? Major central bank balance sheets Bitcoin's market cap percent. Okay. And obviously, major central bank balance sheets have gone up and will continue to go up because there's going to be a whole bunch of debt issuance. Two minutes. Okay, geez. Um, all right. So, Bitcoin leverage, right? The, it's been a native crypto game for a while. Crypto, crypto collateralized open interest, right? BitMEX, right? There's no fi fiat rails, no stable coins. You send in Bitcoin, you get Bitcoin leverage, right? This is just derivative casinos, right? This, this isn't the leverage we want or the leverage that's going to come, right? Here's another example. WBTC, I get it. Ethereum trust model, it's a wrap token, whatever. But people are using Bitcoin as collateral, right? Here was an example of the recent cycle. Grayscale, right? Grayscale ETF. It was a closed-end trust, so there was a premium to discount to NAV. It ended up wrecking a bunch of people. But again, 600,000 Bitcoin, it's collateral, a bunch of people, a bunch of hedge funds, a bunch of neobanks use it as collateral, right? They end up all getting wrecked, of course. But, but what, is, what am I getting at here? Okay, so who knows the timeline? The ETFs, right? Some people have different opinions on them. They're coming. They're definitely coming, right? Larry Fink, all of them. BlackRock, iShares, Vanguard, they're coming. The investment banks, there will be Bitcoin ETF. Right here, I'm showing... This is a BNY Mellon slide, a huge investment bank, multi, you know, $50 billion bank, right? This is showing ETFs and equity as a percent of their collateral, right? So collateral for, for a bet in the banking industry. And again, like, I'm not like a, a bank of, of TradFi simp here, but like, they're coming and this is what they do. This is a Goldman slide, right? You can leverage equities, ETFs as collateral and borrow basically at Fed funds. Up to 25 million bucks, this is for private clients. 
right? So what are we transitioning from here? We're transitioning from crypto degen trading, crypto collateralized, you know, Bitcoin, Luna, Celsius, Binance, degenerate crypto leverage, right, to Bitcoin entrenching itself on the asset side of this global balance sheet. Of 100, you know, 100, 200, 300 trillion dollars fiat liabilities, Bitcoin's monetizing on that side, right? So, last point, and I'll, and I'll wrap it up here. One of the main opponents of like, oh, you know, the ETFs are bad, right? The, the financialization of Bitcoin is bad is, well, look at what happened to gold, right? TradFi basically neutered gold. It's fair, it's a fair statement. Um, you know, the paper markets for gold. Well, you can't teleport gold, you can't settle gold instantaneously or in 10 minutes across the world, right? So, so these paper distortions never really get resolved. They can continue to play these paper games. Whereas, say, with Bitcoin, right? Here's Bitcoin spread, Bitcoin spot price, CME futures. You look at what happened post FTX. CME futures was trading at like a 5% discount relative to the spot market. And what happened, right? These guys all got wrecked when Bitcoin started to pump. So the, the, the data now is saying, at the very least now, is saying that even though CME is like 25% of futures volume, of futures open interest, and remember, CME is non-Bitcoin settled. It's a futures contract, but it's settled in cash, right? You, you park treasuries as collateral to trade Bitcoin, and it settles in cash, right? So, so is this bad? Well, good or bad, they're still, not, they, <laughs> they're still not suppressing the price, right? The, the, up or down, they're going to have to settle, and, and that spot rate is really what matters. Um, so I guess last, last two slides, I'll wrap it up really quick. Uh, this is literally the con Congressional Budget Office from the United States, their projections for debt to GDP and deficits as a percent of GDP. This is their best estimate. Like, they're, they're padding the numbers here. Best estimates, right? So, so the debt is going up forever, the dollar is going down forever. That sounds like an outrageous statement, it's not. They're telling you this. There's, there's been 52 instances of countries over 130% debt to GDP ever, and 51 of them have defaulted, explicitly or implicitly, either by not paying their debt at all, just saying, sorry, I can't pay you, or just currency devaluation is how you get out. The US has a money printer, so it's gonna be option two. They're gonna devalue the hell out of the currency. So, this is to say, that Bitcoin is going to nestle itself on the asset side of the global balance sheet. It's going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and this is our Trojan horse. The ETF, investment banks, yes. <laughs> we, we're going to encourage them to come in. They're going to nestle it on the asset side of their balance sheet instead of paying down the liabilities. It's going to grow as a greater and greater share of that asset until it is systematically important as an asset, just as housing is, just as equities now are as, as on the asset side of that balance sheet, right? Equities are systemic, systemically important for U.S. individuals, pensions, 401ks, et cetera, right? So Bitcoin, this is a natural progression. There's nothing we can do to stop it. And it's a welcome development. It's a natural path of its monetization. Uh, so sorry I went a little bit over, but appreciate everyone's time. Thanks. Thank you, Dylan. Great talk. Some really cool insights there on uh, what's happening with financialization. Is Nicholas around? I was trying to find him earlier, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure where he's at. <laughs> All right. All right, just uh, let me uh, go and chase him up. We'll take a minute.
All right, everyone. Our next speaker is Nicholas Bertie. He's CEO of Galloy. Everyone, please welcome Nicholas. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to talk about open source and Bitcoin companies. So my title today is Move Open Source Up the Bitcoin Stack. Um, I need the clicker. All right. We are in a race today, and freedom is on the line. This is a map of the different CBDCs projects that are being um, created around the world. You can see that as a, almost an anti-freedom map of um, some sort. And the question is, how do we win against more CBDC adoption? I believe one of the solutions is that we set our code free. Or maybe I should say we set our code open, because there is a, a difference, an important difference between the two. And I know if you're a Bitcoin company today, um, you know, thinking about open source is maybe easier said than done. The idea is that maybe, you know, we are in a bear market, you have to achieve some KPI, right? You have to make some revenue today. And so maybe open source is not the first thing you think about as a Bitcoin company. If we look at the ecosystem today, this is a, a map uh, of uh, different Bitcoin only or Bitcoin first companies. You can ask the question, how many of them are really focused on bringing open source to the world regarding Bitcoin? By our estimates, there is about 25% companies in the space that do open source. But it also means that 75% of companies, you know, three, four, that are not meaningfully contributing in open source in any way. We can step back and ask what is open source first, right? If we are talking about open source, it's good to come back to the definition of open source because I believe Specifically in the Bitcoin space, open source is often a misused concept, a misused word. Open source was coined in 1988 from a non-for-profit that is called Open Source Initiative. And it was coined for a specific reason and there is a difference with free software. I will just read the origin of open source so we get more context about what open source actually is. The open source label was created at a strategy session held on February 3rd, 1998 in Palo Alto, California, shortly after the announcement of the release of the Netscape source code. The strategy session grew from a realization that the attention around the Netscape announcements had created an opportunity to educate and advocate for the superiority of an open development process. The conferees believed the pragmatic business case grants that had motivated Netscape to release their code illustrated a valuable way to engage with potential software users and developers and convince them to create and improve source code by participating in an engaged community. The conferees also believe that it would be useful to have a single label that identifies this approach and distinguish it from the philosophically and politically focused label free software. So here's the key takeaway that Open source, there is really a business connotation behind it, which is different from free software. So it is how to think about open source in the context of business, right? Or deploying code in the context of business. There is a clear definition of what open source is and what open source is not. If you're curious, you can go to the uh, OSI website and get the definition. I'm not going into it. One of the points about open source is that um, and, and software in general and software licenses, there is multiple licenses and it's a very nuanced topic. You have public domain, you have permissive license, you have copyleft license that are considered open source. And you have non-commercial proprietary license uh, that are typically not considered open source. The point is it's nuanced, but it matters. Why does it matter? I'm going to touch about three points. It matters because open source allows for verifiability, for collaboration, and if done right, also open source can be unwaggable. 
Okay, let's start with verifiability. So, of course, if the code is open source, it's almost by definition verifiable. And it's a good start, right? We need open source so that we can assess the code that we run on our computer, the wallet that we run, you know, does it do, is there any malicious code? Like, it's important to see what, what we run. It's a start, but it's not enough as is. But it's a necessary start, right? And there is this quote from Satoshi that says that if Bitcoin was closed source, you know, nobody could verify the security out of it. Of course, Bitcoin would not be where it is today if it was not open source. But more importantly, what open source enable is collaboration. I'm going to uh, step back from Bitcoin a little bit and talk about cloud, and I will talk about Kubernetes. Today, if you are a software company and you develop for the cloud, you probably are using Kubernetes. Kubernetes was a software started at Google in 2014, and it was donated to a foundation called the CNCF about two years later. While this project was started by a single company, today there is more than 8,000 companies contributing to this software stack, with more than 75,000 individual software engineer pushing PR into this code base. You think about it, it's quite amazing that there is 8,000 companies contributing on the single software stack, right? Improving it every day. If you're a software company today, you use the cloud, you know, and the cloud can be you know, the, the a remote cloud from one of the big vendors. It can be also your private cloud, you know, that doesn't matter. You, you, just, you don't develop the Kubernetes, which is like a, an orchestration layer. You just use it, right? You, you, you start a, a project, you configure it with some code, some YAML code, and then you, you're good to go, right? In, in hours, days, you, know, you have your own uh, infrastructure be set up. You don't need to spend weeks, months, years to think about, okay, how am I going to deploy my software to the cloud? And so wouldn't it be nice if the same was true for Bitcoin, right? Today, Bitcoin company compete on code. If I'm thinking about, okay, um, let's think about the US companies that offer individual to buy and sell Bitcoin, or uh, maybe Cash App, maybe a Weaver, maybe a Swan, maybe a Strike. My uh, belief is that most of the expense, or a, la a significant part of the expense, go to, to technology, and the rest go to marketing, support, and so on and so forth. But the key point is that there is a large sum of money spent to create the technology to enable the services. If we add something like Kubernetes for Bitcoin, where company will dedicate resources to create this software stack, then each of the software company will not have to spend as much resources to create the same thing. They could have this shared layer where, yes, you know, there is a cost associated to that, there is engineer need to be allocated to this project, what it will make is that the, the, technology, the proprietary technology stack will be smaller and more money could be spent to marketing, more money could be spent to support, to explore new markets. If there was a Kubernetes for Bitcoin companies, there would be increased collaboration among Bitcoin companies that in turn will lead to compounding effects which will reduce the aggregate cost on technology and lead to a faster development cycle. Again, we see what is happening for Kubernetes, where today 8,000 companies are collaborating on a single project. And why does it matter? It matters because if you think, okay, sure, you know, today you can have a, a software team, they develop the product that you need, and if you're addressing a market like the United States, that's probably fine because you can find investors that will understand your market, uh, you, are, you will be able to raise money for creating the software that you need. If you're in Europe, that's probably work as well. But if you're in a Latin America, if you are in, in Africa, the reality is that the market is too small for you as an entrepreneur in this country to say, okay, you know what, I want to address this country, I want to develop my software stack. It's, it's too 
expensive, and therefore those users in those countries are underserved. And the thing is that those users in those countries are probably the users that need Bitcoin the most. So is open source enough? Is open source unreggable? In theory, yes, but again, there is a lot of nuance here. For people that in the audience that know about uh, cloud development, you may have followed Ashikorp, the recent development where Ashikorp is one of the highest growing startup in the cloud industry. And about two or three weeks ago, they decided to change their license from an open source to not open source software, which has created a lot of uh, waves in the industry. The way you think about this is how Google did it with Kubernetes, where they donated the software to the CNCF, which is an independent foundation. And there is one parallel today in the Bitcoin space with BTC Pay server. Right? There is this uh, very famous quote that says that Nicolas Dorier uh, tweeted, like, this is lies, my trust in you is broken, I will make you obsolete. And then what did Nicolas Dorier did is started the BTC server the BT Pay Server uh, project, but also a foundation, right? Which, because it's a foundation, it's meant to be unreggable, meaning one day from the next, hopefully the license will not be changed to a not open source software. So some takeaway from my talk is that open source help with verifi verifiable code, but most importantly, help with collaboration, and if done properly, can help make company be unreggable. So if this makes sense to you, how can you help? The best way to help if you, know, you think, yes, open source matters, and I should pay more attention to this, look at the app you're using. You know, the wallet you're using, the services you're using, where you're buying Bitcoin. If the place where you buy and sell Bitcoin, like, do they have an open source stack? If not, you know, as them why. And Maybe there are other services that do the same thing that offer this ability. If you're a software developer, you know the code that you write, the code that you use, you know, is it open source? If not, why? You should ask a question. So in conclusion, I think we should choose open source so we can win the race against CBDC. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. Okay. Uh, Abu Bakr, are you around? Okay. All right, just give me a minute. I'm going to have to go and find him as well. One sec. Okay, here we go. Um, here's Abu Bakr Noor Khalil. He's, the, uh, he's with Recursive Capital and also with Carla. Everyone, welcome Abu Bakr. Hi. I'm glad to be here. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for not only the warm reception I've gotten, but the invite to speak on such an important topic as the African ecosystem. 
I'd like to start by saying my name is Abubakar Nur Khalil. I run a Bitcoin VC called Recursive Capital. And really with Recursive Capital, the idea is to invest strictly in Bitcoin-only companies with a specific focus on Africa. In terms of my other work in Bitcoin, I do work around Bitcoin Core, mostly PR reviews, things around developer education. I do through a program called Gala, which I co-founded with three other Bitcoiners, where we essentially create new Bitcoin enlightened developers through the program. I also sit on the board of B-Trust, where we essentially give out grants to grow the Bitcoin African ecosystem. I think it's important just to give some more context into why I feel this talk is important and what the overall takeaway I hope you'd have after this talk is. In general, I'd like to give you enough context or at least sufficient context for you to understand kind of the framing around the Bitcoin ecosystem in Africa, because there are going to be a lot of talks throughout the conference about that. And in general, when the topic comes up, at least you should have enough context to kind of navigate through that. And I think to preface this will be very, very important to look at kind of where we've been, I guess, in the ecosystem to where we are right now. So I'd like to start by going back in time. So initially, Bitcoin came into the African ecosystem as a scam, essentially. Most people in 2017 or earlier thought they held Bitcoin, whereas they held, you know, BitConnect or a bunch of other scammy stuff. So by the time we had the rise in terms of the Bitcoin bull market, people realized that, oh, damn, I actually wasn't holding any Bitcoin at all. So that has really tainted the space in terms of the perception people already have about Bitcoin. Is either you're a scammer, crook, fraud, or you're someone who is into what we call Yahoo, which is essentially internet fraud. It doesn't also help that a lot of people that do, you know, a type of music called Yahoo Piano tend to talk about Bitcoin and, you know, giving Bitcoin addresses, paying for people to, you know, be killed through Bitcoin, all that kind of stuff. So it's not really ideal for the ecosystem. So all the way up to 2021 was when kind of the government started feeling, you know, they should be more proactive in terms of kind of regulation around Bitcoin. So that's when we had the first ban, which people think, you know, is an outright ban about Bitcoin, but it's not necessarily the case. It's actually more a ban towards having exchanges directly tie Bitcoin transactions to, you know, um, the customers that they support. So in general, it's not necessarily a ban. It's one of those things where there's essentially like a curtailment on, you know, how you can use Bitcoin, which has fed into the reason why Africa has a huge P2P market, which people, you know, use to circumvent that. In general, the other thing that happened that same year that was pretty interesting was the ENERA. Now, some of you might have heard about the ENERA. It's not a success. I can definitely tell you that, hand on heart. No one uses it. No one accepts it. And it's ironic because they could have easily just converted all the digital NERAs into ENERA, but they didn't. And right now, we're at a stage where in Nigeria, for example, we have four different NERAs. So NERA is kind of a loose term. Talk about fungibility. So it's super ironic. For us, we have the digital notes. We also have the physical old and new notes. And it's a case where each of them have their own varying rates between them and also between USD. So we're at a stage where really our finances are essentially very, very broken. And a lot of people find solace in Bitcoin. And at least the fungibility provides as well as the escape it has for people to have you know, financial inclusion. In general, I'd say the current state of the Bitcoin ecosystem in Africa has a lot more length, depth, and breadth in terms of how many companies we're seeing coming out of Africa, the kind of tools. We've left the stage where it's like, you know, the Cambrian era of, you know, just bland exchanges, people just trying to buy on, on and off ramp, things around that. So right now we're at a stage where it's really a case where we have like a huge broad space with varying aspects. So we have people working on Bitcoin Akasi, things around trying to provide like a, I wouldn't say a template because each region is different is more a framework of how to grow grassroots movements around Bitcoin circular economies. Outside of that, we've seen a huge uptake in mining. Now, the reason why is because we have a lot of abundant energy in Africa through a variety of means, specifically hydro, which is, has seemed to be the most efficient way to do Bitcoin mining. And we also have challenges around electrification. So the problem is over a number of decades, multiple parties have tried to help, this, help out with this, but the problem is they're, they're always missing and always on demand buyer which Bitcoin mining provides for the first time. So think of it this way. If you want to electrify a rural community, you don't have essential bridges to kind of link that. And you, also have, you don't also have the infrastructure to handle that on the, the initial capacity in terms of the electricity. So people tend to use Bitcoin mining as a way to kind of like offset that initial energy and then gradually um, slow it down as soon as people start uptaking with the energy. So other than that, I'd say there, there's also a surge in building tools for Africa. The major issue we had, especially on the venture side, is a lot of the early companies were focusing on copying, you know, Silicon Valley companies and essentially replicating in Africa, which doesn't work for a variety of reasons. One I'd like to highlight is the fact that 
number one, the GDP of California is the whole of Africa. So in terms of capital, um, capital flows, it doesn't really translate effectively. So it's a case where people are flooding the market with a lot more capital than is necessary, which translates into companies ineffectively using capital. So just focusing on hiring as opposed to building, which is the majority of the edge that you have as a small company. So in general, I'd like to talk just briefly on the VC landscape because that has also evolved um, quite, quite substantially. I'd say, unfortunately, we still only have one native Bitcoin VC, which is the fund I run, Recursive Capital. Other than that, we have other tangential funds who tend to invest in Africa, but are more, they're more open to Africa as opposed to like a specific focus. Now, on that end, it's a case where right now the majority of the work around Recursive Capital is building out the healthy pipeline. So this involves looking at companies at the really, really early stage where they're not investable, trying to get them to a stage where they are, and then additionally trying to be kind of a... I guess it's a huge signal source for the ecosystem. So that's kind of where we sit at in terms of the ecosystem. In general, I feel though there's a lot of progress, there's still a lot to be done. It's not smooth sailing. For one, I'd say we don't necessarily have effective regulation to begin with. It's a case where there's no framework for us to follow around the continent. So for example, in Nigeria, we have the SEC, similar to the US and a bunch of other institutions that are identical to the one in the US. So it's a uh, it's a constant battle between what frameworks to use to kind of frame how to regulate Bitcoin. And the main reason why they want to do that, which is kind of plausible, is obviously for capital flows, for ensuring that there's investor you know, guarantees around the investment asset classes. But one thing I think that's pretty important for us and kind of the work I do on the ground is to ensure that the, the discussion is, at least there's a bifurcation between Bitcoin as well as the rest of the space. Because without that, there wouldn't necessarily be effective regulation, both in terms of the consumer protection side as well as those trying to build for Bitcoin in Africa. So it's a constant battle. I mean, hopefully we win. It's one of those things where you can't really say <laughs> you, can, you can guarantee what the future holds, but I'm definitely very bullish on that end. Another thing really worth, uh, worth mentioning is the tools. Now, I don't mean no one is building, but in terms of building for Africa where you have to deal with connectivity issues, there isn't a lot of infrastructure for kind of what you would expect in you know, the first world, quote unquote. So it's a case where we need more tooling for people to build more local solutions that are more tailored to uh, you know, the local demographics and all of that. So it's a case where right now, the way you should think about it is development is cyclical and it kind of precedes having more companies that are building on top of that. So it's a case where we we're at the stage where we're really building kind of the rails. So take a look at a company like Machankura, for example, which for the first time is allowing USSD codes, USSD, not the token. This is a protocol in which individuals can allow for messaging sh uh, through short codes. So it's essentially a platform that allows you to send and receive Bitcoin. And the good thing from the regulatory side is it doesn't actually let you buy and sell Bitcoin, which helps insulate from a lot of the regulations that are around like just shadow banning. And lastly, I'd say the main thing to consider is we still don't have a pipeline of how to get educators from they don't know anything to teaching people, which fortunately we're starting to have programs like the one Anita Posh is doing around really helping to fix that pipeline. And I think that's going to really help contribute to the space in terms of like the health and maturity. And lastly, I'd say, why be bullish on Africa? Personally, on the investment side, I think two reasons. One, the majority of the things that Africa faces in terms of challenges, Bitcoin uniquely solves those problems in a very, very novel way for the first time that we haven't seen, a la Bitcoin mining, through electrification, or just allowing for financial inclusion. Because at the end of the day, it's way more difficult for someone to open up a bank account in Nigeria, or frankly, even use cash really for any type of payments as opposed to Bitcoin. So it's a case where we have that. And in addition to that, we have the youngest continent in the world. More than 60% of the population is below the age of 25. So two things can pan out in the next maybe 5, 10, 20 years. It's either Africa is filled with a bunch of rowdy young people or highly effective young people building the future for what I feel is Bitcoin and the development of digital currencies in general. So it's one of those things where I think you should pay a close, I guess, close attention to what's happening in Africa because I feel it's going to reflect the overall trends you'll see in the, in the space to come. So that's really what I'd say in general is why you should be focused on Africa. And it's likely going to be the development capital for really Bitcoin in general, as well as where you see a lot more bleeding edge companies coming out. So I'd like to thank all of you for listening to this long ramble. And I'd like to open the floor to any questions that anyone has. Thank you.
appreciate the talk, first off. Um, I was curious, is there any examples in Africa? You had mentioned it's a younger economy, and when I think of Bitcoin, it's the only true stable coin. It's a unit of account. So if you're not tying a fiat value, whether it's euros or dollars to it, it's a pretty great currency. Is there examples in Africa of small circular economies that aren't really looking at any type of value attached to it? They're just purely looking at it as a unit of account and able to, you know, trade services and goods? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It ties into the general trend of adoption. I left out purposely because it's kind of a nuanced thing. So we do have a lot of adoption. I say probably leading the world in terms of actual usage, not just like trading in general, which used to be the case back in like 2018. So I'd say it's more localized. So it's a case where if I know you, you own, let's say, a barber shop, then I can pay you through Lightning. But in terms of retail, it's not too high. For example, on-chain transactions, in terms of African flows, I think the majority of it, around 80%, is close to like a thousand bucks a month, which shows, you know, the majority of it is kind of like really low volume. In general, the high volume tends to be around B2B. So these are people who are paying merchants wholesale coming into either Nigeria or some other parts, or you know, airlines, for example, like Qatar, using it to uh, basically take out the dollars, which has been a huge issue, which is why some of these airlines are pulling out of Africa in general. But yeah, I think it's, it's definitely one of those things where we need more infrastructure on the receiving side for people to be able to be a, a lot more comfortable moving in between. But yeah, there are huge, huge, huge numbers when it comes to Bitcoin adoption tied with USDT, mostly because of liquidity and, you know, people just need access to easy dollars, basically. All right, well, Abu, Abu Bakar, thank you for that, and stay on stage, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to be starting the, uh, the next one. So we've got a panel coming. So we're just going to have uh, our panel. It's going to be on funding Bitcoin development. So our host for this panel is Alex Lee from HRF. Ben Price, uh, known for his work on OpenSats, as well as uh, founder of the Bitcoin company. Abu Bakar, who you already know. Josie, Bitcoin Core developer. And Pavlinex known for his work on BTC Pay, now working on Stratum V2 and open source in general. So everybody, uh, welcome our panel, Funding Bitcoin Development, and Alex is our moderator. Testing, testing. Hi everyone, my name is Alex. I work at the Human Rights Foundation and specifically on the Bitcoin Development Fund, where we give grants to support open source development in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, I just wanted to start off this panel with uh, let everyone give a brief 30 second introduction of what they do and how does their work relate to funding the Bitcoin ecosystem. So let's start with you, Josie. Um, Josie, I work on Bitcoin Core, uh, work on the wallet um, and just general review. And then also just in the ecosystem, I've been working on silent payments with Ruben Thompson, so BIP352, 352. Uh, how it relates to uh, funding. The open source funding is what enables me to do this job, and it's what enabled it has enabled me to do it for the last three years. Um, so to me, it's like yeah, it's, it's why I'm here. Hey, I'm Paulinex. I've been a BTC Pay server contributor, and I've been working in the open source space for six years now in total. So I do understand quite well the struggles of getting funded through your, for your open source work and. Uh, how challenging it can be, but thanks to, we'll, we'll talk about that, I guess we'll touch on those topics in a moment, but thanks to these great entities that are allowing us to work in open source, I've been fully funded for my work for the past three years or so. So I'm um, really great, grateful for those entities that um, are allowing us to work on what we really love. Uh, my name's Ben. Uh, I come from the other side where we, uh, I started a, a 501c3 charity that funds open source contributors to Bitcoin and uh, Noster and related freedom technology. Um, so these are actually two, two people that we funded with, with uh, some of our donations. Um, and I have a kind of unique perspective. So that's like a, a nonprofit. We don't try and make any money. We just try and kind of help the ecosystem. And I also run the Bitcoin company, which is a for-profit. So um, kind of see both sides of the equation. And I'm on the board of B-Trust, where we essentially give out grants. So far, I've given out grants to a specific developer called Vlad, who works on BDK and with plans of expanding that cohort. So yeah, here to definitely <laughs> looking forward to sharing insights and brainstorming on that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'd first like to start off with a somewhat self-evident question that is actually kind of deep the more you think about it, which is, why is funding Bitcoin important at all? Does, does Bitcoin even need funding? Isn't it already 
a mostly finished project that could survive for decades and even millennium without any current updates? Like, why, why do we need to support Bitcoin and fund Bitcoin? And this is an open-ended question to all the panelists. I mean, I love when somebody says that Bitcoin should never be changed and should never move or change. Like, those people obviously never built anything in their life and don't know how software works. Obviously, like any piece of software, Bitcoin needs to be maintained, updated, and to ensure that everything works and keeps up to date with all of the other updates and even hardware changes. So it is very critical that we have people who do this full-time or part-time. It doesn't really matter, but we need to have dedicated people who contribute that time to Bitcoin. And I also hear people saying, oh, but it's free and open source software. You don't really need to be funded. You can just you know, spend five minutes or 10 minutes a day or an hour a day to, to that that's really doesn't scale because Bitcoin is very deep and tough technology and really requires a lot of hours per day. And I really don't understand when people say first, Bitcoin shouldn't change and second, people shouldn't be paid to work on Bitcoin because that's an attack factor. It's not, we have various entities, various individuals, even whales funding people. So just distribute that source of funding and I think we are good. Yeah, I, I, I would add to that too. So is Bitcoin feature complete? I would say no, like we, we've got a ton of work to do and, and we know where the challenges are. But even if that were true, Bitcoin is a software project and software needs maintenance. Like there's constantly bug fixes, constantly updating dependencies. That's real work that needs to be done. And this falls, you know, there's more research and features that need to happen, but there's also just keep the lights on work. Like even just maintaining the build and release cycle of like giving reproducible builds to people, that's work that someone needs to do. And, and kind of echoing the, the sentiment of, you know, oh, well, it's open source, you should just do it in your free time. It's like, it, there's a massive learning curve to becoming a contributor where you understand the nuance of the space and that takes time and investment. And I don't think we should expect people to work for free or set this bar of you can only contribute to Bitcoin if you're already financially independent. Like there are a lot of people who are valuable contributors who are not independently wealthy, which means they got to get paid somehow. And there's, we don't want a business model for contributing. So then it has to be a kind of like grant process. Uh, I think funding Bitcoin is important because our world is really, really fucked right now. And Bitcoin is a fundamentally civilizational changing. It changes the arc of all human um, history and future. It's like maybe the only comparable thing is like nuclear bombs, but Bitcoin is peaceful. Bitcoin is, you, you can opt in. Um, Bitcoin gives you the chance to think about the future instead of constantly be worrying about your present and your immediate needs. It, it lets you kind of expand your mind um, past, past where the fiat society would have previously capped you. Um, and I think Bitcoin, it, it's important right now because we're on a trajectory where uh, the world is not gonna is not gonna be a good place. We were, I was talking to Eric Kaysen last night, and he brought up a, a point where I think before we were in this middle ground where the you know we you know things are getting worse and we might just be in this kind of like not flourishing society. But I think we're getting to a point where it's either gonna be you're eating bugs in your pod or like we're living in a utopia, and we have the potential to do both. Before Bitcoin, though, there was no hope. Uh, at least I had no hope. There was this like impending sense of doom that we, we really messed it up. And um, luckily someone dropped some knowledge and we discovered like this amazing kind of like element, shout out to Newt, that like changes fundamentally how, how human history can progress. And I think, it, um, I think the hope is important right now because if we, if we have nothing to work towards, then we are gonna end up in, in the pods. And, um, I think funding Bitcoin is important because it's the only thing that can get us like to cross the chasm over the threshold where we actually can, we can turn around and instead of like constantly degrading into this like uh, negative state, we can, we can turn it around. And um, the problem with it is, is it's irrational. It's irrational to contribute to open source. Uh, these guys could, could make way more money at, you know, a, a big, a big tech company, but um, 
we have to keep that like I, I see it as like the Olympic flame, the Olympic torch. Like there's there's very there's very little hope, but there is hope, and that's important that it is there. Um, and I think like uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin lets us keep that alive, and I think that's that's really important. Yeah, and just to close off, if you're thinking about it from a sustainability point of view, not ESG, specifically about having a long-term career in Bitcoin, it's important to have it paid so people see it as a, value, uh, a viable alternative to traditional, you know, fang jobs like he was mentioning. So I think that's kind of where we also have to factor that in. It's not a case where we expect people to work for free forever in perpetuity. They need to have a means of sustaining themselves through, you know, funding. Uh, great points from our panelists. And the next question I want to touch on is, the Bitcoin system funding situation can be a bit murky in the sense that if you don't follow Bitcoin, if you're not following the work of uh, great people like OpenSats or uh, B-Trust or the HRF and other people and players and uh, companies, nonprofits and individuals who are currently funding the Bitcoin ecosystem, it's a bit confusing as to how Bitcoin developers and builders are actually funded. So the next question I want to ask to all the panelists is, how are, how are people currently funded in the Bitcoin ecosystem? Is it mostly just individuals zapping, on, you know, zapping some sats to contributors? Is it um, larger corporations, private players, uh, nonprofits? Like how, are, how are people and builders currently funded in the Bitcoin ecosystem? And what incentives does that create? I, I know, at least for myself, um, it's always been through major exchanges uh, until most recently getting a, a grant from OpenSats. Um, which is great. I mean, I think for them, it's, it's a marketing play of, like, we want to do something to support uh, Bitcoin. And I, I don't think there's such a thing as dirty money. It's like, look, I don't care how you guys are making your money at exchanges, but if you're going to fund Bitcoin development, that's a good use of that money. I haven't really seen anybody sustainably funded and working on just contributions from the community. I would love to see more of that. Um, but how I got involved was I, I didn't know, I had heard that people were funded to work on it, so I was like, okay, maybe I can figure this out. But you just, you show up and you start doing the work. And you kind of have to go in and, and build some proof of work and some history and some merit in the project before you can go around and be like, hey, would you like to pay me to do this? So that's what I did. Um, I worked for about six to eight months uh, just contributing before I applied for a grant. And then once you're in the grant system, I think it's easier to reapply and uh, it's less of a risk to give a grant to someone who's already been receiving a grant because it's like, okay, someone's paid this person to do the work. We can see their history. But that initial bit was like, you, know, you just got to roll up your sleeves and start working. And it's also important to frame it for context in general. Like you said, what are the avenues that already exist? So it varies. You have one-off bounties per project that happens where that's the apps you're talking about. And in general, there are also the bounties from the HRF where individuals can actually contribute to specific pain points in the Bitcoin ecosystem that have been left untouched, mostly due to, you know, there are a small amount of people in the space doing the actual building. So it's really, we need to incentivize working on those type of things. Outside of that, in terms of how, I guess, the bulk of the ecosystem is funded, is mostly due to grants, and specifically long-term grants is what you can call them. So these are grants that go all the way from a year to multiple years. And it's interesting because the lower down the protocol stack, the more you need that maintainer or whoever that dev is to continue to work on that specifically because the issue is the entire space, the entire Bitcoin space is built on the rails of open source. So at the end of the day, if there's no one really maintaining to Josie's point, there's really no way for us to have any sort of thriving economy or like thriving ecosystem. So. I think what I'd like to see is more grants, specifically focusing on long-term values when it comes to how they either vet what happens after a year of a grant. Do they renew? Is it a case where it's depleted in a contract? Because again, it's back to job security for these folks. You don't want people jumping from grants to other grants and then potentially not having money in between and then giving up on the whole point. So I think it's one of those things where we need to have a lot more focus in terms of folks that provide this sort of funding on how exactly the frameworks were applying in terms of funding people long-term beyond just a year. Uh, just to like kind of back up and look, go a little more high level, um, Bitcoin and crypto are funded extremely differently. Um, Bitcoin is, uh, is an open source project. There's no VC funding. There is no uh, like set aside pre-mined funds that can be used to pay off developers. Um, so it really relies on um, irrational 
people who uh, who are giving back uh, for whatever their own reason is. Maybe they like the challenge of trying to build a new money. Maybe they really want to help uh, the world. Maybe they hate central banks. Maybe they um, maybe they just get bored with any other tech and Bitcoin's like the only thing that can keep them interested. But crypto developers are funded by typically uh, either VCs, um, which still is the same thing. You're, you're funded by pre-mined scams. Uh, if you, if you know, insert shitcoin here, uh, they set aside 20%, 30%, 90%, who knows. Um, and they, they basically pay themselves, or the, the standard model is they, they pay themselves over time. Uh, they dump their token on retail investors. You know, their market cap is 100 million. And now they've got like a pot of money to, to fund a bunch of like crappy developers who don't care about scamming other people with their, with their shit coin. Now, Bitcoin, there's maybe 20 to 30 uh, core devs who are really working on it. There's a lot of people on, on the ancillary. But um, the, the way that I think most core devs or people get funding is um, there's a few like charitable organizations like HRF, um, OpenSats, Square. Um, these people just give out grants. It's uh, typically they're funded either by a private organization or uh, individuals who, who are just giving to charity. And, you know, instead of giving to, I don't know, Charity X, I like Bitcoin, so I'm going to give to OpenSats or HRF. And they pass that through to developers like Jesse. Um, and so that's where a majority, I think, of core devs um, make their funding. And then there's a, there's a subset of those where um, there are for-profit organizations like exchanges. Unfortunately, they make most of their money off trading shit coins, but there are, there are other private organizations that are profitable. And they're like, hey, I made a bunch of money because of this amazing thing called Bitcoin and there's 20 people maintaining it. Let's give back, you know, 100, 200, 300K a year. And so they give out a few grants a year. Not super sustainable, but there are some people who are lucky enough to like kind of have those relationships with exchanges. Um, the last piece would be like, you do get contributions to open source from private ventures. Like uh, at TBC, um, we, or at the Bitcoin company, like we work on some stuff and like, you know, we, maybe, maybe we find a bug and so we push a fix upstream and other, other people and other companies benefit. Um, you know, I think like uh, Nidig employs James O'Byrne and I think like he gives them, he gives them like insight into, into Bitcoin and works on Bitcoin core, but also does like some private things for them that probably make them a lot of money. So I think like there's charity, there's like, you know, kind of private corporations just ancillarily giving back. And then there's private corporations who just give back because, hey, they made a ton of money off these guys. You summarized that very well. I just want to say that the situation has changed a lot uh, in the past few years. Like when we were here in 2019, I believe, with the BTC pay team, we had no funding. We slept on bunk beds together, uh, several of us in one room. And since then, we really just relied on community donations. So we managed to gather like 2K in donations, and we managed to bring the team here to have fun in Riga. But since then, situations has changed. Like what Ben just said, there are multiple models how individuals can get funded to contribute in open source. And it's really getting better and better. Like I can see, even for myself, like that uh, progress of just like relying on community and for people just like sending donations through your, you know, whatever QR code that you're using or whatnot, address to now having like companies or organizations that are like giving us at least one or two years chance to like really go deep and get a grant to, to work on something because as I said, focus is very important and especially in Bitcoin requires a lot of time. So we really need to do even better job to ensure long-term sustainability for, for people who would like to do this. Uh, great comments. As our panelists touched upon, a lot of uh, builders and contributors today are funded by either crypto exchanges who give out a portion of their profits to give back to the community and fund developers. Some uh, people are supported by contributors, everyday people like you who donate to contributors and uh, projects that they like. Uh, my next question is, given that you know, contributions can dry up really quickly during bear markets when the Bitcoin price is down and vice versa, oftentimes during bull markets, a lot of crypto exchanges are much more generous and they uh, in their marketing budgets and they support much more developers. Uh, is their current funding model for Bitcoin broken? And if so, how can we improve it or fix it? Uh, 
<laughs> the funding model for Bitcoin is not broken because there is no funding model for Bitcoin. It relies on irrational behavior. It relies on smart people contributing their time theoretically for free. And if they're driven enough, if they're lucky enough, if they're talented enough, and if the money is there, they do get funding. Um, but in general, free and open source software suffers from the free rider problem. They're, they're, it's, it's an unsolvable problem. Every, it's a tragedy of the commons. You all benefit because of Bitcoin, but you don't have to pay for it individually. You, you get the benefits of Bitcoin because it just exists. Uh, and that is, is an unsolvable problem. And so it requires both irrational contributors to c continue to maintain the software and hopefully they get funded. Um, and it also, it also requires irrational companies like OpenSats and HRF that just give money away for free. That's not a rational thing to do. People don't give money away for free and people don't work for free typically. Now, Bitcoin has this, this weird world altering like importance where there's luckily enough people who see the significance of it and probably see like the end game without Bitcoin and they want to give back. Um, but I, I think um, the funding model is not broken. The problem is open source is irrational and um, ideally we can create enough of an ecosystem where we can cultivate more and more people to continue this irrational behavior, but it wouldn't be irrational if you're getting paid. So I think like, um, no, it's not broken and we just need to continue building up resources in a, in a community and uh, support the people who are, who are being kind enough to give back. I, I, I would echo that, like it's not a Bitcoin problem. I mean, you can, there's a famous Wes McKinney rage quit and like Wes McKinney was the guy who wrote the Pandas library he took uh, two years off from his high frequency trading job to make this open source data science library that then Amazon, Microsoft, everybody made billions of dollars using and nobody gave him a dime. And he, he like, got on Twitter one day and was just like, what's going on? Like, you know, I've given, I've, I've, I've foregone like a career to give this thing and I'm constantly begging for money. I just don't get it. And you see this in the Tor project and the Linux project and like, you know, Bitcoin is standing on the shoulders of giants. Like we, we exist because the internet exists, because the Linux project exists. Like the world is running on open source. And yet it seems, I think irrational is the best way to describe it. Like who's just foregoing a career in tech to go work on open source, knowing that they're probably not gonna get paid and they're gonna have to beg for money to like feed themselves. And yet everybody else in the world is benefiting from this software existing. It seems like it's a no brainer that people would just be making sure that these things are funded and developed. So I think one of the things we can do in Bitcoin is try to learn from what other projects are doing. See if like, you know, the Linux guys or the Tor guys have any tips of like, how do you guys fund developers? Because it's, it's not a problem that's unique to us. I think also, you know, we talked about like the, the bear and bull market and we kind of echoed the long-term thing. I think the long-term support is super critical because if we don't have that, we incentivize people working on quick wins. Like if I get a one year grant, I'm gonna pick a project that I can show progress in one year so that I have something to show for that money. Like, hey, you guys gave me a grant, here's my project. And that disincentivizes people working on the actual hard things that need to be done that might be three or four year projects. And I think that's the, the, the bigger problem of like the bear and bull market cycles and then funding drying up. There's just a lot of really big rocks in the space that we need to move that are like no one's incentivized to work on. Um, I just want to say that I'm not sure if it's irrational or just companies haven't figured out that there is a lot of value actually that they can get by sponsoring somebody to work on open source. First of all, it gives them access to the entire world. Through these grants, you can give grant to anybody, but you can't hire anybody in the world based on where they are based or where your company is based. And also, there are just individuals that don't fit into these corporate structures, so you can just more freely get access to them and their knowledge and their input. So you as a company keep the, these people close and they are working on something awesome, but it, when you need, I don't know, an input or a technical tip or whatever it is, you have all of these people there ready to help you as well. So I think it's just companies have not yet figured out that there is a lot of value in this. It's not just throwing out money for marketing. It, it is also uh, profit driven in my opinion. Yeah, and just to also add on to what Ben has said, I mean, I agree it's, 
irrational to a certain extent that we define being irrational as relying fully on altruism because in a profit-driven world, or I guess profit-driven um, motives, altruism isn't exactly a, an optimal solution really to go for. So I think it's a case where we need to, again, learn from the open source models of the past really to Josie's point about you know, Linux and all the, other, all the other great projects that have come before Bitcoin. And I think we also need to be more proactive, even on the VC side or all the other folks that are involved as stakeholders, to make it clear to them that at the end of the day, you could still try and like make as much money as you want. But at the end of the day, if the base protocols and the base layers are all garbage and a ton of bugs, then really is going to adversely affect everything on the nth layer. So yeah, being proactive too definitely plays a role, which ties into education, which is not too easy to do, coming into boardrooms and talking to them about why you should give out free money to people building the thing that supports your company. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've talked a lot about how big players in the space and how nonprofits like Ahrefs and OpenSats are supporting open source contributors. Uh, this question is also for everybody, but how can everyday people, everyday plebs, contribute and support the Bitcoin ecosystem? Obviously, they can donate to Ahrefs, they can donate to OpenSats, they can donate directly to contributors and builders and projects that they like. But how, uh, what other ways can everyday people contribute and support the Bitcoin ecosystem? I think just to start off, I mean, no pleb is too small, is something we should definitely clarify. I think the most effective and most immediate way you could actually support the ecosystem is to reach out to any dev. There are a bunch of developers in the space that do a lot of critical work that have donation addresses where you could actually just send them sats directly. It might be a lot more worthwhile than holding off to have big bags and then give it out to maybe a grand sponsoring organization. So I'd say start small. If there aren't any devs in your ecosystem, it could be a case where if you know about any technical developers working on Bitcoin projects in the local community, then you could help out with like organizing, maybe buying them a drink or you know water, whatever the case may be. But the little steps really are, they they add up to to really huge uh, huge impacts in the space. So I think that's like one of the most low hanging fruits you could take as a pleb. Um, my take is that there right now. I wish there were more uh, core devs, but like frankly, there's 20 to 30 core devs. And there's millions and millions of people who are using Bitcoin, using ancillary software related to Bitcoin, benefiting from it. And so, I mean, this is like such a such a like a safe answer. But like, if everyone gave a dollar, like we could for sure fund everyone. Um, but that's not the case. And so I think like it, it's it relies on like private companies. So like one thing the Bitcoin company has done is we give rewards for buying crap with your Bitcoin and we let you like you just donate 1% or 2% or 3% of your rewards. So I think there's little things that like private companies can do to like give back and it doesn't affect my bottom line. Those are rewards that were already going to customers. So I think that's one thing. But if, if we can build a like, I don't think devs should have to rely on like five organizations that are going to be giving out $10 million a year. It would be much better if everyone just kind of like, like a, the lightning prism thing that Gigi was talking about and, and BTC pay server has been working on. Like you can stream sats to people. You can, you can zap people. You can also reach out to them directly. Um, I don't think that many plebs give back, but it is incredible. Like at open sats, um, I'll, I'll use this real quick to show us. We're a 501c3. So instead of paying your tax to the government, you can give back to people like Joe's and BTC Pay and Zeus Wallet. You can also select a specific project. If you really like Project X, you really like Project Y, you can come to our website and donate directly to that person and it's 100% pass through. Um, so I think like the, the last piece is a lot of people don't know where to give. A lot of people are like, wow, I love Bitcoin. I love and I'm so appreciative of the people working on it. But I don't know how to best allocate my money. And that's probably, I mean, that's me. I don't know where the, like, the best way to go. So what we do is we try and like take money in and then we collectively decide as a group of like 10, nine or 10 subject matter experts, like where would this money go the furthest? Um, and so we give a grant to Project X or Project Y or Project Z. And we try to do our best to like spread that across the ecosystem. And so there are like intermediary organizations. You can give directly to a project you want uh, that you like, or you can kind of, give to a charity that really does their best to vet projects, to stay up to date with them, to help and support the people that they do give grants to. Um, and that's like kind of our role, HRF's role, Square's role. Um, so I think there's, there's a variety of ways, but um, you know, if, if you're a pleb, like the, the, we, we need more people giving back. I would, if I had to put a number on it, like, if, like you asked, I would say less than, less than 2%, but you'd be amazed. Like 
we had a one million dollar anonymous donation to open stats the other day so like it's not like that's cool and everything but i'd rather have a hundred thousand ten dollar donations and i think or like I, I think we can get there i think echoing that the no club is too small like there is nothing more rewarding as a developer to be working on a project you care about and then have someone reach out to you and be like hey i use this software or i use this feature i care about the work you're doing here's five bucks like that to me is like more important than anything and I, and I wish that we had a culture where you 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 could do that sustainably if you don't know where to send the money then i think it's great that these organizations like open sats exist where you're like i want to help i don't know who to fund here's some money you guys figure out where to send it but if you if you use a part of bitcoin that you care about and you see people working on it just reach out to them and i think like normalizing that i would also say like you know i'm, I'm a self-taught programmer like you can give back with your time. Like, you can get involved. That's, that's the beauty of open source. Like, we're all building this together. So, like, if you don't know who to fund or you don't, you know, have the resources to, start reviewing PRs. So get involved in a project that you care about. Start teaching yourself how to code. You know, run a bit devs. There's a lot of ways where, you know, money is time. So you can, you can give money if you don't have time. And if you have time, you can give that time. And I think normalizing that culture and starting to remind people Open source only exists because of people donating time or money to make it happen. And you can find, you know, there's, there's no shortage of work to be done. So however you can give back is, is it's useful. Like, no club too small. Like, like, it doesn't have to be a big thing. Like, just start showing up. Quickly, just quickly, I also think that product builders and open source guys need to be more open that people can actually support them and talk about it. And if you're a developer, you don't, usually don't have the time to do these things. So just find a contributor who can help you with this and just people who might not be coders but are better with words or with marketing. And that way you can also, you know, uh, just shout, give a shout out that you are the one uh, that needs help and just make people aware that uh, that's how you sustain yourself because people just don't know. They, they, they just don't know. That's, that's it. I think the time is money and money is time thing is important. If, if you don't have money to give, there are tons of projects that could use your time. So I just want to reiterate that. Uh, it's not all about money. It's, uh, you, you can give back in a variety of ways, including volunteering or you know, reviewing PRs or learning to code or running a community event that gets other Bitcoiners involved that could maybe give more time or money. So it all compounds. Well, we're out of time. Thanks so much to all our panelists, and uh, hope to see you all around the rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you, guys. Great panel there. All right. So uh, now we're going to hear from Max K telling us about HODL HODL 2.0. So everyone, welcome, Max. Hey, guys. So we are running late, actually, so I'm going to be fast. It's going to be pretty boring, but I think it's going to be pretty important as well. So before I start, I'm going to make a huge announcement. Uh, your food cards will be issued to you <laughs> at, the at the exit to the street food court. Uh, uh, right after Tour will finish his presentation, so basically at the lunchtime. Don't forget to grab them. Now, I wanted to... It's not a speech, actually. It's a couple of announcements. Uh, we believe that they are, they are pretty crucial. And uh, we believe that it's going to make peer-to-peer -peer and uh, Bitcoin landscape a bit different in next 6 to 12 months, I would say. So last year, we started improving our user interface and user experience because previously, HODL HODL was mostly based, uh, built by developers for developers. And as people who are non-developers understand, it's not a very useful tool then. So we started updating our um, design user experience, user interfaces. We actually started with our landing platform. We improved main page. We improved offers. We improved accepting offerings. And then we started to improve create offers. And we did the same with our trading platform as well. So we improved main page. We improved offers, accept offers, and create offers. And the funny thing, we understood at some point that peer-to-peer -peer is actually a UI business. It's not a, uh, it's not a like, crazy technology business. It's actually, well, as soon as you build that on top of multisig, which is a non-custodial thing. So because of that, our 
volumes for six months increased trip basically tripled and our amount of completed contracts doubled as well so it kind of worked out and we decided to continue this path so in october we are going to release a new ui ux contract flow which will be noob friendly very easy to use and also mobile and and all that stuff as well uh, then we also have a very interesting thing which is land at hodl hodl and we decided to recreate it and we decided to make it a micro lending platform for everyone a global micro lending platform where you can borrow up to 25,000 in stable coins from any part of the world from any person in the world you don't need to do KYC you don't need to, to prove anything as long as you have Bitcoin that you can lock as a collateral you can borrow easily almost instantly so we're building this land at hodl hodl thing as a micro lending platform which will be which is already available for everyone even for people in US which we usually don't serve and uh, the big thing here is that we decided we're going to release API for our lending platform so by the next bull market hopefully it will start soon everyone is struggling and feeling the pain um, we hope that there will be a lending platform, an open API, so you can build your own lending solution, integrate a lending platform in your solution. If you have a trading tools or anything else, if you are centralized, boring custodial exchange, you can actually use our API, build the proper lending tool, and we will not repeat the cases of BlockFi, Celsius, and all other uh, companies. But the big thing that I wanted to announce today um, which is last but not least, is something that we've been working for, I think, since we actually started HODL HODL. So um, we have, uh, for the past three years, like the most often question that's been asked and actually most hated question by me was, um, when lightning, sir? Yeah, just like that. I know there's a mistake, but people just write it right away. So it's a quote. And um, yeah, we've been building Lightning. We've been building it very hard and we're going to build it on top of our core principles. Our core principles align with Bitcoin principles. Should be, first of all, non-custodial and it will be non-custodial. It should be global, not just global south, but actually global. And it should be peer-to-peer. -peer. So you can do anything. You can buy single amount of sats. You can do lightning DCA between several individuals. And you will be able to do that on HODL HODL. And it's coming in Q1 2024. It's going to be massive. And you will be able to stack lightning sats peer-to-peer uh, -peer anonymously from any part of the world, from any person in the world. And you will be able to do that non-custodially, anonymously, easy, fast, and very cheap. Our design and process, we're already working on top of that. And thank you. That's it. Thank you, Max. It sounds exciting. We'll see what happens with uh, stacking with Lightning or using Lightning. Um, so next up, we're going to hear from Tour de Mista, a, a, a long-time writer and speaker in the Bitcoin space, and I'm excited to hear what he's got to say about Bitcoin and the impact on culture. So welcome, Tour. Great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am excited to be here. Uh, Max, uh, you, uh, you stole my line. Uh, you said it was going to be pretty boring, but pretty interesting as well. And I was going to say the same thing. Uh, it's been really a challenge, because I think this topic is like the most interesting thing I could think of. And uh, at the same time, it was a real struggle to, uh, to work with this theoretical stuff and, and not make it really bland. So this is my best go um, in defense of you know, me being here anyway. I think these ideas are just so important, and um, I think Bitcoin is going to have a huge impact on global culture, and uh, it's important for us to take a step back and really understand how that influence could, uh, could work. So I'm going to be taking the approach of uh, philosophy, <clears throat> uh, because history is the study of, oftentimes, the study of how societies change, but I think it's really important to also be able to evaluate, like, you know, is this a good change? Is this a bad change? Do we want this? Do we not want this? 
uh, and, and that's where uh, philosophy of law uh, comes into, um, you know, comes, in, comes on the stage because that really allows us to evaluate uh, societies. And uh, the picture up here is uh, Frank van Dunn, who was uh, my mentor and um, professor of um, natural law theory. And uh, he, he's been working with the, this stuff for decades and building on kind of the shoulders of giants because throughout history there have been many theories of natural law, what, what are the guiding principles of society. And I, I think 30 years ago he came up with a, a theory that I just, I haven't been able to find anything better. It's, it's the most elegant theory uh, and I think it's also very true. So I'll be talking about it today. None of the principles that he suggests can be reduced to one another and to me that's always a hallmark of when a theory is, is starting to look really, really solid. So we're gonna jump in today and uh, do a thought experiment, which is also the method that the Austrian economics um, theorists use, and, and it goes, of course, way back. And so what you do is you come up with a, a very rudimentary, simple situation, you analyze it, and then you see what kind of uh, laws are at work there. Uh, um, Mises called it a uh, Gedanken experiment. So that's what uh, we're going to do. Lunch is coming up, so I thought, you know, we'd talk about steaks, uh, <laughs> just to whet your appetite a little bit. So, so imagine a situation, we have two people, in front of them there's a table with a, a, just a juicy, delicious steak, and they're both hungry. And so now, as, you know, as in our suits of philosophers of law, how do we prevent conflict in this situation? Or, you know, to put it differently, how do we maintain order um, without uh, coercion? Well, one uh, possible solution, it sounds a bit strange maybe, but it's if we can make it so that there's only one person instead of two. Because even if they're really hungry, the steak is too small, uh, they're not really satiated, there's still not gonna be interpersonal conflict if there's only one person. So if you can move from plurality to unity, you're gonna have a more orderly situation. We're going to get into the nitty-gritty of what this means on, for societies in a little bit. Second principle of order is basically if we can find a way to not have these people actually have access to that steak, right? If, uh, imagine if they're actually walking in the desert and they're just fantasizing, like, wouldn't it be amazing if we had a steak? Well, they're not going to have a conflict about that. Or if the steak is locked away in some vault and they just can't, they can only see it through a little window and they can't access it, well, they're not going to have a conflict over it. So uh, restriction of access is a really powerful mechanism to prevent conflict. And of course, I'm sure a bunch of you are already thinking like, oh, well, Bitcoin kind of does that. And encryption, you know, it's like, we'll be talking about that. Absolutely. That's exactly uh, what, what goes on. There's a strong link to property rights here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, let me, uh, let me uh, just, so there's the steak. I'm glad you guys finally get to see it. We talked about unity. We talked about restriction of access. That's where we are now. So <clears throat> restriction of access, um, very important concept. What if we have two people, they both have access to the steak. Is there another way to prevent conflict? And uh, I, 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 and Van Den suggests, yes, there is. If we can make it so that both can somehow agree, uh, if they can agree on what the course of action is. So let's say they negotiate and they decide, oh, we're gonna cut it in half, we're each gonna ha eat half of the steak. Or one person says, you know what, you go ahead, have the steak, I'll find some food later on. Both want for person B to eat the steak, so they have a consensus. Again, another very powerful principle of order. Then, uh, moving on to the final solution. Sorry, I didn't mean it that way. Um, <laughs> uh, imagine a situation. We have two people. The steak is in front of them. They both have access to the steak. Um, they want different things. Is there another way that we can prevent conflict? Does anyone have an idea? Like, imagine you're an all-powerful god. You can change anything you want about the situation. <laughs> One's a libertarian, yeah. Well, that would probably go towards, preferably both are libertarians, and then you would probably have that consensus situation again. Um, well, what you could do is just create more stakes. If there's 20 stakes, 30 stakes, all of a sudden, there's no reason to have a conflict. So, 
Let's go. Yeah, if you can somehow remove the scarcity, relieve the scarcity, and create a situation of abundance, then um, you uh, kind of take the, the, uh, the, the stinger out of uh, the situation. So again, this is pretty abstract, so let's try and apply these principles to society, because that's ultimately what's going to change the course of history, is how, how societies work. Um, so going back to that first principle, um, what does it mean to have plurality on a societal level? Um, you know, because we all are individuals, like there is just a multitude of people, like how, how does it really work if, if, if you want to say philosophically there's plurality? Well, I think one way to think about it is kind of like a Tower of Babel situation where everyone is just unaware, they're, they're talking across each other, they don't understand each other, and they're just all doing their own thing, and there's just general chaos, and that's how you have that image of the building that eventually crumbles. People don't collaborate. Um, and so the, the opposite of that, unity, I believe, is when every individual has the belief that they are a part of something bigger than themselves and when they actively surrender to that belief. And just to you know, be very clear, um, I don't mean that that means for people to give up their free will or give up their liberty. Like This has to be a voluntary process. Um, but still, so that you have this idea of the greater good, um, you, uh, that you're willing to give something up for. And I think the early Christian um, you know, society is a good example of that, where, for example, people really committed to telling the truth no matter what, like that, because they felt like it just elevated everybody. Um, and of course, you know, it doesn't have to be in the spiritual realm, uh, even if we think about... Um, you know, the idea of um, killing a cow to then create hamburgers or steak, like we don't, most people don't think that's immoral, but at the same time, killing a person is immoral. So there's that idea of like, well, humanity is kind of a greater good that we all believe in. Um, and society breaks down once we stop doing that. Um, so, so yeah, those are uh, just some thoughts uh, in terms of like, how does uh, plurality show up in, in, a, in a really negative sense in society, I would say is when, when uh, certain people start pushing a surrogate of um, unity, an unsustainable mirage. There's this kind of exclusionary groupthink, like tribalism, and they start talking about the nation or the empire or the bourgeoisie or a pure race, you know, the, all those kind of things. They lead to really unstable situation and, and that kind of Tower of Babel type um, uh, um, eternal conflict. So moving on to free access versus restricted access. It's weird, right? Because free access, you would think like, oh, that sounds like a good thing. You know, we just all live in the Garden of Eden and have a, have a happy all time. Well, actually, when everybody has free access to everybody else's goods, you live in this perpetual state of uncertainty. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, of course, what comes to mind is maybe like communism or something where property rights are abolished. And who knows when, you know, they, they can enter your home and take your stuff, confiscate things. But closer to home, like basically any fiat regime, any regime that has fiat money, uh, banks and governments and other actors, they have a really great power to just take your savings, just like that. And so you have that, that incredible vulnerability and uncertainty um, of uh, just unannounced, unquantifiable, continually accelerating inflation tax. Right? And, and the opposite of that is uh, the, on the other side of the spectrum where you have restricted access. One historical example, and of course you guys probably know, you know where I grew up, but uh, is the Netherlands of the, the 17th century in particular where not only did they have the Bank of Amsterdam, which was you know, internationally renowned, famous, for being a full reserve bank where um, the, the access to the gold was extremely restricted by a very, a very intricate system of checks and balances. So not only did they have that, but also they had physically around the country uh, a whole system of moats and sluices. So they used water as a way to protect themselves from especially the Spanish Empire and later other invading armies. So they, very much this was a society built around restriction of access and it became, you know, just a beacon in the world of showing, you know, what prosperity was. Like, you can just all look at the paintings of that era. There's this incredible energy that emerges from that. So that's restriction of access in, on a societal level. Um, next, we had diversity, which is when people disagree. 
and, and when they act on it in a very particular way, because I, I want to make it clear, I don't think disagreement is conflict. If you disagree with another, it doesn't mean, as long as you're not bashing each other's head in, there's nothing wrong with disagreement. Um, <clears throat> but what I mean with diversity in this context what I mean is that when people get entrenched in that disagreement, they start boycotting or otherwise attacking the other person. Like imagine like a marriage where you know, it's, it's ruled by contempt and stonewalling. That to me is that diversity. And, and of course, oftentimes people in that situation like to project to the outside world this image of consensus and we're all getting along. And so that's why I give this example of the Leviathan um, where, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, Habsburg Spain or uh, absolutist France, you had this very stark uh, distinction between the elites and the people and there wasn't a lot of communication between them. And then as an example of a consensus-based society, uh, again, this sounds maybe weird, but I'm proposing ancient Greece, uh, Hellas, even though you would think like, but they all disagreed with each other, like how does that, you know, wh what do you mean consensus-based? It's like, yes, but there were very few things that they did agree on. Like, they agreed that they were Greek. Um, they, they agreed to, generally speaking, not resolve conflict by combat, but, but instead by, you know, peaceful negotiation and things like that. They also had their... Um, I mean, it's the, it's, there's a reason, reason why it's the cradle of democracy, that, 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 that dialogue, dialogos, was really at the, at the heart of a lot of things. So that's why I chose this image of you know, two, two uh, ancient Greeks uh, talking to each other. And I think, you know, speaking of Bitcoin, that's kind of what we're seeing in Bitcoin. Like, for a lot of people, they're like, what do you mean Bitcoin is like a consensus-based community? Like, why even use the word community? It's just like herding cats and everybody's fighting. It's like, yeah, and w w that's true. But And we talk about the civil war in Bitcoin and the big block, uh, you know, um, war that we had, but nobody died in that war. We were just, you know, kind of typing away behind our keyboards. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the consensus-based society is, is just an incredibly powerful in how it, it kind of propels us forward to more prosperity and more peace. Um, so moving on to our last. This is our last uh, principle, and this is a, a bit of a tricky one, is, is how to go from scarcity to abundance. Because... Um, <clears throat> Scarcity is just a, a given, right? I mean, uh, not only is the world finite, materially speaking, there's only so much stuff to go around, um, but also human needs and wants are infinite. There's just no, no boundary. And then additionally, you have that, you know, Rene Girard always pointed out that people have that mimetic desire where, you know, when you have a neighbor who wants things, uh, you are going to start mimicking those wants. And so as he grows wealthier, whatever, and he wants, he gets more ambitious, then you're also going to want. So there's this ad infinitum loop of, you know, wants just go on and on. So how, how could we possibly have abundance in a scarce world? I think that a, a way out of this conundrum is, is it's kind of a paradoxical solution. It's when we learn to accept that the world is scarce and have comfort with that. It's almost like we, we find a way to position ourselves towards the world where we start feeling comfortable with just the things being the way they are. We have war going on, we have repression, we have suffering all over, and yet we find a way to be at peace with that and, and, and to be even like, you know, flourishing in, in that context. And that's why I picked that second picture uh, whereas instead of like people being stuck in that infinite loop of always wanting more things, is if you can find the right perspective. And this is Bruegel uh, painting the fall of Icarus, which is that tragic story. And, and it, you can barely see it, but he's actually falling like way in the background. So you see that picture of hubris way in the background. And, 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 but the, the way that this picture looks is like it's, it's a picture of peace and, um, and prosperity and order. And another way to think about it is like imagine you're some kind of trapper in the wilderness. Maybe you're in Sweden somewhere uh, trying to f catch beavers and you're starting to get cold and you make a fire. Well, if you sit it f too far away from the fire, you you're going to be super uncomfortable and it's not going to be, you know, nice to be a trapper. If you get too close to the fire, you're going to burn yourself. It's terrible. But if you find just the right distance, it gets really comfortable and blissful. And so that that's how I look at um you know, achieving that state of abundance, 
uh, Aristotle, when he talked about what the ultimate virtue was, uh, he talked about tokalon, which is often translated as the noble. Actually, it's suggested that the better translation is actually the beautiful. Like that is the ultimate uh, thing that we want to aspire for. And so I want to suggest that abundance and beauty are actually synonyms. Um, <clears throat> again, going back to fiat culture versus Bitcoin culture, we can start evaluating these societies um, according to these principles. Uh, and so I think you've got to make a distinction between early stage fiat culture, where it's like when we kind of were on the gold standard still, but things are starting to shift and we're seeing the first injections of uh, this, uh, this artificial credit into the markets. You know, then in, in that situation, you still have reasonable, you know, uh, unity. People still believe in the greater good. Um, there is still, you know, pretty decent property rights. Um, people, by and large... Um, have that like open debate culture and then of course there's this massive sense of abundance because all of a sudden you know money is raining from the sky and what people don't realize is that their own savings are being undermined and used they just live in this belief that there's just a massive abundance all of a sudden so quite quite peaceful but then as that the collapse happens the downturn of the business cycle or even worse the like the what Mises calls the Katastrophenhauser which is like when the fiat system itself collapses you get very high inflation then it all just breaks down um, and, and uh, abundance turns into incredible scarcity just like the Great Depression Weimar Germany etc and that's just you know extremely painful and so what we have here is like we have two almost two societies that are moving side by side, like Bitcoin society is growing, and then that fiat society is kind of on the retreat, but it's still incredibly dominant. And so I think we can talk, and again, I'm not trying to claim a new term here, like Bitcoin culture. I just mean like for lack of a better word. Like I do think, you know, history is shifting. This is the beginning of a new era. I think Bitcoin is a catalyst, but I have no idea what this new era is going to be called. But I do think what's certain is that we can already see within Bitcoin culture, there's so much talk about how to restrict access, right? We're talking about encryption, we're talking about multi-sig, better ways of, of implementing not your keys, not your coin. Like it, it's, it's in the memes, it's just everywhere, like that sense of the importance of privacy. Um, and so, you know, and, and then of course, you know, we have that healthy debating culture. We already are having that idea of like the aestheticism and, and, and material wealth that, that is probably going to increase in the future. And I think one of the big questions is like, where are we going to go from here? I think it's fairly certain that that emphasis on restriction of access is going to be maintained. Um, uh, probably ar around the world and then how these other things are going to be filled in is kind of up to us it's going to be up to the you know future generations but I, I do think there's an incredible opportunity here to to try and set the tone right and um, let me try and uh, justify why that is unfortunately I don't have the time to really go into the arguments as to why there I believe there's a hierarchy uh, for these principles um, but uh, I, I do believe there is. I think that you know, if, if you have a basis of people already having, wanting to do things for the greater good, then you almost have an organic evolution where it becomes easier to then have a culture where property rights are more emphasized, where technology is appreciated, where people build things and collaborate. And then from there, it gets you know, again easier to have a culture that there's open debate and um, and that, and, the, and that collaborative sense of dialogue. And then from there, you don't even have to do anything. Automatically, uh, abundance emerges. It just, it's, it's a, it, it, you transcend the, uh, the scarcity. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of, I think the promise here potentially, like if we can take a little bit from the early Christians, like that sense of unity, if we can somehow take a little bit from you know, the Dutch guys from the 17th century, that restriction of access, if we can take a little bit <clears throat> uh, from that, you know, ancient Greek debating culture, we can just build something incredible or at least contribute to, you know, something incredible for future generations. So that's the, the core of my talk. I want to change gears just a little bit just to also talk about other ways that Bitcoin is going to influence global culture. Um, one thing that I've seen happen when you just you know, read the stuff, you know, his, his, histories and, and, and literature from the past, theories, is what you do see 
pretty clearly is when there's a technological revolution, the thinkers of that time, of that era, start use, referring to that revolution. And they start using it as a metaphor. Like we all know like the idea of the mind as a blank slate, like that's one of those things. Um, uh, and then I wanted to give this example in particular because it shows that um, it, it's not necessarily a great thing. Like it can go either way. It can be used for good or it can be used for question, in questionable ways. This is uh, um, John Amos Comenius who uh, grew up in Czech Republic. Uh, most of you probably don't know him, but he's actually the, the, the godfather of the curriculum, the, the curriculum in, in education. So when we all use textbooks and the teacher uses a textbook with pictures and all that, he pioneered that. And, and, and so this man used uh, the printing press as, a, as a, a metaphor to kind of promote his own ideas about, you know, how children are and, and, and basically that literally we should impress the right ideas on these children's minds. And so that was the cradle of modern schooling. Like that's, so, you know, that's why I mean like for better or worse. I don't, I don't think this is necessarily a uniformly positive evolution. And, and um, so, so um, let me just switch to, uh, oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. Maybe some of you were confused. I have my own slides here that are separate. Uh, but yeah, so that was the, the overview. I'm glad we got that for the video at least. And uh, this was that, um, hard, that, that uh, modular way of, of thinking about things, the layers. And then this is uh, John Amos Comenius. So he has this whole metaphor that he works out about the parallels between uh, the printing press and how children's minds are. Mm. And so I think there's also other ways that Bitcoin is going to be used as a metaphor by just in completely different uh, disciplines. Right? People are going to use, I think, possibly maybe modularity, the idea that you, you have a core layer and you build things on top of that, like that might come back. The idea of immutable principles, like what a concept, like people have been talking about this for millennia, but I do think we, it's fair to say that in the past like 200 years, that's been undermined. Like, you know, you had the materialists, you had the empiricists, you had the, the, the modernists, the postmodernists, like, uh, you know, oftentimes the whole idea of even having universal principles has been questioned. And so with, um, with these base principles that Bitcoin is based on, I think that could uh, make a revival. Uh, cathedral building, like the idea of having um, a really long-term time horizon where, I mean, it's implied in, in the blockchain, right? I mean, the fact that you start at one point and it just goes on and on and on. And whatever we do on the Bitcoin blockchain is theoretically preserved forever. Uh, I think that really inspires long-term thinking uh, censorship resistance, privacy, like that, we could see that pop up in all kinds of areas, incorruptibility, uh, and then the idea also of like starting something big from scratch, like something really bold from scratch. Uh, I think this is going to inspire uh, a lot of people. So, so those are some things that I think Bitcoin already has to offer in terms of being used as a metaphor. Um, yeah, so, so in my view, Bitcoin will have a huge impact on global culture in all kinds of ways. I think it's important for us to make sure to take a step back every now and then and think about culture in general and how to evaluate changes. Um, you know, with this restriction of access things, like it's just, it's so foundational that we have ways to protect and preserve property rights. It builds so much stability uh, to then from there create this beautiful, bountiful society. It's just incredibly exciting to me. So I want to end it here. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much, Tour. Okay, guys, so it is now lunchtime. So one quick announcement. You can get your food cards on the exit out to the stalls area. So just get your food cards there. We'll see you back in 30 minutes. So it's 2.37, so... Call it 307, and we'll be back um, in 30 minutes.
moderating. And uh, we're going to have our panelists join us now. So uh, why don't you guys come up and join us, uh, and we'll uh, get everyone introduced and start our panel. Oh, okay. I'm in the middle. I'm, I'm, I'm refereeing this thing now. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so we've got Alex, Oleg, Muzz, and Chris. Um, so now, I'm not exactly sure why, but this panel got titled EU versus the US. So, uh, you know, I'm th I was thinking like Anchorman, like the different news crews, and they get together and they fight each other, but I I'm not really sure why we would do that. But, you know, whatever. Let's just uh, hear a little bit from everyone, a little bit of what you're, you know, who you are, what you're focused on, uh, and then we can take it from there. We can get into our fight after that. Hey, uh, I'm Alex. I run Time Chain. It's a Bitcoin-only venture fund, and we also run Concentric, which is a more traditional venture capital fund as well. Um, I'm Oleg. I'm with Folger Ventures. We invest in Bitcoin and Lightning startups since uh, 2019. Hey, I'm Mike Jarmas. My company's Lightning Ventures, and we have a syndicate where anyone can invest. Uh, individuals can invest in Bitcoin startups, and we have one fund that is almost fully deployed. Chris Hunter. I've been on both sides of the table in the industry, both as an investor as well as an entrepreneur accepting investment. Helped create Galloy, the Bitcoin Beach Wallet. Have a new venture called Satoshi, the everything Bitcoin app for everyone and have been very active angel investing in more than 30 Bitcoin-only companies. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, seeing as the, the theme was about US versus uh, EU and Europe, um, one interesting area of difference is around some of the different regulations that are out there. In the EU, there's MICA. In the US, there's this talk around you know, choke points and access to fiat banking. Um, so maybe let's start with that. So does anyone have a, a comment to offer around you know, dealing with uh, the regulation and how it differs. Um, yeah, I could offer a couple of thoughts. Um, I uh, tend to answer this question a little bit flippantly because uh, when we talk about regulation, uh, it kind of implies that the government is our master and we have to sort of uh, be at the whims of whatever they decide, which if you've ever dealt with regulators, uh, in particular in the UK or EU, does tend to feel quite arbitrary and, and sometimes capricious. Um, but from a European perspective, MICA does seem like a positive step forward. Like We can't invest in companies that are breaking the law, and having some sort of regulatory clarity, which we have got through MICA, is, is helpful. Um, on the flip side, uh, you could argue that uh, the EU Commission, which, which writes these laws, is subject to capture quite easily. And once uh, that organization is captured, it's rolled out across Europe in general. Um, whereas in the States, with a more sort of state-by-state -state system, you do have some pushback at a more local level. Um, and so that might be an advantage for the US over the long term, even though uh, sort of right now it looks a, bit, a little bit tricky. Um, that'd be my opening thoughts on that. Yeah, a couple thoughts to add from the US perspective. You know, you'll hear a refrain there is no regulation for Bitcoin in the U.S., which is just a complete lie. I mean, we have laws in place that govern financial services companies and the like, and there's laws against things like committing fraud, where we had bad actors like FTX break those types of laws. And so, you know, there, there's largely a regulatory framework in the U.S., you know, it might not be as clear at times, kind of echoing Alex's comments as we would prefer. So that's one insight. Second, and perhaps more important, over the last year, despite the laws that we have in place, we've basically seen an illegal assault by the Biden administration and other arms of the U.S. federal government against our industry, and it's most fundamentally been expressed through um, the regulators of the banking system who, you know, the existing commercial banks that are regulated at the federal level have the fear of God put into them in terms of serving companies in this industry, and so that's been a real pain. And then we've also additionally seen action through arms like the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, 
um, basically either illegally or without clarity going after and suing certain companies, um, which creates a whole set of problems unto itself as well. So the, the regulation is, is one question, which is relatively clear, but I think the actions that the governments take even beyond the regulation is perhaps the more fundamental question to focus on. And what kind of, I guess, carrying that on, it, in terms of the regulations that exist, how does that impact our investments when we're investing into Bitcoin companies? Does that mean we have to think about, okay, it, th maybe they need to raise a larger size because they have to go and get this particular regulatory approval or some kind of license? What, how does that play out into your actual investment decisions? I, I, you know, this panel is like EU versus US, right? And we're all joking down there, like, we're number one. Like, it, in what way? Or like, where the innovation is, like, where the capital's coming from, like, where the VCs are, you know? But the, I think the, what's interesting about MICA is, like, the EU is f a thousand times, you know, steps ahead, just world the head. Look at the exchanges you have here, especially on like a peer-to-peer. -peer. I mean, <laughs> we have nothing like that. There's no relay there. You know, I mean, RoboSats was born here. You have Hoddle Hoddle. You know, you have Peach. You know, you have Coin Corner, Bitstack. I mean, how many, you know, uh, good European exchanges do you have? Like, we don't have anything like that. Like, there isn't one of those in the U.S. So, you know, we have Swan and Strike, Cash App. But I just think that, like, the EU basically regulating crypto um, and putting this framework is just worlds ahead. And if the U.S. doesn't get it together, they're going to fall behind even further. But I guess one other area that a U.S. person could push back is say, well, there's, you know, a lot of money coming in from the U.S. side. I'm curious what you, what you guys think um, in terms of, the viability of those businesses if you think maybe a lot of, let's say, high net worth people in the U.S. are investing into Bitcoin. You see that or that doesn't play into your investment thesis at all? High net worths in, in Bitcoin? Or just the yeah, as in, capital in Yeah, so as an example, like, let me put it this way. As an example, if there's, you know, high net worth people buying Bitcoin and that maybe they're in the U.S., does that have an advantage towards certain U.S. businesses who are who can you know serve that demand. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe I would um, I would frame it as uh, in the U.S. the level of sophistication generally for startups is a lot higher. Uh, it's a much more uh, professional, sophisticated, um, orchestrated venture capital environment, and that translates into the startups that are built in that space. Europe is still quite scrappy. Uh, capital is much more scarce. Uh, it's harder to get businesses off the ground here, I'd say. Um, well, actually, th that's not true. So over the last couple of years, we did a bit of work, and we, s we found that roughly the same number of seed stage startups get launched in Europe and the US. The big difference is when it comes to growth capital. Um, so we do have these sort of early stage businesses that get launched, and, and reasonably frequently, um, but they all get to a sort of Series A, Series B stage, and then raising you know, 5, 10, 15, 100 million dollars is much harder in Europe than it is in the US. That's sort of the big advantage that the US has. Uh, and that's true throughout the venture capital uh, stack, really, regardless of sector, but especially in the US, um, especially in, uh, in, in sort of the Bitcoin space as well. Um, so I think that's probably one of the big differences between the US and, and Europe. Uh, it's more or less the same to get a business off the ground, but if you really want to scale it aggressively, then the US is, is still by far the best place to be. Yeah, that's a great point about um, the investment aspect of it because if you have a fund and you're looking for investors to invest in your fund or into your, um, it, so that you can in turn deploy that capital, obviously it matters if, you, if you've got a lot of um, US investors or European high net worth investors who can actually put capital with you, right? Um, and you mentioned as well ar around um, the stages also. So, you know, Bitcoin has been around for what, 14 years, coming up to 15. Uh, how many you know big Bitcoin companies really do exist, and how, how you know uh, wh why you know why is it that there's so few you know so bi so few big Bitcoin companies? Is it just that we've had you know just you know that kind of really rough bull and bear cycles? Do you have any um, any thoughts on that? Probably not uh, so easy to build a Bitcoin company from, from ground up uh, because first you need to be like really, really first. Bitcoin was the first uh, 
of, of its kind, other blockchains followed, uh, so you need like to assume certain technical capabilities to understand what you're trying to build. Then you need to convince investors. Investors didn't come into crypto kind of like before like the LCO booms, et cetera, et cetera. So the capital was not uh, quite available. So it's probably like a product of, uh, of the engineering complexity of Bitcoin and uh, the need to understand uh, how, how to build on Bitcoin, how to navigate a regulatory landscape, and also uh, the product of uh, um, scarce uh, venture capital that is available to to, to Bitcoin uh, startups. But uh, eventually it's, uh, it, it, it's going to change because uh, we're seeing that Bitcoin is uh, advancing in, uh, in adoption as, uh, as a technology stack and also as an asset class. Uh, so it's, it's, it's going to, to be different uh, hopefully soon. Yeah, I mean, to, to build on Oleg's comments, if you're creating a Bitcoin-only company, you know, Nick, Nick Carter and I were um, both part of the, the Draper X program, advising companies there, and during the, um, the pitch day, he, he kind of congratulated all the companies in advance and said, you're playing life on hard mode compared to doing something else in the crypto industry more broadly. And I, I think the insight there is, in any domain in life, if you tell me what the financial incentives are, I'll tell you what the human behavior or outcome is going to be. And we've seen this with so many examples where it's just more lucrative in the short term to either launch a token project or open a casino like Coinbase, right? There's a reason why for the last eight years we have not heard Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, say the B word, Bitcoin, right? Because it's much more lucrative for him just to run a casino and trade all these other tokens in order to generate returns for his shareholders, right? And so the analogy I have in my head is the tortoise and the hare. Those of us building on Bitcoin, it's gonna be a much longer path, a much slower path, but hopefully it'll be much more rewarding and lucrative in the end. But what we've seen in the decade past is a little bit different. There, there actually is no Bitcoin only unicorn. And it's probably because we are too early, well, right? That's, I mean, that's, not, I mean, that's not true. Well, okay. I mean, not, not dig seven billion. Okay. So there's one, I guess. But, um, you know, like even Blockstream, you know, raised north of a billion. And uh, like the Bitcoin price, you know, that's pretty volatile too. But if you think about a lot of the largest Bitcoin companies, I mean, what are their valuations? You know, maybe half a billion or so for some of the largest out there. And it's probably just too early. I mean, when you think about the the larger companies in that space that had exits or are about to exit, just like Hunter said, you know, it's, they're selling garbage, you know, Kraken, uh, Coinbase, uh, but there really isn't like a true, you know, Bitcoin only company that's really gotten and stuck that billion dollar valuation, uh, except for Nidig. Yeah, it was just, it's, it, historically it's been hard to monetize Bitcoin, right? Like, um, you can mine it, and there are a bunch of NASDAQ-listed Bitcoin miners. Um, obviously, their, their fortunes are, are a bit mixed. Um, and then the only really, the only uh, sort of proven historical way to make money off a Bitcoin-only strategy is by being an on or off-ramp. Um, but then, you know, when you're on an off-ramp, the temptation is to list these other tokens because that increases your revenue stream by 10, 100 times. And because these tokens aren't subject to security legislation, you can promise whatever you want when you launch a token. And, and you know, we, I guess we all know that story. Um, so, you know, hopefully that's beginning to change now with the Lightning Network uh, coming of age. And there's all sorts of industrial as well as consumer applications for the Lightning Network that look really interesting. But again, the business model for a lot of these businesses isn't yet proven. You know, we'll think there'll be payments businesses and that has a relatively traditional uh, monetization method, um, but it's, it's yet to be seen. As that begins to change, then I think we'll start attracting, uh, you know, the growth uh, venture capital guys to start writing bigger checks and we'll start building those unicorns. But I think really uh, the, the, the ecosystem is at a very nascent stage of its development. Um, it's, you know, two or three years in, uh, I would say. So speaking of types of companies, as, as you mentioned, I think people had this perception, and it was probably true in the early days, that the way to make money in Bitcoin, like to, to have a profitable business, was either to be a miner or to be an exchange. That was sort of his historically, that was what it was. I think maybe the question could be, are there other models that are viable and are vi viable now? Um, as an example, can you deliver other financial services with Bitcoin, like whether it's loans or other things in a Bitcoin context? Or are there other 
cases where it can you could do a profitable business that's not just exchange or mining. What do you guys think? Are we there yet, or do you think that's a future thing? Aren't you building something that's doing just that right now? Sure, we're building this. Other people are building solutions, right? And so, to place it in context, you know, if you're going to make money as a company, you have to offer something that people value. We we know what people value just by the products and services that exist in the world of traditional banking and payments, right? So people want to be able to hold on to their money and save it and invest it and borrow against it and spend it, right? And so the, the, the features are easy to think through, right? It's the, the infrastructure layer and the tooling hasn't really been there yet in order for us to provide similar products and features in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So it will evolve, right? But just like the commercial banking system was built in layers and the internet itself was built out in layers, you know, the Bitcoin ecosystem somewhat analogously will also be built out in layers, but, you know, the foundational layers are still kind of, um, they're not very concrete yet. Yeah, I can mention a couple of things that we're really excited about time chain. We've probably made 14 investments in the Bitcoin space and uh, uh, right across the Bitcoin stack and across the world as well. Uh, as well. Um, a bunch of companies here that uh, we find interesting, for example, Debify, uh, they're looking to provide uh, loans on top of Bitcoin, using Bitcoin as collateral. Um, and then we're also really fascinated by uh, B2B applications of the Lightning Network. So I think over the past couple of years, you've seen a big emphasis on consumer applications of Lightning. Uh, and now we're beginning to see a number of teams pop up uh, and sort of industry veterans who have spent 10 or 15 years in a specific industry and have realized that Lightning solves a specific problem within that industry. I think that's really interesting because it's, it's uh, people coming from industry and finding Bitcoin as a solution to a problem that they know really well rather than the reverse. And so that gives me a lot of confidence uh, in uh, the applicability of the Lightning Network sort of behind the scenes. I think over the next two or three years, if we can really prove out those, um, uh, those, those uh, use cases, that'll add a lot of value to uh, the network in general um, and a lot of proof points as well. It's probably an uh, underappreciated fact that uh, Bitcoin is aiming at innovation in a very conservative industry, which is uh, like basically monetary industry and, and financial industry. Uh, but obviously there is uh, at least a couple of uh, fundamental properties of, of Bitcoin as, as a technology stack as, and an asset class that make it uh, uh, potentially very useful for payments like such as micropayments. It's like it's uh, not... Uh, uh, a surprise that uh, all the agents in the in an economy benefit if there is more, like more transactions and transactions uh, happen at uh, a higher velocity. So that's exactly what what Lightning Network uh, can potentially bring: microtransactions, uh, more exchange uh, of value at a higher speed. And this is definitely a huge potential for innovation in payments. But payments are dominated by incumbent plain players, there is a lot of regulation, so it's like a very conservative market. And same as like what Alex said, it's like Bitcoin as collateral. If you compare Bitcoin to, to gold, to, to a house, to, to another type of uh, illiquid collateral, so Bitcoin can emerge as an ultimate like very liquid and very universal class of collateral. But again, it touches a lot of uh, very conservative industries such as again, like mortgage industry or like loans industry, uh, it will have to go through a few hoops before um, applications can reach uh, the level where they can actually scale. But yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Like B2B companies like, like ZBD, uh, they are serving other companies who are serving like hundreds of thousands, if not like, I, I don't want to give any numbers, especially like we're investors in ZBD, so there's like full disclosure, but uh, we're getting there. There is more economic activity because uh, Bitcoin and Lightning Network provide some fundamental properties that can enable uh, innovation in uh, payments and uh, financial system. It's just like a very conservative space. Something interesting you mentioned there, Oleg, around, um, and Alex as well, I think you, you were touching on this, around the kinds of uses of Bitcoin. Because often when we are talking about Bitcoin, maybe as an individual, we're thinking like as a, as a typical, you know, quote unquote pleb or ADIQ pleb, right? And we're thinking as the consumer uses. But uh, it could also be that there's a lot of business uses that maybe have not been tapped. Uh, and some of those business B2B cases um, 
are yet to be fully explored. Do you guys, what do you guys think about that, B2B cases for Bitcoin? Yeah, well, for, for sure, one of uh, these cases could be cross-border B2B payments, especially for like medium-sized, small companies who are very sensitive to liquidity and to, to getting paid in time and not losing too much money on transaction fees on, and, and cross-border, like cross-currency exchange fees. So uh, business to business payments uh, is definitely like one, one of the areas where Bitcoin Lightning Network and uh, uh, this kind of enabling technologies can deliver a lot of value. So a lot of companies that are using uh, a lot of opportunity not being able to settle faster and with less uh, overheads. Something like Vita comes to mind, I think Alex. Um, we both invest in Vita, and they're uh, settling um, basically regional telecommunications companies in Latin America. There's a settlement risk uh, between these telcos and pilot programs basically uh, powered by lightning, right? And nobody knows, and that's kind of a trend too, like Sonoda's doing. Yeah, Sonoda's another interesting one as well. I think that's this idea of having... Lightning um, being used by Bitcoin miners and paying energy companies, and could you make a connection there? And would it actually be, you know, quite useful uh, for a business case there? So that's something that probably a bunch of us uh, might have invested in in that particular case. Um, when we're thinking about, you know, coming back to the U.S. versus EU uh, or Europe, uh, do you see any cultural differences there in terms of the the builders that you meet, the developers that you meet? Is there cultural differences that you notice there, or do you think it's similar culture-wise? Um, yeah, we've done a, a number of investments across uh, US, EU, and, and further afield as well. Um, I would say, uh, maybe I'll just sort of comment from the venture capital side as well, because actually there's a big difference in venture capital money from US versus EU. Maybe I'll sort of yeah. address that first. Um, so one of the questions people don't often ask is where do VCs get their money from? And uh, the dirty secret, I think, of European venture capital is that the vast majority of the money comes from the state. Uh, so it's, sort of, I don't know, probably 70 to 80 percent of venture capital money in the EU comes from uh, a number of public bodies, one called the European Investment Fund, another one called the British Business Bank. Um, we've never taken money from either of those institutions, but if you want to get a venture capital uh, firm off the ground, then more often than not, you will go to one of those two firms. And that has consequences. In, in, in the US, it's very different. So you have endowments, you know, university funds, uh, Stanford and Harvard, for example, they manage you know, 40, 50 billion dollars each, and 80 percent of that money will go into alternatives, and the vast majority of that might be in venture capital. And so you have uh, these private sector institutions who are engaged with uh, innovation in a, in a sort of very capitalistic sense. Whereas in the EU, you have public bodies funding venture capital firms, and the driver for these public bodies is not necessarily returns. Like the British Business Bank might not even demand a return on their investment. They'll just say, you keep all the profits, but we want you to deploy 60% of money in the UK. We want you to deploy money in these sectors. We might have ESG or DEI you know, criteria that you have to invest alongside. And so that translates into a different cultural sort of... Uh, uh, deployment environment uh, for VCs in, in US for CU and might be sort of one of the reasons behind uh, uh, differing success, shall we say. That's a really great insight, actually. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that myself, so yeah, go on. Go on. Yeah, probably the approach to innovation in general is, is the one where there could be like a certain difference between uh, yeah, different types of approach. In one approach, you would just like want to break things fast and, and really try to get to, to a failure like really as, as fast as you can. And in another approach, you would want to be like a little bit more like scientific and academic and like build for, for resilience. Um, when we were in Prague, Mike had a cool presentation about different types of uh, angel investors and like their, their capabilities uh, uh, compared to other investors. So in, in that regard, I think it's, it's good to combine like different cultural approaches at different like stages of, of startup to kind of get, get the best of, of both worlds to, to be able to build for resilience when by approaching things in a more like systematic way and uh, also 
when you need scalability uh, by, by being able to access capital that actually is abundant and uh, is readily provided to, to, scale, to scale fast. Anything to add? No. no? Okay. Um, so when it comes to, um, I guess, your thesis about Bitcoin, right? Obviously, we're all bullish on Bitcoin. Obviously, we wouldn't be here if we weren't. But maybe there are certain angles in the ecosystem that maybe you think is going to ha is going to be a clearer need that comes sooner. So, uh, as an example, there are some who believe that, for example, store of value first, right? There are people who, and if you had that thesis, you might think, oh, I need to focus on like self custody and multi sig and this kind of thing, and like on ramps, and then maybe other people are maybe more focused on peer to peer and uh, merchant payment processing and uh, maybe off ramping. It might be another example. So I'm curious if you have any sort of broader thesis ideas that color your view of investment. Yeah, I can go. Um, it's, it's very context specific for us. Um, so we think about it, you know, um, uh, Bitcoin as an asset and a monetary protocol. Um, they're probably like the, the two dimensions. And then uh, there's a number of different types of customers. Um, and for each type of customer, the use case is very context specific. So uh, individual, institution, and nation state. Um, and each, uh, each customer requires a different type of software solution depending on the geography uh, in which they're based and depending on whether they're looking to utilize Bitcoin as an asset or a monetary protocol. Um, and then we just evaluate what makes most sense in that particular geography, if the founder has the right skills to execute on that business plan and uh, if the market opportunity is large enough, and that's, that's, that tends to be how we'll make our sort of investment decision. Um, that's the sort of very broad framework with which we use to, to evaluate things, I suppose. Yeah. Oleg has been investing in early stage Bitcoin startups uh, longer than all of us up here, back when the only thing that you could really invest in was a wallet. Uh, it was like a wallet or an exchange. There wasn't a lot. You didn't have these sort of clever things like, you know, Crowd Health and Sonoda, Vita, Slice, all the companies that are here doing all these kind of cool things. It just didn't exist. And now that it's just so exciting, there's a million different things. And we didn't talk about liquid. You know, we invested in a number of liquid projects, you know, digital markets. They're compliantly uh, listing securities for many global IPOs. It's like the biggest TAM I've ever seen. Like, it, it's just so early for stuff like that. It's just cool that there's so much stuff you can invest in now. Yeah, speaking of, uh, of wallets, one of the areas that is probably quite underinvested is building, building UX and UI and, and user experience that is meaningful and understood by, uh, by the average user. Uh, so probably like investing in this area could, uh, uh, could help us uh, get to the next breakthrough in, in Bitcoin adoption. The other area which is probably also like considered differently um, across across the oceans is uh, how businesses can benefit from from Bitcoin being it accumulating Bitcoin in the treasury or using Bitcoin mining to do some like energy efficiency optimization or or, or doing payments so um, and in in the typical innovation curve there's like so-called uh, like this um, like this d downward part of the curve when uh, nothing is happening and everybody thinks that like technology is dead. So after this like downward moment, there is usually the industrial adoption where in specific industries there is a pattern that is discovered that actually shows how this specific industry can benefit from this specific new technology. So we're, we're probably like getting, getting there, but uh, investing and doing more research on how Bitcoin uh, both as an asset class, as, as a monetary protocol, as a payment system, can be used by businesses in specific industries, like in, like in mining, in uh, like food production, in industrial production, wh whatever it can be. Could be another area of breakthrough uh, that we will not have to wait for for too long, hopefully. Okay, great. Well, look, I think we've only got about a minute left, so uh, we might as well just uh, finish it up there. Unless anyone's got any, any last comments that you'd like to make? All right, well, I think that's great. Um, I think some great, we've seen some great insights shared from our panelists today. So everyone, please put your hands together for Alex, Oleg, Muz, and Chris. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, great, great uh, panel. Uh, next up, we're going to learn a little bit about circular economy. Give a warm welcome to Sergey, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Sergey. I'm the CEO of Bitrefill. Um, I guess maybe just a quick uh, raise of hands. Who here is familiar with Bitrefill since before? This lights are bright. All right. And who uh, has used Bitrefill at some point? All right. And who has used Bitrefill in the last month? All right. All right. Cool. So, um, for those uh, who didn't uh, uh, raise, raise your hands, uh, Bitrefill is a platform uh, where we uh, sell digital goods uh, for uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, things like uh, gift cards, uh, phone refills, recently started doing eSIMs, virtual visa cards, uh, things like that. Uh, our own estimation uh, is that we uh, are uh, the largest single merchant uh, uh, that works with cryptocurrency and probably the largest single source of cryptocurrency commerce uh, and Bitcoin commerce uh, in the world. We do every month more than double the number of transactions of like the entire BitPay network, which includes some of our competitors. Not to say that we are that big. Um, just uh, Nobody's challenged me on this, so I guess I'll keep saying it until they do. Anyway, we sell gift cards. Um, our mission, though, all right, how many people recognize this meme? Just quick raise of hands. Oh, surprisingly few, okay. Uh, so, in the olden days, <laughs> there was this meme um, uh, where uh, Neo asks, what are you trying to say? That one day I can trade my bitcoins for millions? And, and, and Morpheus says, no, um, the dream is that one day you won't have to. <laughs> right? And that's what we're working on, like the idea that you shouldn't have to sell your, uh, your Bitcoins on an exchange. Uh, it should just live freely. Because like, like, none of this stuff that we're all talking about works if the network topography is just like, hey, you buy some Bitcoins on an exchange, you send them to a wallet, and you hodl it for a while, and then you send it back to the exchange and sort of... Yeah, like we, 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 need the, we, we need there to be an economy. We need Bitcoins to circulate from wallet to wallet to wallet to wallet to exchanges to services to whatever. Right, like this model is to me, it's like a CBDC that's denominated in a meme coin. Like, I don't know. Yeah, people disagree. <laughs> um, anyways, so uh, over the past nine years uh, that uh, we've been running Bitrefill, which is quite a while, we've learned a lot of things in terms of, in terms of like growing uh, marketing uh, uh, these sort of things, uh, which is surprisingly hard. And some of these uh, things that I'm going to share with you are, are things that were a little bit uh, counterintuitive and took us embarrassingly, eh, embarrassingly long time uh, to figure out for ourselves. Uh, so I'm thinking sh sharing these things uh, will, uh, uh, will help uh, others to avoid some of the mistakes uh, uh, that, or to get the learnings uh, faster. And I, I did this talk, uh, or an uh, earlier variant of this talk over a year ago at, uh, at Prague. Uh, and uh, it got very popular, so this is an updated, um, updated version because I still see people sort of uh, not following along with some of this thinking. So the, the core mental model that I would like to, to introduce uh, for, for people to follow along with is the idea that Bitcoin is both a tool, it's a thing, it's an app, you have, it lives on your phone, it has buttons, you send, receive, whatever, but it's also a movement, right? All of us in this room are here because we're members of the Bitcoin movement that motivates us to go and travel to Riga. Uh, we build a community, friendships, and sort of, uh, and all of these things because we want Bitcoin, the thing, to succeed, right? And in, in the beginning, um, these two circles were one and the same. There was a couple of nerds, uh, they were using this thing uh, called Bitcoin, and they met up and talked about it, and there weren't so many other people, and that was that. But over time, as all of this has grown, very naturally, these things become a little bit disjointed, right? Uh, we end up in a world where you can be a, a part of the Bitcoin movement and not necessarily have much of a personal need uh, for, for using the tool. You know, you can be at a conference and like, not have a wallet installed. Um, and 
you know, someone will say, uh, Stefan will go say, but hodling is using. Yeah, well, you know, you can be part of the movement even without hodling very many bitcoins, right? Um, so no matter how you, how you see the tool and the movement, they are, they overlap, of course, but they are a little bit disjointed, right? There's a lot of people that use Bitcoin as a tool. Think about other things that you use as a tool. Like if you have a VPN, uh, um, okay, do you go to conferences about VPN? Do you argue with people on the internet over VPN? Uh, do you, right? Uh, it's just a thing. And then we have many things. Uh, and it's just a thing. And there's a lot of people who see Bitcoin like that. It's just a thing. Yeah, right? I'm just trying to uh, do whatever it is that I wanted to do. I want to make some transaction. I want to buy something. I want to uh, become rich. I want to, w whatever it is. There is passionate users. And like, the reason why I'm talking about this stuff is that I, I keep seeing uh, sort of uh, uh, a lot of projects marketing a lot to the red circle. Because we're all here, right? And none of the, the people that are in the green circle are not in the red circle. They're not here, <laughs> right? So everyone we see when we go to conferences are always in the red circle. We don't see the people who, don't, who aren't passionate about Bitcoin and just use it every once in a while. And, and so a lot of projects are mar marketing to the movement. And within the movement, some of the people want to use the tool. Some of them won't. But you, no matter what, you do, don't reach the, the, the big group uh, of people. And the question is sort of, is our vision uh, that eventually we're going to have 8 billion people going to Bitcoin conferences? Or is it eventually just going to become part of society and most people are just not going to think about it? So um, some data to kind of the, from, from our metrics. Uh, to kind of illustrate some of these points. I guess uh, people seem to be interested in this. So this is, these are some updated versions. Uh, this is tr transaction volume on Bitrefill in the last month. Uh, we can see that stable coins, uh, uh, combined stable coins, I have to be very clear, but combined stable coins are now the same size as combined uh, Bitcoin and Lightning uh, at around 31%. And then we have Ethereum at 25, and you have Binance Pay, and then the legacy coins uh, which is mostly Litecoin. Um, but it, it wasn't always like that, right? So if you look at a five-year chart of this, five years ago when, when I was speaking at this conference, we were firmly on the left side here, uh, and Bitcoin was stably 8 to 85% always, right? And the, I was making uh, the maximalist argument that, yeah, well, you know, uh, at 85%, like, uh, you know, uh, um, why even bother working on any other, other things? Uh, just reaching 85% with one thing is enough. Um, and then something happened. This was in uh, um, December 2020 to like May uh, of 2021. This is um, five months. Uh, and uh, uh, suddenly there, there was a lot of stuff. I think there was like a little bull, uh, bull spike. Uh, but after that, it kind of landed in a new normal. Right, so in, in terms of Lightning, uh, Lightning is 4% of the total volume uh, in, in euros on Bitrefill. Uh, it's been kind of stable at that level. If you count it as a percentage of BTC volume, it's, it's growing steadily, uh, and it's at 13% of Bitcoin volume. And, you know, uh, we at Bitrefill, those who don't know us, sort of, um, we've bet big on Lightning since always. Like, we were the first real money Lightning purchases. We, uh, built the first lightning service provider. Uh, we, for, in order to do that, we had to invent a protocol that was called LNURL, which then took off and became this massive thing with a community of its own. Um, uh, turbo channels, which are now called zero conf channels, and so on. Uh, but for the past years, like the most valuable thing that we can do and that we do do is, is marketing this thing and making sure that we reach uh, more people so there's not so many uh, exciting uh, new technical widgets from us. Uh, but there might be. So, uh, people, uh, uh, last time I did this presentation, people were like, what, Light, uh, uh, Litecoin is bigger than Lightning? Well, uh, okay, let's look at the chart again. Uh, a year and a half later, uh, yes, uh, Litecoin is still bigger than Lightning, but Lightning is catching up and growing rapidly. Uh, and I think that this is a, a very important point, especially these days when people are kind of uh, like being a little bit niggy uh, about, uh, uh, about Lightning. Look, Lightning is growing, and the fact that people are complaining about it 
is a good thing because it means that they are trying to use it. They want it to work. In the past, uh, no, when uh, there was no complaining because lightning was perfect because people weren't trying to use it. <laughs> um, now they're trying to use it and find, hey, you know, there's some things, imperfections, flaws, trade-offs, whatever, like, but this is good. Now we know where the holes on the road are and we can, we and the, uh, the builders in the space uh, can uh, use that feedback as actionable real-world feedback in terms of what, what to fix. Uh, and it's going to continue uh, growing, is, is what I think. But all of this brings the, the interesting question. Like, who the hell uses Litecoin? Um, who here uses Litecoin? Raise your hands. Oh, wow. <laughs> Two. Uh, awesome. And then I guess, who here uses on-chain when Lightning is also available? Uh, a few. All right, all right, all right. So there we go. But the, the big dilemma, like, given that... Who here uses Lightning? Okay, <laughs> a lot more, right? So we have discrepancy here between the, the data that we're observing and the data in this audience. Um, and, and how can we uh, sort of learn about that? Well, one example is to look at wallet data. Um, and uh, the, the wallet data that we have, we have like when in the payment flow on Bitrefill, there is a wallet selector. So you can optionally, you can click make it go away, but you can also click which wallet that you have, and then we adapt the user interface. If your wallet is old and crappy, we make sure that it still works somewhat. If it's new and fancy, we, we, we give you the cool new stuff. Uh, and so on, and then like we can use that data to, to also improve the user interface and, and, and draw learnings. So, um, and around 40% of our users uh, uh, select a wallet, so not everyone. But still, we can kind of get a directional idea of which, uh, which wallets uh, people are use, using. And this is, uh, this is not crypto, this is Bitcoin payments. On-chain Bitcoin or, or Lightning uh, Bitcoin payments. The crypto payments are all filtered out. And we see that, like, Time and time again, it's like, yeah, blockchain.com, Trust Wallet, Exodus are, uh, uh, are the big ones. Bitcoin Core is a bit of a special case. It's like a prominently featured button that is a good way to get a, like, a good standard uh, Bitcoin experience. And there's a couple of uh, wallets uh, for technical reasons um, uh, disappear. They probably end up in here, uh, including the privacy ones. And then we see uh, the wallet of Satoshi, Moon Wallet, Electrum, Chivo. Um, Phoenix, and so on. So there's quite a bit of presence of, uh, of, of uh, Lightning wallets. Uh, we have Electrum, which has always been a top 10 wallet uh, in, in, in our data. But we also sort of, the half <laughs> of the selectors picked like a multi-coin uh, wallet, right? And so before I, I, I get people like, oh, I never heard of those, and uh, oh, I know a lot of people, I never met anyone that uses those wallets, oh, the data uh, must be wrong. Well, okay, simple exercise, if you haven't done it before, uh, you can all do it toge together uh, with me here. Um, don't trust me, open your phone, open the App Store, <laughs> or Google Play Store if you're a pleb, uh, and search for Bitcoin Wallet. And then ignore the ads and look at what the, the, the algorithms uh, say. This is based on the things that people are installing in the last month or so. You will get, an, uh, get a feeling of what the experience of Bitcoin is for someone who isn't part of the community, for someone who isn't passionate about it, for someone who is, I just need a fucking Bitcoin wallet. Just like you and I would be, I just need a VPN, I just need a BitTorrent client or whatever. So, what we're seeing is that like, the circular economy is growing, but it is growing also like, faster than just BTC. And suddenly we have stable coins now at a third of, uh, uh, of the volume. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, that's beyond the scope of, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, of this talk. But it's interesting to observe that like, stable coins, well, it's a unit of account, <laughs> obviously, the dollar. Uh, and that makes it good store of value in a lot of cases because many people believe in, in, in the dollar. And 
it makes it a good medium of exchange because other people don't need to be convinced in, in keeping uh, their payment in, in something volatile. And so we're seeing like the crypto casinos like used to be, they used Bitcoin uh, to, to buy shit coins and they would cash out back to Bitcoin. Now that happens with stable coins. Peer-to-peer -peer markets uh, is uh, a lot, uh, stable connectivity. Even B2B, like here's an interesting metric for us. Um, in, uh, in the past year, when the Americans made life harder uh, for, for our industry, uh, we went out to all of our suppliers and said, hey, can we pay you uh, in, in crypto? And lo and behold, we convinced some of them, and now like 25% of the gift cards that we sell, we actually bought them with, uh, with stable coins, which is great for a bunch of reasons, but most importantly, like, we don't need to touch uh, the banking system. 25% like, of our volume does not at least at our station, uh, touch the banking system, which is very useful. But this leads us to, to having some very interesting conversations and very important conversations that we need to be having about the phrase network effects. Now, uh, in the olden days, and I keep saying, by the way, who here was at uh, this conference in uh, like the first one in 2017, 18? Quick raise of hands. All right. Who, who here, okay, another question. Who here was at any Bitcoin conference before 2020? All right, all right. Cool. So, in the olden days, I don't know exactly when, uh, the main argument for maximalism, for Bitcoin maximalism was that, uh, again, uh, network effects means that uh, since Bitcoin is the biggest one, then eventually everyone looking at doing something with cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is going to be the biggest one and the overwhelmingly dominant one. And so they're going to choose that and maybe something else, but that's going to have diminishing returns. And eventually Bitcoin emerges as a lingua franca, like a common standard for money. Um, we don't hear that argument so much anymore. Uh, I wonder why. But it is something that now we also have to think about network effects in the other direction. Like, okay, now the, that... You know, if you choose to be Bitcoin only, you're like targeting 30% of the market. Is that good? And then are we building a network of our own that then is not interacting with the other networks? And are, are we strong enough to build network effect uh, within our thing to sort of eventually somehow uh, overtake the other networks? It's, it's, it's a lot of stuff to, uh, to think about, I think. Um, See, I'm running out of time, but uh, I want to sort of bring up, I think, a good inspirational example from the other world, uh, from another industry, uh, and that's VPN, uh, which is one of these things. It's like, it's not very exciting. Uh, nobody is excited about VPN, but you know what? Like, over a billion people use VPN each month, uh, a third of the internet population. It's a $40 billion industry. It is a privacy freedom tech but that's not the reason why most people use it like the billion people they use it to watch American Netflix or to shop at a store that they otherwise can't shop in or something like that right and it's just been growing you know no hype cycles uh, again no excitement uh, just steady growth uh, every year uh, for 25 years which, which is a long time um, just works, just steady growth, and then occasional external factors like one country or another turning dystopian and then the VPN usage spikes uh, in, in that part of the world. Um, and I think that, uh, that there's a lot, a lot for us uh, in the Bitcoin space to learn uh, from, uh, from how VPN grew. So, I guess a couple of conclusions. I think like, a big and important point uh, to say is that, that like, if we want to grow the circular economy, we, the feedback here is that like, community alone does not scale enough. Right? The fact that uh, many people use wallets that we don't like here in the community is indicative that uh, you know, we need to be doing something that we haven't been doing, let's say. And I think that some of these things are you know, like, focusing on, on uh, real jobs to be done for real people that don't necessarily care or dream about Bitcoin. Um, and a little bit less on, like, it, it is cool that you can feed a chicken uh, with lightning over space. Um, 
it is cool, but you know, <laughs> yeah, we also need to get the real flows of money uh, in and out of, uh, of the system. And for that, uh, we need to build tech that is boring, right? Exciting tech uh, is exciting because it doesn't work really well yet. <laughs> yeah, boring tech just works. The iPhone uh, in, in my pocket, it's not very exciting anymore because it's re reliable as hell. And a big takeaway, uh, again, is that if you're building something for, for users uh, of a certain tool, there very well may be a lot of users uh, of yours that aren't going to conferences. And it's very important to find them and to talk to them and to find out uh, what you can do better. I think I'll, I'll leave at that. Yeah, thank you. Can we have another round of applause, please, for Sergey? That was fantastic. And uh, has anyone, did anyone watch Sergey's um, talk in Honey Badger last year? Raise your hands, yeah. Oh, it was it Pizza Day, actually? It was the Pizza Day talk. Um, Sergey, has lightning advanced a little bit more than being teenage sex? Please say yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. Great. I mean, they're complaining about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So oh, we've advanced from the stage of people are talking about it but not doing it, the way that teenagers talk about sex, to now they're just, you know, complaining about it. College sex. College sex. Yeah. We're going somewhere. Fantastic. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Joe. I'm going to look after you for the next few hours. But before I do, please give a warm round of applause and a thank you to Stefan for being so fantastic this morning. He's been great. Um, if I look underprepared, it's because I am. I was upstairs at the cypherpunk stage. My phone went off. I almost got banned from Honey Badger forever for answering the call in there. But um, yeah, Peter McCormack is not able to make it because of passport issues. And I'm, yeah, very grateful and really happy to do this this afternoon. Um, now, I've got a list of numbers here that I'm going to read out. So, 3, 19, 29, 37. Do you know what these numbers are yet? Just shout out, 59, 73, 5, 7, what was that, sorry? Prime, correct, they are prime numbers, which is how I'm gonna segue, can you tell by the way that I'm not prepared? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna segue into Max Imolovsky's talk, which is called Prime, <clears throat> and it's all about, there he is, hello Maxim, um, it's all about how we're going to scale up Layer one, solutions on blockchain. I think it's gonna appear on the screen now. So without further ado, please welcome Maxim to the stage and best of luck with your talk. Do you have a microphone there or do you want this one? I will use this one. Fantastic. Please welcome to the stage. Thank you. I'm waiting for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, today I would like to present a new concept, quite a novel one which is not related to blockchain. Most of times we are talking about blockchains and that is the first attempt to shift attention out of blockchain, still keeping the Bitcoin in focus. But first, uh, who I am and who does this development? Uh, this is LNP PBP Standards Association, a Swiss non-profit. And LNPBP is the meme which was invented by Giacomo Zucco, who is actually a co-founder with me of this association. And it stands for something like TCP IP, but in Bitcoin world. Lightning Network Protocol, Bitcoin Protocol. And the idea that we are building layers on top of Bitcoin, and now layers for Bitcoin itself. And these layers are things which keep the core Bitcoin values in, shifting the technology to a more advanced new technologies. Like today, I will be talking about the Prime. And my, our main product so far was an RGB. It is a smart contract system for Bitcoin and Lightning Network, the first full smart contract system that works on top of the Lightning. And it is based on zero knowledge, and it strongly emphasizes privacy values. We launched it last year. Those who are interested uh, to study more, uh, you, can, you are welcome to check the website called rgb.tech and uh, dive in into what it does. In a very few words, 
it uses a concept of client-side validation. The idea originating from early 2014 from Peter Todd Works that actually you don't need to keep the data on blockchain. And if you're doing something, just don't put the data into the blockchain. It's just a commitment layer. Instead, uh, keep the data on the client side. That's where the name is coming from. And only the owner, beneficiary, and parties related to the smart contract in RGB have access to those data, validate those data, and know about existence of those data. That actually unlocks scalability, that unlocks ability to work on top of Lightning Network, and that brings a huge privacy gain, obviously. And we spent about four years uh, building this smart contracting layer, and we learned a lot of lessons. And by the time, the more and more we worked on that client-side validation, we had one question appearing. There is something fundamentally wrong with blockchain. And what is it? Well, we all know that first it doesn't scale, neither in transaction through output or in data size. It is not private as well. And why these problems are there? because blockchain is information centralization. Even though, as a computing layer, blockchain runs in a decentralized environment, well, some at least. Let's say Bitcoin blockchain is the most decentralized blockchain in terms of mining and computing. But yet still, as a source of information, it is a ledger. It is a register that can, registry that contains all the global transactions. And that's why it lacks both scalability and privacy. There is an attempt, ongoing attempt for many years of fixing these problems of blockchain, introducing a layers on top. So the idea is that we try to fix what is wrong and not working with the blockchain by building on top of blockchain. And the concepts like sidechains, state channels, rollups has appeared with all of them having certain drawbacks. For instance, all forms of blockchains, of sidechains, including drive chains, are just blockchains. They're same way centralized informationally. They're same way non-scaling. They're same way is not well privacy preserving. Even if you employ zero knowledge, you still have the transaction graph, and so on. The state channels, unlike that, are much more scalable and they introduce more privacy, but the problem with them is that you instantly get into the liquidity scalability issues because you have to over collateralize the channels. So you need unbound liquidity, and that prevents the uh, payment channels like Lightning Network to scale in terms of economics. And finally, the roll ups, these weird technologies coming from uh, zero, zero knowledge world and from Ethereum, they are not applicable to Bitcoin at all so far because they basically require a soft fork of other different forms, which will take probably many years if it will ever happen. And on the other side, what do we want? Well, we want from Bitcoin, of course. Do, what do we want? We want scalability. We want privacy. We want censorship resistance, which can't be possible without scalability and without privacy. We want more programmability. That's why all these fights are happening in Bitcoin world about adding new opcodes, unlocking new use cases for Bitcoin. And at the same time, we would like to have all of that without introducing any new coins and just reusing the existing Bitcoin security model. So why we just don't keep Bitcoin and not simply get rid of blockchain, which prevents us from acquiring all these properties. That's where the idea of Prime has came in. Uh, and I will try briefly explain uh, technical details of how it's going to work. Here, of course, I understand that we don't have a lot of time to explain every aspect of it because the technology is quite different from blockchain. And it's explaining it is like explaining blockchain to somebody in 2020, uh, 2010, when it was nobody knows what blocks are. So I, I, I beg your pardon that probably it wouldn't be completely understood, but there is a write-up sent to Bitcoin mail list, you can find it, and it contains all the details. Also, the Prime uses a lot of things we invented in RGB, and reading more about RGB may also help understanding it better. So how does the blockchain work? Well, blockchain is a chain of blocks. You have block headers, and 
these block headers reference to previous block header, so that's how you build the chain. And inside you have a different transactions of different size. And basically, the block header commits to these transactions via Merkle tree. The Merkle tree is not present in the block itself. It's dynamically computed each time you download the block. And it is the way how you check the consistency and the integrity of the block. So basically, you download two main parts of the data, the transactions and the header. And the very important part is that in blockchain, everybody validates every transaction for everyone. And that is the reason why this thing is not private. And this is the reason why this thing is not scaling, because you can't scale something where everybody validates everything for everybody. It just doesn't work this way. The prime works differently. It keeps the chain of headers. I prefer not to use a chain because it will be a little bit uh, confusing with the blockchains, which, and this is not blockchain. You just have a chain of headers referencing each other the same way. And this chain of headers is the only information which are kept by the participants of this prime network. And the size of these headers is about 20 uh, to 200 bytes. So they are very light and small, and they are fixed in size. They are not increasing their size with the growth of the number of transactions. Next, there is the same, pretty much the same Merkle tree, constructed by different means, though like in blockchain, which also commits to a different transactions. But unlike blockchain, nobody keeps those data. Only the owner of certain UTXO downloads, well, it doesn't download actually, it creates the transaction, so it has its originally, and it downloads the proof of the inclusion of the transaction as a Merkle path of the tree from the header. And all these data are kept by the client, not the other world around. So by doing that, we have privacy because nobody else even sees the transaction anywhere in network. And we have a scalability because nobody validates nothing that comes not from himself and which is not related to the contracts, the state or coins he is owning. So how we still prevent double spend? Because you see here that people are just keeping the data for themselves and validate the data for themselves. Well, the idea is that, first, uh, UTXO concept is a bit changed, and a user basically has to create a secret, 256-bit secret, which he has to keep on his own site. You can think about this as a private key, but it is not private key because no elliptic curve cryptography involved and no public key is ever created. It's just a random 256 private number. And when the client wants to spend his UTXO to use some state or coins he attached to that number, this number is called seal now, he creates a transaction which actually spends that number and he sends that transaction to the miner network. And this transaction uh, gets into a very specific position in this Merkle tree. There is only one place, deterministic place, where a transaction can end up in. And this place is defined by this number. So basically, uh, you divide the number, the seal number, on the number of leaves in the tree. And if you get two transactions into the same position, you increase the size of the tree. So that's basically how the miners do the mining. So they find, they solve the task of finding a size of the tree that will fit all the transactions they would like to include into unique places. And thus, only one thing that you need to prove the inclusion of your transaction and spend of your TXO is the Merkle path from your seal top to the header of this block. And uh, that's how it happens. So the user sends the transaction to miner. The miner publish, uh, he constructs this large Merkle tree which can take a ma multiple gigabytes of size. There is no size limit because nobody downloads it ever. It is only constructed by the miner who gets a fees for that and he can run a huge uh, resource load if needed. Uh, and it's also a part of the mining actual algorithm. And he published this header to the network. 
And then user who sent the transaction to miner, he takes the information about the Merkle path, proving the inclusion of the transaction. And then he keeps this data on his site forever. Additionally to that, there is one important thing that the user has also to include the proofs of non-inclusion of the transaction, of the seal, in other headers. So once you have some, some seal defined, you start tracking all the new headers and include proofs for specific Merkle path where your seal may appear. And if your seal wasn't appearing, it basically proves that at that path, the only place where it may happen, there is nothing, so you haven't spent your UTXO. So that's another important difference. And it actually requires users to be online on the first hand. However, uh, you may see that uh, quite soon there will be storage providers appearing. Probably it would be miners themselves who will be paid by the users and who will download and keep this data for the users while they are offline. So this problem of interactivity is not hard requirement unlike in Lightning Network where you can't route payments while you're offline. Here other third parties paid by you can be incentivized to keep this data for you. And when you would like to transact with a different beneficiary, you collect all this data that you keep locally and you put them into a thing called consignment. It is pretty much the same consignment you have with RGB today, which you also send to the other counterparty when you do the RGB transaction. So basically this is the RGB transaction which is extended with this prime data. And the very important thing that we are getting out of there is the scalability benefit. If we are talking about blockchain, uh, it scales linearly, while the prime, because you store only the Merkle path, uh, scales as a logarithm of the number of transactions. In practice, it means that Bitcoin blockchain can have about eight transactions per second only, while with the prime, you can increase this number up to 20 million transactions per second. That is many hundreds order, many hundreds many thousand times more than the current card processing industry generates. Like Visa and MasterCard, they generate together, like 20, top 20 world card providers jointly generate about 5,000 transactions per second. So this 20 million is something that is possible to scale up to Kardashev level one type civilization in terms of the transaction through output. And uh, while there are some claims that, like with the Lightning Network, you can also get something close to the scale, that is true in terms of the networking capacity, but it is not true in terms of the liquidity uh, constraints, because you need an unbound liquidity, and many of the paths of the possible payments wouldn't be happening or wouldn't be possible. And finally, in terms of the data size, with the Bitcoin, you accumulate 200 gigabytes of data by keeping the block information uh, on your machine. With a prime, you will accumulate only si about six gigabytes of data per year, which will come from these proofs of non-inclusions, which you need to keep even if you are not transacting. And uh, this six gigabytes per seal, and the user may define several seals, but in the most cases you can keep all your data even under different smart contracts on the same seal. So basically, most of the users will have just one seal to operate with. Uh, also, you get, you get a lot of privacy benefits because with the blockchain you have a public transaction graph, you have reuse of the addresses. Well, you, you can manage that. People may not reuse the addresses, but many people still do that and it's really hard to fight that. And finally, because of these two factors, you have a chain analysis appearing and doing all the work that they are doing. Like that in Prime, there is no transaction graph, there is no addresses, there is no chain analysis possible. And the only point where you have some leak of the privacy is that you need certain interactive protocol with the miners, with a mining network. Miners are still anonymous. And that's where you may leak the IP address information. However, these things can be presented by using mixed networks. There is other advantages to this technology. First of all, it was not designed as a post-quantum, but as a side effect that it doesn't use elliptic curves at the level of the, of the layer one. It is basically a post-quantum, it is quantum resistant. And the only place where you use uh, the elliptic curves is the layer two, 
which is in RGB. However, if you'd like to move from that, you don't need a soft fork because the layer one is not affected. You just create a new smart contract which uses a new form of elliptic curve. So you can switch elliptic curves as you need without a soft fork. Uh, there is no scripting at layer one, you see, like there is nothing to validate, there is nothing to prove in terms of, uh, there is nothing to program, so no script is needed. And this together is what I said, you don't need to, a soft fork. This protocol is basically ossified from the level one because it is very strict, primitive, and it has no, no business logic inside. There is nothing to validate. So no more soft fork or hard fork debates would be required. And again, there is no coin. There is no place to store the coin information. So you can't fork it and do some fork coin of Bitcoin because there is no place to put that coin into. And where Bitcoin will exist, well, it, uh, I will get to that question in a few slides. There are certain attacks possible which have their own mitigations. I wouldn't go into details on that. You may check the mail list where these discussions, had, discussions has happened. So basically, uh, you can contract the attack vectors which were found so far for the protocol. And Regarding the mining itself, again, one of the problems of bootstrapping a new protocol, how you get a security and hash power, the idea is that it piggybacks to Bitcoin mining. So it inherits the security of Bitcoin mining as long as its own hash power do not exceed the hash power of Bitcoin network. So the mining algorithm, as I described, is basically a construction and, find, uh, and search for the size of the Merkle tree which can fit all the transactions the miner can include, want to include. However, additionally to that, there is a single use seal based uh, mechanism which attach that headers of the prime into Bitcoin blockchain, into the transactions, not the headers. And th thus, this mechanism doesn't require merge mining or any soft fork or any adoption from Bitcoin miners. It just works out of the box. And the funny part that this works not just with a prime. You can do that with anything. So if somebody wants to build a the chain outside of Bitcoin, they don't need a soft fork for the merge mining to be accepted. They can use the mechanism of single-use seals. I have no time to describe how it specifically works, but you will find the description in the paper which was sent to Bitcoin mail list. There are several very, very popular questions, and one of them, uh, why there is no coin? Well, there is no coin at the layer one. At the layer two, it runs the RGB. So basically, you can put different assets into it, including primarily the Bitcoin itself. And I will show on the next slide how this Bitcoin can move into the system. It is not an alternative to Bitcoin as a money. It is an alternative to Bitcoin blockchain layer one, which can keep the Bitcoin itself and present a more robust, private, and scalable layer for running Bitcoin transactions. Uh, so this our idea of transplantation of Bitcoin as money from blockchain into Prime looks the same the following way. First, you move Bitcoin into the RGB layer, which exists and operates on top of both Bitcoin blockchain and Bitcoin Prime. And then, eventually, you wouldn't need a Bitcoin blockchain when everything operates on top of Prime and you have Bitcoin on layer two. Uh, as an intermediate step, yes, you need to move Bitcoin to RGB, and this can be done trustlessly one way, so you move Bitcoin into the RGB without any additional trust in fully decentralized and anonymous way. But if you would like to get from RGB back to Bitcoin blockchain, that would require a two of two multisig between you and the Federation. However, eventually, with the decline of use of Bitcoin blockchain, less and less Bitcoins will be moving the other way around. And at the end of the day, no pack will be needed anymore. And everything may work on top of the prime. So the idea of the prime is the fulfillment of the cypherpunk dream. Bitcoin UTXO must go beyond the event horizon and acquire the ultimate privacy. And that is why and how prime is designed. Uh, the road to prime is that we can actually build and launch it permissionlessly. 
No soft fork is required. No Bitcoin mail list debates are required. No merge mining is required. No minor agreement is required. No regulational compliance, even if though it's not required, but we don't need even to seek for that because we are not touching any financial technologies here. And no ACO on Ucoin is possible. And we plan to develop and build it at the same LNP BP standards association where we built the RGB protocol. And today probably it's already the largest technical developer non-profit in the world which builds the layers on top of Bitcoin. And without your participation, that wouldn't be possible. And you can track and get more information about that from these sources. Thank you very much. Well done, Maxim. Fantastic talk. Um, do we have time for questions, or is that not a thing? No, no, I'm getting, getting shakes of heads. Okay. Really well done, Maxim. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, on to the next talk of the afternoon, but before we get there, um, have you all checked out the Cypherpunk stage upstairs? Have you all checked it out yet? You have. Good. Okay. Have you checked out the food stalls where you can pay in lightning? Yeah. Yeah, we're using Bitcoin. It is actually payments technology as well, but it's also a technology for human rights. Now, fun fact, I'm not allowed back into Cuba uh, because I practice my freedom of speech there. Um, yeah, it turns out in Cuba, you're not really allowed to do independent journalism or media, so I've lost that right. So unfortunately, Bitcoin doesn't fix that. However, the next panel is going to touch upon Bitcoin and human rights. I'm going to talk about, hopefully, the things that Bitcoin does fix. Anita's shaking her head. They're not going to talk about that. They're going to talk about some other fantastic stuff. <laughs> but with my little segue out of the way, which I prepared for um, for a long time, can I welcome the next panel onto the stage, please? Is, who's the moderator? Is it Ricky? No? Ah, Ash. Ash from the Human Rights Foundation. Who better to moderate a panel about human rights than Ash? Please come to the stage and welcome on. So we've got Ash from the Human Rights Foundation. We have Anita from Crack the Orange, the new educational initiative. We have Ricky, one half of Bitcoin Explorers. And we have Abubakar from Recursive Capital. And to cap it all off, we have Mr. Venezuela himself. Oh, sorry, no, it's Mr. Bitfinex now, isn't it? I just saw your tweet. Please welcome to the stage. Have a fantastic panel, guys. I'm really looking forward to this one. Clap, 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 clap. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Arsh. I'm from the Human Rights Foundation. Um, I work on our financial freedom program. And as you can see, we have a pretty stacked panel here. So uh, let's jump right into it. Let's start with the introductions. Sure. I'm Abubakar Nur Khalil, CEO of Recursive Capital, which is a Bitcoin VC focused in Africa and do a bunch of other stuff in the Bitcoin space. Abubakar speaks very fast. I'm a little bit slower. <laughs> My name is Anita. I'm a Bitcoin educator and the founder of Bitcoin for Fairness. And uh, one of my main topics in my work all the time is um, the fact how Bitcoin enforces human rights. And as such, I'm working a lot in the global south uh, to um, educate people or share my knowledge about Bitcoin with those where I think who need it the most. Um, my name is Javier Bastardo. I'm from Venezuela. I'm a journalist, a Bitcoiner, and I've been covering Bitcoin and crypto industry since 2017, and I have a community there in Venezuela that is Satoshi in Venezuela, and mainly trying to show the people of my country how they can take advantage of this technology. Hi everyone, my name is Ricky. I'm an Italian activist and educator. I have a project called Bitcoin Explorers. We travel the world chronicling Bitcoin adoption in emerging market and how Bitcoin is empowering people all over the world. So the main objective here is kind of understanding how financial rights are a necessity to achieving human rights. Um, through a more personalized or generalized view, um, how does Bitcoin enforce human rights? It does so by providing a fundamental safeguard that I think is necessary for any individual, regardless of the jurisdiction. So I'll give a, a personal story. On my end, it's kind of funny and ironic, but I actually never had a bank account before I got into Bitcoin. So my first experience of quote-unquote banking was through Bitcoin. And I think that really helped reshape exactly what I thought money was, one, and two, how that kind of interplays with rights in general. 
think the immediate thing I realized after getting a bank account, after using Bitcoin for a while, was that I don't have a ton of rights. I don't have actually any sort of ownership to my money. It's more of a claim the government has to fulfill, I guess, the obligation they have in terms of the money I have in bank account. So for me, it was an immediate realization that for a lot of people in the world, like the fiat system is just a system of credit at the end of the day. You really, truly don't own your money, which means at the end of the day, you're borrowing time when it comes to the actual access you have to money globally or how you tend to use it. So I, I, I guess in general, it'd be a case where Bitcoin just fits in perfectly by being agnostic. It has no sort of internal censorship mechanism. In fact, it can't have any because there's no direction from that fundamental layer of who's building specifically or any sort of rails at the top that stop people from accessing it. So I think it's one of those things where because of the agnostic nature, there's really no potential of having son any sort of censorship or any sort of, I guess, way to clamp down on any sort of fundamental rights. So I think that's kind of where it plugs in from that point of view. Yeah, there are several um, rights that are listed in the United Nations uh, Human Rights Convention, actually. And um, just as an example, I mean, um, Bitcoin enforces freedom of speech, freedom of association, which comes with demonstrations, movements uh, from the people against the police brutality. You can speak more about that afterwards. And also, like, for instance, freedom from discrimination. Like, I mean, it's discriminating that northern or western countries have all these KYC regulations that trickle down to African countries and exclude in globally 1.7 billion people from uh, banking or from financial systems. And Bitcoin, as it is permissionless, um, can enable everyone uh, this right and basically to not be discriminated against. And to bring a personal example from what I really, I mean, since 2017, I'm in Bitcoin. And I always, I came to Bitcoin because I understood its potential uh, for social impact and to secure human rights or give human rights to people in a way, enforce it. And um, I did a human rights workshop in April in Lusaka in Zambia and there were 50 human rights activists from all over Africa and we showed them how Bitcoin is basically a freedom money, a tool that gives them the possibility to receive funds from abroad that are not then being stolen by the central bank and the government because they told me the thing is always that way. As soon as we get funds into a bank account, the government, government says we're a terrorist organization and then they shut down our account and take our money. And then in that workshop, people realized, oh wow, so with Bitcoin, no one can take away my funds anymore and the government doesn't even know about it. Because um, that's also a thing I uh, experienced. One of my friends in Zimbabwe, we were uh, doing donations for her in Bitcoin for the school, not for her personally. And uh, soon after that, she was arrested and questioned where that money is coming from. So um, <laughs> it goes to show on the one hand, she can receive the money without being interfered, but on the other hand, that people, that it's really dangerous and that activists need to stay anonymous and private. And, but it, goes, it shows you the potential of Bitcoin here, how it can enforce human rights. I think that we are in a Bitcoin conference and obviously we do understand how important is uh, financial freedom and how important are the financial rights and all the stuff, but I'm coming from a country that in which the government, as in every other place, they are weaponizing the currency. So we have, we have been through hyperinflation and now we've been like dollarizing our economy by ourselves. But uh, the reality is that they, the government, the Venezuelan regime, have the full control of what you can do with your money and they can control how you can like save or whatever what you want to do with your money. And we know it because we are Bitcoiners, but it is not that known for normal people, for the average people. So for for my since my my perspective is like we are trying to push this message uh, of Bitcoin being a freedom money and a way to gain or, or regain the control over your money and the time you spend to earn that money. 
and it is not about Bitcoin itself, because at the end of the day, if you receive the Bitcoin and you try to spend it in the country that is against you to spend that in the whatever cause that you are trying to support, it's like about the freedom that it allows, the freedom that you can get, and it's, it's not only like um, to learn that there are 21 million of Bitcoin or whatever, it's like to open your eyes to another reality where the government that keeps robbing you, the government that is supposed to be, I don't know, like at your side or trying to help you is really robbing you daily. And to understand that is way more important to me and to our community than Bitcoin itself. And obviously Bitcoin is a great tool and it is open to everybody, but to understand that there is another system, another reality where no government can control that is the most important thing to me. And if you ask for a personal thing, like I have my only bank account since I'm 17 and I'm really not using that since I discovered Bitcoin because it's like you don't want to hold bolivars, of course, because they are worse than any other currency in the world, but you can like take controls of over the time you spend to earn that money and you can take control over the way that you want to whatever do with your money. So it's like Bitcoin opens a different world, a different way to see how things could be done. So that's that's it. Oh, um, I collected uh, so many stories d uh, during my travels. Uh, probably uh, one that I really liked and that kind of differs for what you guys just said. I will always remember this woman in Guatemala selling vegetable and fruits in a street market and she accepted Bitcoin on her own wallet and she was super happy to do it because she was doing it without her husband knowing about it. And because, you know, in those countries, in emerging markets especially, uh, usually is the male that handles the bank account for the family. So Bitcoin is, Bitcoin means also uh, women empowerment. The, the vast majority of unbanked all over the world are women. So this is also very important. And... Uh, uh, there's one thing I would love to add. We all more or less work in emerging markets, but my audience, my, personally my audience, it's here in the Western part of the world. And, wh and when I usually speak, I have the sense that uh, a big chunk of the audience doesn't really care because, you know, these things that happen so far away and we live in the civilized, civilized free world. But this is not true. Um, a couple of years ago, the, the dissident Chinese artist Ai Weiwei saw his bank account frozen, Swiss, a Swiss bank account uh, 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 frozen, and it wasn't his bank account at all, actually. It was his organization, a non profit organization uh, gathering money to support uh, dissident artists all over the world and uh, the uh, uh, Credit Suisse decided to froze it under pressure from the Chinese government and Ai Weiwei was never trialed, neither find guilty. So there was no charge on his head, but still the legacy financial system is the trigger of autocracies, that's why we need Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, I want to add that even happens in Austria. I heard from a comedian recently whose bank account was frozen, uh, or they just shut it down, uh, and now he's using Bitcoin to receive donations. Yeah, So it's also in Europe. I mean, the use case is everywhere, maybe not. I mean, like the 55% of people who live under authoritarians are in big parts in the east to the south of the, con uh, the world. Um, but the use ca cases are also here. Yeah, true. And just to, I mean, there's a lot to say when it comes to the European perspective. We definitely do hear that narrative around there isn't exactly a huge care as there is in the global south. But I think it's, it's not necessarily the full picture because if you think about it, the majority of, 
I guess the CBDC crackdown is likely going to come down from Europe. So in terms of protecting your privacy and rights in general, I think you have a more pressing issue than, say, Nigeria, which, you know, with the ENERA, basically <laughs> no one using that. So for us, it's really a case where they're going to keep trying and it's not going to be as effective. But more generally, on the Bitcoin point, again, it's essentially fundamental empowerment. Back to the point on the female empowerment and just in general, at the end of the day, it's very easy to feel complacent and, like, really comfortable in monetary networks that allow for you to be able to use it freely. But in places like Nigeria or Africa in general, it's one of those things where the immediate thing regimes or governments take away is the economic freedom. Because at the end of the day, without that, it sits at like a very, very fundamental level of who a human being is, what they can do, how they can interact with society in general. So you tend to see a lot of that kind of withholding of rights start from money. So the moment you have a money that can protect that, ahead of time, which I think should be the most pressing concern for Europeans in general, the better. So I definitely say pick up Bitcoin before it becomes too late, because by that time, it's kind of pointless. You really have no option. Definitely, yeah. I mean, we we know that, we study these case studies, and you know, we, we see where, where Bitcoin works and, and the role that it plays. Um, Education is definitely key in, in, in these parts to get pe to get Bitcoin to people that need it the most. Um, and I know a lot of us on this panel have our own educational initiatives. Um, would you guys mind touching on what your initiatives are and what they, what they do and where the kind of focus is? Oh, for sure. Um, so I'm mostly involved in dev work. So I, I run a program alongside four other folks and then a bunch of Bitcoiners that help with... Um, the, I guess the material in general and teaching. So the main focus for us is to increase the number of Bitcoin enlightened de uh, developers in Africa. Now the main reason for that is again, you still need people actually building for Africa and having that sort of mindset where they feel the pain points so they understand exactly what the context is, kind of how to solve for that. So in terms of how it ties into human rights, it's a case of using their personal understanding, context, uh, knowledge, and then ensuring that they're building tools that really do cater to the immediate environment. So for us, it's really about, yes, you guys learn how to you know, code all these cool things, but at the same time, keep in mind that you're building for folks in a way where you want them to still have their rights moving forward. So we wanna make sure that each change they have, they have to consider that angle. Yeah, so um, exactly one year ago, uh, after the Baltic honey badger, I flew to Zimbabwe and I stayed in the Southern African region for about eight months to do work with Bitcoin for Fairness to uh, help communities on the ground uh, get together, build meetups, and uh, try to share education with the people. And what I've learned is that it's really important to, to be there to build trust because everyone asks you, is Bitcoin not a scam? And so um, with doing talks and workshops, you yes, you can reach people, you can onboard users, you can make people interested in the technology, but then it stops, you're not there anymore. And so I thought it's important to build a program that is basically accompanying and uh, getting together educators from the global south to share knowledge with them that they can share with their peers then um, and in a sustainable program. So it's a one-year program, it's called Crack the Orange, and these aspiring Bitcoin educators and community builders can apply online and we um, ask them which program do you want to do and all these kinds of things. And then they get a scholarship to um, do this program for free. And I think it's important to do this sort of train the trainers program because it's also like, a, I hope for a domino effect, you know, where you educate like, let's say a hundred of these educators and those will educate 10, 15 people, 20 people, whatever in their communities. And I think it's important that the, the knowledge is there because be, Bitcoin is such a dynamic technology. You need to, to basically always share the news about new wallets, new um, features. And one of the main focuses of uh, Crack the Orange is also self-custody and privacy. Because a lot of people are using Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer in these countries, which is great, but most of them, I think, have it on Binance, and they don't have any privacy. Also, like, they're all using Facebook, they, uh, and they don't know about privacy, and that's why I have a focus on that in that program. Well, in 2019, I started a project that is Satoshi in Venezuela. It, uh, it is 
the only Bitcoin only community in Venezuela. And back in the day before El Salvador, we were like the trendy country because hyperinflation and you have a regime, obviously Bitcoin will solve all, all your problems. So I started to travel around Venezuela to see if there were interests because we, as Chinalysis reported back in the day, we were one of the countries where crypto were most the use it and all the stuff. But when you go to the ground, you see that people is really not interested at all in freedom or privacy or whatever. They want money because the country is just fucked up. You, you, you can think in abstract concepts and philosophical movement and freedom and blah, blah. If you are hungry, if you have problems with your family, so whatever. And uh, after seeing that reality, we turned the project. Like, I won't be traveling to a place to explain a thing that nobody cares about. So we started to build this idea of a community, whatever, who wants to join. And as far as they understand that we are focusing on Bitcoin, they are welcome. And when the COVID thing started, I, th I thought that the project was tight because we are doing meetups and mainly in real life activities, but we become a more YouTube driven project. So I started to do tutorials about those things that you need to know to use Bitcoin in a good way. And then we also had a podcast that was mainly related to Bitcoin. But then we started to build a bridge with other people. And then it was when I started to talk with people that are into the human rights activism and trying to see how we can build those bridge with the people that is working in something that we understand that it's possible that Bitcoin is useful for their activities, but they don't really understand how, and they don't really know about Bitcoin. So it's like trying to share this that we already know because we are again in a Bitcoin conference and we are in a common ground, but it's not that normal, it's not that common for people that is in a context uh, where you can like be in jail just for a meme or for a tweet and then to connect that with Bitcoin that is a something crypto um, financial yada yada how do you connect that with what you are doing so we are trying to help them like with workshops and whatever that they feel that could uh, help with that and at the end of the day we are living in a regime, like Venezuela is a regime, there is no democracy. You, as I said, you can then jail just for a tweet. And it makes some sense for those activists that are already uh, doing this kind of activities on the internet and they kind of understand how it's linked, but we are still improving how to get that message out. Yeah, I don't have my own project like you guys, but I was fortunate enough to be among the teachers for a few dozen Salvadorian students in a project, in an educational project called Cubo Plus. And that was super, really cool. But why do we need, why do we need to teach Salvadorians if they already have Bitcoin? We need to teach them a lot because yes, they had Bitcoin as a legal tender in their country, but there is a big lack of, of education. Uh, the vast majority of the population is not tax savvy. And uh, unfortunately, Salvadorian people, they have this state owned wallet called Chivo that is not exactly what we like. It's uh, fully KYC, non, uh, fully custodial. It's, uh, uh, it's actually closed source, so nobody really knows uh, what it does. Uh, and uh, it's censoring non OFAC or uh, AML compliant transactions. And there is a misconception among Bitcoiners that Chivo Wallet in El Salvador is not that popular because there are other. Uh, the other open source uh, options, but that is not true. Is by far the most used 
uh, wallet in El Salvador, 85% of the people use that because the country is pushing hard promoting the wallet and they did a $30 airdrop. Everyone that downloads, every Salvadorian that downloads the app has $30 for free and they get $30, $300 per month. So for them it's good money and you get discounts and there is advertising all over the places. So the only way, the only counter argument we have is to teach all Salvadorians, each and every one, that there are other options, that Bitcoin should be non-custodial, that Bitcoin should be uncensorable, that Bitcoin is a better form of money free for all. So there is a lot of, a lot of work to do still in El Salvador as well, as you Javier know better than me. It's, it's funny because El Salvador is winning, it's a really great meme, but when you see the reality, it's like it's been a top to down adoption and it's like if the government is forcing it, it's, it's not like the best way of we can like have the Bitcoin adoption and the Salvadorian economy is already dollar rights. So it's not that easy for them to do the drop the dollars and then start to use Bitcoin. And also uh, as it is supported by, by the government, it's like it's a, like Bitcoin is a government thing. And it's like weird to have all these things happening and also to push like more out of custody and no KYC and all these messages. So I think that there are a lot of places or a lot of things that could be improved in El Salvador, but at least there, there is the Bitcoin law is legal tender and going there and moving to El Salvador. So going there, I think that we can have a better impact than only like sharing a tweet and retweeting the hashtag. So proof of work. I mean, yeah, these are these are definitely very important points. Um, you know, whether it's censorship, whether it's the lack of freedom of speech, financial rights, um, and, and we're seeing human rights being infringed upon more and more uh, every day. Why does why does Bitcoin fix this? Like, why why Bitcoin in, in particular? I mean, it's uniquely positioned. At the end of the day, there is obviously an. I guess a cliche now in the space of like the immaculate conception of Bitcoin, but it's it yields credence to a lot of the fundamental properties we have. Again, it goes back to the fact that there's no one at the end of the day controlling Bitcoin, both on the marketing side, which is kind of why we all have jobs, and both in terms of the education side or in general on the development. So from that point of view, there's no real direction and it's more led from bottom up, which is to your point again, at the end of the day, really, if you want that type of systemic social change, you need to have it start off from the bottom up because at the end of the day they are going to be the caretakers the stewards when it comes to ensuring that the very thing that they're building on or talking about still maintains the properties that they necessarily need like having open access to money remittances financial inclusion the easier it is for people to kind of get on the same bandwagon and the better it is longevity wise in terms of ensuring that no other thing kind of harms it so it's like building this innate hornet nest where we kind of have to protect it but more fundamentally i think at the end of the day the way to think about it is like a fundamental tool to have in your general toolkit about being a, a i guess a sovereign individual because at the end of the day without having free freedom money there's really no freedom at the end of the day i can build effectively especially as a person from you know the global south already we're cut off from the majority of any financial institution and or if we do have access it's kind of like you know, we're waiting for the timeout to get reached and then we basically have our accounts shut down. But whereas with Bitcoin, it's really a case where for the first time in history, we can transact with virtually anyone instantly, cheap. And it's, it's incredible. It allows for a lot of, I guess, economic opportunities, but more so opportunities that we haven't necessarily seen or probably even contemplated to begin with. Because at the end of the day, the internet bought forth, you know, allowing for a unified communication channel. Whereas with Bitcoin, you now have a global unified monetary communication channel because at the end of the finance is just communicating monetary units and ownership between individuals. So I think from that point of view, it's like having this general panacea of, I guess, freedom money that we haven't necessarily seen in human history. So I think that's, from that point of view, that's really where Bitcoin is unique. 
Yeah, I, in the end, I believe that uh, all these human rights use cases will prove the point that Bitcoin is basically the most uncensorable, decentralized uh, cryptocurrency. So I think, um, as I said also before, the example of my friend who was arrested for using Bitcoin, I also think that Bitcoin actually is a silent revolution because in these countries, people are not talking about that they are using Bitcoin. A human rights activist won't go around and say on Twitter, I'm using Bitcoin, you know. And um, so I believe that we will see that there will be a lot of examples like the Nigerian Feminist Coalition, Alex Navalny, um, and other examples that we have, uh, where we will see that these organizations and grassroots developments and activists cannot be shut down financially anymore because if they are using USDT, for instance, which a lot of people do in uh, African countries, definitely more than Bitcoin, but I mean, USDT can be cut off at any time fr from the government or we don't know what happens with it. Yeah, it's not decentralized. And so I believe uh, that Bitcoin's true power lies in those uh, activists, use cases, and in human rights, yeah. Bitcoin is just a way in which we talk about freedom. Like, it, it doesn't matter of the technology or whatever Satoshi did. It's a way in which we can teach people, like, there is other way to do things. And I'm coming for a country that is not living in a democracy, but it could happen in any country. So it's not just for the global South people, it's for everybody that live in this world, because yes, choose, choose your government, but maybe they feel like they don't want to do what they promised to do. So at the end of the day, it's just a way to talk about freedom in places where freedom is forbidden. It's a way to inspire people to do things that they think that can do because the government says so. So at the end of the day, it's a way to avoid the control that we are used to. It's a way to, yes, inspire people to dream in other world that can be built. And yes, Bitcoin is decentralized. It is censorship resistant, but it's the people that use it that make it to make sense in the world. So. You know, sometimes I have the impression we tend to forget that Satoshi Nakamoto was a cypherpunk and then the whole goal of the cypherpunk movement was to develop software to protect the right to privacy and the right to privacy is a human right. Nobody cares, but it is a human right. So the way I see it, uh, Bitcoin, it's the way it is because it's been specifically engineered to be a tool to protect human rights, a political tool, a tool to, to, to uh, a weapon, a weapon to protect people, a non-violent weapon to protect civil rights and financial freedom around the world. Everything else, the way I see it, is a beautiful consequence to this, you know, Core, uh, uh, core feature. Yeah, for sure. And just to top that off, I think another thing we missed technically in a lot of these conversations because people like to not have hot takes in general, not really <laughs> kind of go against the orthodoxy in Bitcoin spaces. But I think there's a huge geopolitical angle to Bitcoin that I think is missing in a lot of these conversations. I'm obviously not going to dig that deep hole, <laughs> that rabbit hole here. But in general, I'd say for Africa, for example, is very interesting because at the end of the day, we don't necessarily have economic freedom on that financial side, especially in Francophone Africa. So I think it'll be an interesting vertical to see moving forward how countries in general actually leverage Bitcoin to kind of de-risk and move away from mo most of these post-colonial structures that they have. Definitely, yeah. Um, looks like that's time. Thank you to the audience for your time, and thank you for to the panelists for thank you. their insights. Let's give a round of applause. That was another fantastic panel. Really insightful stuff. Well moderated by Ash, and we've just broken the stage. No, it's okay. Um, this has been a really fantastic day so far, but I hope that you guys who've paid for a ticket to come all the way here to meet like-minded people, to share ideas, I hope that you are all taking advantage of this wonderful opportunity to do so. 
So please think, if you haven't spoken to that person yet, if you haven't spoken to Anna on the front row and said, hey, Anna, that was a great conference, now's your time to do so. Um, if you haven't spoken to Ricky and Laura, who are traveling around the world trying to spread Bitcoin knowledge, now's your time to do so. If you haven't said hello to Anita and said, you know what, your work in Zimbabwe really inspired me to do my own little contribution to this weird, wonderful mission of Bitcoin, please do so. Don't be, you know, going back to your world, your lives on Monday, thinking to yourself, man, I missed that opportunity. So please do take that in your hands. Now, I don't know if he's here yet. Has anyone located? He is here? He is here. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we've gone from Bitcoin is, you know, all about human rights to Bitcoin is right. Now, there's been lots of curious, provocative, uh, endearing presentation names, you know, ranging from Giacomo's presentation this morning. Unfortunately, I'm definitely a midwit, and that was a really tough pill to swallow for me. I got over it, I think, um, to, you know, Ricky's talk this afternoon on the Cypunk stage describing, you know, is Bitcoin a CBC, CBDC in El Salvador? And now we have another provocative talk from Robert Breedlove, who I can now see, which is Bitcoin is right. So I'm hoping he's going to shed some light on what that means. And with that out of the way, please, could you welcome Robert to the stage? Would you like a microphone or a stand? Yeah. Hello, hello. So today's <clears throat> talk is Bitcoin is right. And I've I got to give credit to my friend Alex Svetsky, actually, for incepting this idea in my mind originally. I forget when, when we were having this conversation, but he was making the point that Bitcoin is fundamentally right in a lot of different ways. And so it got me thinking, what does that mean, right? What does it mean? What does it mean to be right? What does this word mean? I bet you couldn't guess, actually, how many entries are in the definition for the word right? Does anyone have a guess? 21, close? 34, 34 entries for that one little word, right? Sounds like a simple word, but clearly has a lot to unpack. So for our purposes today, I want to focus on three of those definitions of the word right, three senses of the definition of the word right. The first is the obvious one, right? Right as in true or correct as a fact, right? As in the sentence, all her answers were right on the test, right? It's either right or wrong objectively. The second sense of the word right is this idea of a moral or legal entitlement to, to something or to do something, right? As in, in this nation, we honor property rights, or we just had a panel talking about human rights. This is the second sense of the word right. And then third is the idea of something being morally good, justifiable, or acceptable. And this is the classic sense of knowing right from wrong, right? What is the right thing to do? What is the wrong thing to do in a moral sense? And so, again, the title of the talk is Bitcoin is Right Today. And so I want to argue initially that Bitcoin is right. Of those 34 senses of the word right that are in the, definition, the dictionary, I'm going to argue that Bitcoin is at least right in these three senses. And then I want to dig more into the word right itself and why it's so interesting that Bitcoin is right. So, first of all, in the sense of right as true or correct as a fact, it's pretty obvious that Bitcoin is right in this sense. Right? It is a system based on 100% verification and 0% trust. So, it's systematically rejecting error, bias, and misinformation to create the world's only indisputable and unalterable set of records, right? It is, it is right in an objective sense in a way that nothing else humans have ever created is. So obviously Bitcoin is quite right. And so and another way of saying that is Bitcoin is the only source of history that is absolutely right in the sense that its records are perfectly true and correct. And so we can, this is extremely important, right? Because every other history we've had in the world has been alterable. You know, it's often said that history is written by the winners. Uh, Napoleon said, 
History is a set of lies agreed upon. And interestingly enough, there is no historical evidence to prove that Napoleon actually said that, which I always thought was funny. And so Bitcoin stands out as an exception to that, to history being the set of lies universally agreed upon, in that it's a truth, right? It is fundamentally correct. It's unalterable. It's unchangeable. And therefore, it stands apart from the rest of history. It really stands out as something that's dependable, reliable, true, in a way that we can't corrupt or break ourselves. So really important in that way. So to sum up, as a singular source of unshakable truth, Bitcoin is right in the first sense of the word right. Secondly, Bitcoin is right in, ad, in that it is the world's strongest form of private property. Now, we often hear the term private property rights. Right? This is that second sense of the word right in that it's a legal or moral entitlement to something or to do something. And we, t we just, again, had the panel on human rights up here. I think there's a very strong argument to be made and I'm inspired by Ayn Rand on this, that property rights are foundational to all human rights. Ayn Rand has a great quote. She says, the right to life is the source of all rights, and the right to property is their only implementation. Without property rights, no other rights are possible. Since man has to sustain his life by his own effort, the man who has no right to the product of his effort has no means to sustain his life. Unquote. So if you can't preserve the fruits of your own labor across time, then all other human rights are virtually irrelevant. Right? It's fundamental to be able to control your own destiny that you can control the fruits of your own labor. And so Bitcoin is interesting in this regard. We could say it's the ultimate tool for preserving life, liberty, and property, something I like to talk about a lot on the show. Since Bitcoin's very difficult to seize from someone, it actually lowers the profitability of coercion and violence, which preserves life. Since Bitcoin can be stored in any information-bearing medium, right, paper, computer hard drive, human mind, it can easily be moved across geographic boundaries, which preserves liberty. And then finally, since Bitcoin specifically stored in a multi-sig is virtually impossible to separate from its owner, it is the strongest form of private property human beings have ever had, thus preserving property. And so as a tool for preserving life, liberty, and property, Bitcoin is concordant with the core ethos of natural law. And natural law has evolved over time, but you can surmise and crystallize the whole thing into one brief phrase, which is do not steal. Right? This is something we've been trying to incentivize one another to do for a long time, and we've used many means to do it. And to break this down, it, you know, to kill someone, we say life, liberty, and property, but you can kind of condense it all into, into do not steal or don't take my property when you consider that you own yourself and you own your own movements. To kill someone is to steal their life, right? You're taking their future freedom. To incarcerate someone or restrict their movement is to take their liberty or to take their present freedom. And then to expropriate assets from someone is to take the fruits of their past freedom. So this is the natural law ethos. Do not steal, right? Do not hurt people. Do not restrict them. Do not take their stuff. And so Bitcoin, in this sense, I think, is right in that it makes stealing more difficult or less profitable and therefore less prevalent in the world, right? If the activity is less profitable, then we would expect a remodeling of the general patterns of human action away from theft, away from coercion, away from violence, and toward the only way to acquire wealth on a Bitcoin standard, which is to render useful, valuable services to one another. And so it kind of tilts the whole world towards this do not steal ethos that is core to natural law. So to sum up the second sense of the word right, 
Bitcoin is the world's strongest form of private property, so it is right. Now, looking at the third sense of the word right, which is something that is morally good or even righteous, right, in the sense of right from wrong. I think one of the most important lessons, I don't know if we ever fully learned this lesson, actually, the ability to discern right from wrong. What is the right thing to do? What is the wrong thing to do? Right? We're constantly wrestling with these moral conundrums throughout life. And as humans, I think one, maybe I'm looking at things through a, a certain perspective, having studied money and whatnot for so long, but it seems to me like one of the definitively wrong things we can do in the sense of right or wrong is print money. Now, if you are the one that can print money, you might think it's right because you can use it to plunder savings from other people. But it really hurts everyone else significantly bad. Um, printing money, for instance, steals from prudent savers and gives to imprudent politicians, bureaucrats, warmongers, etc. Printing money widens the gap between rich and poor, which destabilizes society. When the purchasing, the purchasing power that is stolen through the printing of money is used to fund fake news, propaganda, warfare, etc. Printing money distorts price signals, which causes the misallocation of capital and drives the boom and bust business cycle, so it makes things more volatile, less predictable. And then finally, printing money incentivizes producers to deceive consumers by covertly decreasing the quality of their products instead of overtly increasing their prices. You're actually sowing this temptation for deception into the heart of the economic system. Now, if you look at it in this way, a question that I really wrestle with is if printing money is wrong on all these levels, right, it's pragmatically wrong, it's morally wrong, etc., isn't the idea of removing the option to print money something that's right on all those same levels? Now, philosopher David Hume famously said that you cannot get an ought from an is. And what he meant by that is that it's very difficult to transition from descriptive statements of reality, telling me something like describing what is, and transitioning to a normative statement, what should be. But when I see all of these negative impacts of printing money, right, the, the is of printing money, aren't we able to say that's something we ought not to do? In other words, isn't printing money unethical, right? Isn't it immoral and unethical? And so an example that I like to use here by way of analogy, for a long time, doctors thought bloodletting was a really good strategy for healing their patients, right? Just cut their veins, drain their blood, get the disease out. Well, eventually we learned that that's actually a really bad idea. That actually harms the patient, hurts the organism, prevents your ability to heal, right? Does the opposite of the intention. And so eventually we decided, well, that's the is of bloodletting. It's harmful for the patient, so we ought not to do it. Hence the origination of medical ethics, right? The, the uh, Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath, the first portion of that, First, do no harm, right? Obviously, you were doing harm by bloodletting, so don't do bloodletting. And if we consider, I don't know, Bitcoin is maybe like the introduction of monetary ethics, something like that. Like the, um, since printing money is effectively this economic bloodletting, we could just say, hey, let's stop doing that. It's really dumb. Hurts local economies, drives nations into war, increases the scale, scope, and severity of warfare, as we saw in World War I and World War II. And so, with, with money that can't be printed, we could like put an end to this, this bloodletting process. And so, if that's, if that's correct at all, then Bitcoin's more than money, right? It's, it's almost like a system of ethics itself that's energized by economic incentives. Right? It's actually inducing us to honor life, liberty, and property, rewarding us to honor life, liberty, and property, or at least making it less 
rewarding or less profitable to violate life, liberty, and property, therefore causing us to do it less. And so, as we said earlier, if Bitcoin is this incentive system built on the moral principle of do not steal, then it kind of is this, this system of ethics. So it's, it's, it's right in this interesting moral, ethical way that we might not consider money to be. And so I, I think this is a very novel innovation because historically we've always used the proverbial stick to get people to behave ethically, right? Don't rob your neighbor or you'll go to jail. You know, pay your taxes or you're going to get fined. There's always the threat, the stick, that's getting people to behave ethically. But Bitcoin is the proverbial carrot, actually, that we're actually just getting rewarded to behave ethically. That you, when you render valuable services to your fellow man, you're rewarded, right? Your sat stash increases. So I think that's really interesting. So to sum up, you know, if fiat money is used to facilitate widespread theft in a surreptitious way that most people don't understand, and the purchasing power is stolen, that is stolen is used to fund fake news, fake wars, fake crises, etc. Then Bitcoin's the opposite of that, right? So to the extent that theft, deception, and violence are unethical or wrong, then Bitcoin is right, right? It's a counter force to all of that. And in short, you might say, to the extent that stealing, if we're just talking about the, the natural law dictum, do not steal, to the extent stealing is wrong, Bitcoin is right in a moral sense. So to sum up all three of those, those senses of the word right, Bitcoin is right in the sense that it is an incentive system optimized for truth, human rights, and moral righteousness. Right? It's correct. It's inviolable private property, which is the basis of all human rights. And it's right to the extent that stealing is wrong morally. So it's morally righteous. So that's my argument for why Bitcoin is right. Now this is where I think things get, how much time do I have left? 350, I didn't have enough time for this. Okay, I'll try to go fast. This is where things get very interesting actually. Um, why, why am I focused on the word right? What's up with the word right? Why is it so important? Etymology, you guys have heard of etymology, right? The study of word history, which is really the study of the evolution of words from their roots to their contemporary meanings. So we can trace back words we use today, trace back their history and evolution across time, and you can really trace most all natural languages back to one, which is the Proto-Indo-European language. So there's this whole genealogy of languages that are, that are uh, traceable all the way back to the root. Now, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here. So when you look backwards to the tree of language, you see a number of things. You see how our conceptual framework you know, language is the container we put our conceptions into, but obviously languages change over time and languages are different in different places. When you look at these meanings across multiple languages and the development of language, you can see through language to the actual conceptual framework itself. So when you look at the word right and you trace it all the way back to the beginning, you arrive at one of the most profound and perhaps one of the most ancient ideas in human history. Now, right is derived from the Proto-Indo-European morpheme RT, a morpheme being like a component of a word. And right is also derived uh, alongside other RT words such as arithmetic, aristocrat, art, rhetoric, worth, right, R-I-T-E, as in a ritual or religious act, ritual as an RT word, right as in W-R-I-G-H-T, this is like a builder or a maker, like a playwright or a screenwright. I'm sorry, a shipwright or a willwright. And then write in the three senses of the word we mentioned earlier. Truth, human rights, and moral righteousness. Now when you look more closely at how that morpheme RT appears in each of these words, in aristocrat and arithmetic, the RT reference is to firstness. 
So an aristocrat is someone who is first in terms of socioeconomic superiority, right? They're on top of the heap. They're at the top of the hierarchy. Arithmetic is the first and most important scientific discipline. In art and right, W-R-I-G-H-T, R-T refers to being created or of beauty. In ritual, R-T suggests a repetitive order. And in right that we discussed earlier, the three senses, it means truth, human, uh, truth, human rights, and moral righteousness. So if you combine all these senses of the word right and its, its RT morpheme and you, you say Bitcoin is right and you start to unpack the meaning of right in this etymological sense, you could say something like, Bitcoin is the first created, beautiful, and repetitive order of truth, human rights, and moral righteousness. Sounds crazy, I know. 30 seconds left. So if we look at the, this, the language of Sanskrit, which is actually the one that is most, said to most closely resemble Proto-Indo-European, we find this term, this RT term called Rita, R-T-A, which is called the cosmic order of things. That's what Rita meant. And this comes from the Rig Veda. This is a book from modern day Pal uh, Pakistan that originated from like 3,500 years ago. Rita was said to be, all the gods were the guard, guardians of Rita. So they were trying to do the right thing and they were trying to make sure that those that they, their subjects also did the right thing. Uh, Rita is also a Vedic legal concept. It's an insistence that law is imperative and operated independently, which parallels Bitcoin's apolitical nature. It's a focus on the sacrifices made which parallels Bitcoin's proof of work. And it's a motivation for individuals to act in conformity with the universal principles of truth, which parallels Bitcoin's radical honesty and ethical incentives that we discussed earlier. So, as Rita pertains to justice in particular, it was said to be the highest end of, in the spiritual domain one that would be expressed by an unalterable system of rules. Again, this is from 3,500 years ago they were talking about this. Rita, where we get the word right, its highest expression would be an unalterable system of rules. Hmm, interesting. As a scholar, M. Hirayana summarized this concept. He said, quote, Rita, which etymologically stands for course, originally meant cosmic order the maintenance of which was the purpose of all the gods, and later it also came to mean right, so that the gods were conceived as preserving the world not merely from physical disorders, but also from moral chaos. The one idea is implicit in the other, and there is order in the universe because its control is in righteous hands, unquote. So in other words, according to this ancient concept, the physical order of the universe is inexorably bound to the moral order of the universe. Rita represents both the physical and the moral ordering of the universe. This is, again, the root of the word right. It's fascinating to me that Bitcoin is this system rooted in physical reality via proof-of-work mining. It produces perfectly ordered records and an unalterable system of history. And by virtue of its perfect monetary integrity, it's incentivizing us into proper moral action or ethical behavior. So perhaps Bitcoin, when we say Bitcoin is right, we're saying Bitcoin is the greatest instantiation of this ancient concept called Rita, which is absolute rightness in both a physical and moral sense. And if so, then Bitcoin is not just a new idea, but it's a modern implementation of one of the most ancient ideas we've ever had. The idea of rightness itself as contained within this concept of Rita. So, in summary, Bitcoin is right. Right is a really big word. And maybe that's why Bitcoin's price chart is always up and to the right. Thank you. Fantastic. Well done, Robert. Um, you missed off one really, really, really important right, though. 
Bitcoin is not Craig. <laughs> Sorry. I can't say that on camera, though, because I'm very worried about the consequences. Anyway, we've now got a very, very full house. And as Robert segued us into, we have not spoken about the price that much at all today, which is why the next panel is just so important. Um, have you all had a very good day so far? I can't actually see to the back of the room. This is great. Have you had a good day so far today? Yeah? Are you looking forward to the next panel? It is called When 100K. You're looking forward to it? Come on, make some noise, guys. Woo! <laughs> I'm actually going to invite everyone to the stage one by one, as it's the last panel. And you know, it's Riga, it's the OG Bitcoin conference. So I'm going to welcome to the stage first, Stefan Levera, who is the podcast host we all turn to when we're struggling with that current thing in the Bitcoin space. Who have we got next? I see a Dylan Leclerc. Dylan, you want to come up next? Don't be put off by his eternal youth. He is one of the best macro Bitcoin analysts, and I am scared about the next time he's going to dunk on me on Twitter. Please welcome to the stage. <laughs> you got a microphone? You got a microphone? One, two. Fantastic. Uh, looking around. Dr. Adam Back. Of course, he needs no introduction. He's the CEO of Blockstream. He's mentioned on the white paper. And do not challenge this man to a game of Jenga. You will lose. I learned that firsthand, unfortunately. And he'd never played Jang before in his life. Next up, we have Teo Demista, who is a prolific Bitcoin writer, researcher, analyst, and also increasingly an amateur hallucinogenic aficionado. Can I say that? I think someone else has listened to that podcast. And where's Raheem? Raheem, this is the Austrian economist's Austrian economist. Can I say that? Yeah? Okay, please welcome to the stage. This panel is called When 100K. It is the last panel of the day. Make sure you're getting the most of your Riga experience. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right. So we've got a very serious panel, very serious topic. Uh, you know, this is going to be a very scientific panel, I'm sure. Um, and so, look, let's just start with this. Obviously, the question is when 100K. So let's just, you know, let's just have a first answer from everybody, when 100K, and then we'll, then we'll get into it, and we'll kind of really talk about what it's going to take to get us to 100K and other things. Let's start with you, Dylan. When I 100K? I don't know. <laughs> um, bef before the halving. Before the halving, okay. And what's the current, it's like April next year, May next year, around, around then? Yeah. I'm leaning at him, yeah. I think sooner than most people think. Okay, and Rahim. Well, so many people told me that 100K is the time when they sell the first Bitcoin. So I'd expect a correction before 100K, but it'll be quick. Uh, yeah. And so pretty but, soon, 2024. But when, but when 100K? 2024. 2024 as well. Okay, so we've got three people who are saying 2024 and Dylan. I'm the bear, I guess. Being, but... being a bear. <laughs> I mean, well, maybe. I mean, you just said you don't know, so we haven't really got a time frame from you yet. Yeah, I, I would say um, after the halving is my guess, but uh, usually I'm not the bear in the room for Bitcoin discussions. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, like the 100K, we can focus on that, but I guess maybe we just yeah. talk general market conditions. Yeah, for I sure. Mean. For sure. Yeah, so let's, let's hear a bit. Um, uh, what is it going to take? Well, okay, let's go into that. What's it going to take to get us to 100K? Do we, need to, do we need the world to understand that we need to end the Fed, or can we get there without ending the Fed? Well, I mean, I think a related question is, do we need a US ETF, spot ETF approved to get there? And um, I think also the, the assertion that it might happen before the halving was viewed as brave because uh, typically looking at previous cycles, the Bitcoin price tended to increase after the halving, like six to nine months after. And so I think the argument is just that well, you know, we got we got to 69,000 and 65,000 um, just from people buying. No, no, like not much institutional, not not ETFs. So, you know, why not again? I think the everything has been held back by like a raft of silliness in the in the real world. You know, COVID and the Ukraine war and supply chains and DeFi failures and FTX and all this stuff. And none of it, I mean, some of those things matter, but none of them should be bad news for Bitcoin. Like exchanges failing, DeFi failing, that's good. You want the silly stuff to be washed out, actually. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's not the end the Fed cycle yet. I think it's the more Fed action 
cycle still, so I'd expect more inflationary monetary policy to drive uh, <laughs> the next hike again, because, I mean, it's still a fight about this asset. It's still from the correlations. It's uh, still looking like a high-risk asset. I, I would like gut feelings in like two-thirds of the price action is the speculative bias and there's the constant find of the DCA army uh, like driving the rest uh, and I don't think in this cycle will will like breach the 50% DCA army uh, which finally will break the correlations with the other risk assets and then it's end the fed time hopefully yeah yeah i think i uh, go on to Oh, sure. I, I would just say we don't need any particular outside event. We just need for the smart money to just keep buying Bitcoin because there's only so much of it. At some point, the available supply gets dried up and you can only buy more at much higher, higher prices. It's interesting you point out the available supply. Obviously, people talk about lost coins, right? So they say, you know, theoretically, Patoshi, which is uh, the, rumored to be Satoshi's coins, which have not moved other than the famous uh, 50 BTC transaction from Satoshi to Hal in the early days. So there's like a million coins that, you know, Patoshi coins. There's probably another two or three million lost, lost coins that have not moved for over 10 years. So really, if you go 21 million minus, let's say, four, really at the total issuance, we're talking like 17 million. Out of that 17 million, you know, there's a lot of those, there's like a small chunk of the coins that actually trade around, and then the rest are being hodled by hodlers, by, by you guys. Uh, any reflections to add on that? Yeah, um, I mean, you, you can look at it and quantify it a bunch of different ways. You can look at coins one year, two year, five year. You know, Glassnode has like a long term holder quantification. You know, like 80% of, 70% of coins haven't moved in six plus months. And you can look at like statistically, coins are less likely to be, he to, to be spent, to be moved the longer they're held, which intuitively makes sense, but we can actually see that with the UTXO set with the transparent data. So, like, supply is super primed, right? We're just, the question you know, when 100K or what's the next cycle, you know, one and the same, it's what's the catalyst, right? And I think obviously this body TF is one of the, the catalysts. Um, maybe the question is, oh, well, what is the SEC waiting for? And, you know, everybody likes to rag on Gensler, myself included, but uh, it's not just Gary's decision, right? This body ETFs were denied in the past, rightfully so or not. Should, like, should they have approved the futures ETF or not? We can debate those things, but I think one of the things they're concerned about is the offshore stuff, the, you know, derivative casinos, all of that sort of thing. So does that need to be wiped out? Like, you know, I'm not an, you know, I'm not a statist. I'm not saying we need to regulate these markets, but that's how they view it, right? That's how Larry Fink and the SEC and all of those guys view it, right? So I think we have a little bit of time. Who knows? Maybe that's, you know, completely wrong and the SEC rolls out the approval for the, SEC, the ETF next week. But if we're thinking about, like, where are the next tens of billions of dollars of inflows coming from, right? Like, there is a passive DCA crowd, right? Many of you here, including myself, passively DCA. Um, but unfortunately, like, that wall of money that we're currently deploying is pennies compared to the big boys on Wall Street. And unfortunately, they don't want to hold in a custodial multisig. They want to hold in a nice ETF wrapper, um, right? Like, if you just think of the past cycle, Grayscale bought 300,000 Bitcoin um, and it was incentivized by that premium, right? That everybody tried to put on this trade. But that was one of the biggest drivers. Like, Michael Saylor is the talking point and micro strategy, but GBTC was a massive driver. So if we think about BlackRock or whoever with the ETF, I think that's something to point to about, you know, what this, what this next catalyst comes. And, you know, what the timeline is on that, I'm not certain. I have no idea what they're thinking, but that's an obvious one. Um, otherwise, supply is just going to continue to get more constrained. Um, until, you know, until this crowd here and everybody that's passively DCAing is enough to send the price up, um, or we're just continuing to further prime the supply for when that match is, you know, finally lit. Um, I mean, I think the, you know, people look at the um, on-exchange Bitcoin metric as well, and that's also going down. And, you know, if, if some of these exchanges run out of Bitcoin, things are going to get crazy, right? Now... Some, I think the exchange liquidity is generally down, like in terms of just trade volume. Um, another, ex so, so yeah, like people just keep buying and it will just reduce and reduce the available Bitcoin to buy. Another, another form of buying is, you know, there is, apart from GPTC, there's MicroStrategy. Um, 
In May and June this year, they bought about $350 million worth of Bitcoin. Tether is another big buyer. Yeah, Tether is committed, I think, 15% of revenue, and they have pretty big revenue because of the interest on the Tether float and the high interest rates. Um, Mark strategy is doing more. I don't know if people noticed, but they uh, did a disclosure that they'd got permission to sell another $750 million worth of MicroStrategy stock. Looking at the kind of ratio of uh, MicroStrategy to Bitcoin, I think they commenced that like, last month. So probably by the end of the year, MicroStrategy will have bought a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin at, at some quite advantageous prices, I might add. So, you know, um, and I think there are some kind of self-reinforcing things where when the prices are high, I mean, a lot of the miners like to keep the coins they mine, especially these public companies that are prop mining. Uh, so when, when the prices are low, they have to sell a disappointing proportion of the coins they mine. As soon as the prices get a bit higher, they save more, you know, they, take, they don't sell as much because they don't need to to cover their operating costs, right? So that's a kind of sort of self-reinforcing thing. Good point. To us. Yeah, I just want to comment on something that I, I, I've heard here a little bit on the panel, and of course you can hear it all over in, in you know, market commentary and, and things like that when people talk about Bitcoin, is that there's so many objections to why you know, regular people or Wall Street people don't want to buy Bitcoin. And I think what's underappreciated is just how precarious um, the situation is for the traditional financial system. Um, <clears throat> we had the the bank runs that happened in the US on Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic and some other banks, um, you know, this problem is not solved. It was, it was papered over uh, and it's ongoing. And we actually had, in, if you correct for inflation, we had bigger bailouts than what happened in 2008. And it's still ongoing. Like there's more shoes to drop likely. I, I saw, um, I think it was Schwab in the news, like a giant brokerage who, um, you know, maybe getting in trouble. And, 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 uh, and then additionally, we not only have financial institutions, we also have, uh, we have banks, uh, sorry, we have governments, of course, uh, who are facing rising interest rates. The U.S. is having to pay now uh, close to a trillion dollars in purely interest rate payments alone, which is uh, about to uh, become higher in expense than the entire military budget. You're talking about 20% of all the tax income generated by arguably the economically most powerful nation on the planet, you know, so, and that's just, so in Europe we have the same problems, it's a bit, little bit less talked about. So, so there's all these things that are happening, and to, you know, Rahim points, Rahim's point of earlier about the money printing and like the, 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 the increase of the money supply, that is a huge, um, you know, that's what Bitcoin is so correlated with. Whenever money supply goes up is when the smart money realizes there's inflation coming. And so, you know, I just, I just feel like these points are a bit underappreciated. Like we, we're so used to Bitcoin being like its own little bubble and not so connected to global macro events. But I think that's going to change. I think there's going to be a lot of buying coming from anxiety, coming from anger, like, like very different kind of emotional mindset coming from uh, uh, risk management, like trying to manage the risk of a traditional portfolio. Those are stories that were not part of the Bitcoin story up until this cycle, I think. Yes, uh, still, I, I totally agree with you, but I think it's the next cycle potentially when the family offices and so on see it as like a, a good addition to the portfolio. Uh, for now, I'd say an ETF alone, I don't think that'll bring in a lot of smart money. A lot of smart money these days still momentum. Uh, investing, so they'll wait for a change in the monetary policy. And uh, it's not that the central banks is that all powerful. It's it's this game of anticipated expectations and and uh, psycholo psychological uh, manipulation. Uh, and uh, uh, the play currently by the central banks is like increase the interest rates until either something breaks or we control inflation. Uh, the thing with something breaks, of course, we all know the fragility of the system, but they've proven that by giving unlimited guarantees, more or less, they are able to paper over a lot of things. So I'd rather expect the other uh, thing, uh, which means consumer good prices going down due to uh, impoverishment effect. So we have a lot of like crack crack up boom like spending. That's the term uh, Ludwig von Mises, you mentioned the Katastrophen Oz, uh, German French uh, uh, mix. Uh, uh, so I'd, I'd expect uh, when the impoverishment shows, 
that the central bank will do, of course, the craziest things, but from their logic is make the rich richer and <laughs> uh, change uh, the tendency of the interest rates. And then there'll be the sign. And if the EDF is ready, there'll be a lot of price action. So you mentioned this idea, and this definitely seems to be a prevailing, let's call it a prevailing macro narrative, which is this kind of people are waiting for something to break, the Fed to pivot, and then you know, start the printers again. Uh, that seems to be the narrative, right? That seems to be a commonly held narrative, uh, whereas currently the Fed is in a tightening cycle, let's say. Uh, but they seem to come out with new programs all the time, right? Like, so, you know, back in GFC 2008, it was QE and different various rounds of QE. Then it was, okay, we're going to do things at different stages of the, of the bond curve. The recent one is the BTFP, which came from the recent, you know, Silvergate uh, SVB crisis. What other programs... Could they, you know, l let's think about, you know, what, what kinds of things will there be that, you know, the government will, that government, particularly the US government, will try that allows them to try to sort of keep the system alive? Like, as an example, could they issue long-dated bonds, 50-year bonds, 100-year bonds, and try to sell those? Oh, they've done that already. I mean, one of the best performing assets last year, the year before, was the 100-year Austrian government bond, <laughs> which is a crazy idea, but it was the best performing asset. Uh, uh, but uh, central bank action is more about like keeping guarantees for things that are money substitutes or treated like money substitutes. So what are considered at the moment the most liquid and safest assets, so to say. And that, of course, means a lot of manipulation. It meant manipulation in the money market uh, uh, in, in particular. And probably we will see even manipulation in real estate, like buying up real estate by central banks or other assets. They think they need to prop up because otherwise it'll be panic. And in, in particular in Europe, real estate is like the savings device of the middle class. Uh, the upper middle class. Uh, so I, I think it's like guarantees to protect more and more wealth assets uh, into which people uh, flee because uh, the, the, the other assets they are using, the deposits or, or, or the uh, cash, uh, uh, bank deposits, cash currencies, uh, bonds and so on, don't uh, have that stability they are used to. Uh, Dylan, I'm sure you'll have some intelligent comment on uh, you know, what kind of macro level or policy responses you know, we, we might be likely to see. Yeah, um, I mean, I just look at the, the history of, of Fed tightening cycles, and I'm completely self-aware that I, I wasn't alive or living through uh, many of them, but just kind of uh, as a student of history, uh, you know, everybody's kind of, I think, classically conditioned from COVID to be like, rate cut, money printer go burr, up only, you know, when the, like, when the Fed cuts, or when, you know, when the Fed, Fed pivot is like the narrative. But if you just look at like Fed pivots, uh, you know, preceding COVID, stocks went down. And it's not like, oh, the Fed cuts and stocks go down because of that. But the Fed pivots because things start getting bad. And then, and then, you know, assets trough, you know, unemployment goes up a little bit and they stimulate, right? But, you know, I think the, the notion is that like, oh, you know, the, omni, the omnipowerful Fed, you know, has everything under control. Like, how do we get into this situation? Fed printed a bunch of money. After six months of printing, they said, we want inflation higher. The ECB said, we want inflation higher, right? Now inflation got way too high. They had to cut the fastest in history. And now they're saying, we, well, we want a little bit of unemployment. We, we, want a, you know, we, we, want, we want a small recession, or they don't say recession, but they, they speak around it, right? And so, you know, maybe this is naive, but I don't think they comprehend the second and third and fourth order effects of their policies. And, and you know, we just see this policy pendulum just over and over and over again of the Federal Reserve, of easing, tightening, and it's not just the Fed, it's the, just the idea of central planning in general, of, okay, tighten, loosen, and these massive asset bubbles and these busts. And so, you know, everybody's like, oh, well, soft landing, no landing, you know, NVIDIA to a million, and it's like, well, we probably see a slowdown um, because this is how Fed cycles work. So maybe that's naive. I mean, I'm, I'm a student of history. I haven't lived through it all. But, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that we see at least a small recession slowdown um, and some pain before, you know, they flip on the money printer and up only straight line again, right? Like, I think that may be a little bit of a, a you know, a, an error in some people's line of thinking. Yeah, I mean, apart, apart from the, you know, the uh, reduction in interest rates and the uh, recommencement of QE, when the next major thing breaks. I think the other factor is they, uh, you know, there's so much government debt 
that they own, that they can't afford to repay it. You know, as Ter was saying, like a trillion just to pay the interest rate, and that you know, if you print money, so borrow more money to pay the interest, you're just going to get out of control, and debt's going to get bigger and bigger. So I think the only real hope to keep the system going, they won't admit it, of course, is to have a long period of sustained high inflation so that they can shrink the real value of the debt. So I think that, that's like baked in. And so in my opinion, you're probably looking at, you know, a decade of 10 to 15% real inflation, like not, you know, the massaged uh, metrics. So of course, they're going to have to find an excuse to start printing sooner or later to make that happen. Yeah, and maybe it's also helpful to just remind ourselves that the Bitcoin market cap is, what is it now, like half? 500 billion, something? 500 billion, yeah, it's, it's totally peanuts in, in, you know, in the great big picture of things. And so not a lot of things or not a lot of people in the world need to all of a sudden have a moment of panic. Like it could be, you know, just something happens in Japan and it seems isolated, but that's 100 million people who are like looking to, you know, move their money or, or um, so, so I think that relatively small shocks around the globe could really uh, just send Bitcoin soaring. So speaking of shocks and supply shocks, obviously the halving, people talk about that reduction of supply and the fact that, the, you know, less fiat inflow has to come in to retain, to keep the price at a certain level. What's, what are your views there? How much does the halving matter to, you know, these cycles? Or, or some of you in the camp that, you know, that's not the important factor, it's something else, that it's, you know, a broader macro factor? So I have opinions on this. So, um, the, uh, people have said a lot of stuff about it, including that you know, the difference percentage-wise in reduction compared to the whole supply is relatively small or compared to you know, the, da the daily volume of new coins that are, that, where there's less produced compared to the daily volume of trading is small. But I think that those are not, not really useful metrics really what you care about is price formation, and most of that volume is, is speculative, right? And so the price formation is, you know, people sort of um, setting a floor, buying when it's low, or buying and holding for long term. But people just wash trading backwards and forwards, they're just, you know, it's a zero sum game. So that's not really part of the picture. And I think also, as people live through cycles, they learn to not trade and, and more like dollar cost average and hold, right? So you've got this kind of hodl wave, which I think is a way of saying the same thing. And so that means that increasingly, you know, more and more coins are taken off the market or they're put inside microstrategy or companies that hold and individuals that hold. And so, you know, the halving still then becomes significant compared to, you know, the actual price formation trading. Um, and so even, even though it's sort of definitionally shrinking by half each time, I think the hodl wave is chasing it, so it still stays relevant. And uh, of course, you know, if, you, if something's in an equilibrium and the rate of new supply drops in half, that's, you know, that's going to put it out of equilibrium um, and push the price up. I have a contrarian take on this. Um, and I agree at the margin, um, you know, cutting supply issuance in half does matter. Um, I think, obviously, there's diminishing returns, um, at least, you know, partially. Um, with, with the rate of issuance not you know, being cut by less of an uh, um, amount of the total supply. But I think, and maybe this is a bold take, but I think from, from here on out, maybe not the past halvings, um, definitely not the first two, but from here on out, I think the halving is more of a buy-side catalyst than a sell-side catalyst in the sense that, you know, whatever, we're go whatever the macro environment looks like, Fed cuts, Fed hike, inflation, you know, wh whatever, who cares? Regardless of that, it's just like this global advertisement. And, I, and, uh, and to, just to be frank, I've, I've only been in Bitcoin for one halving, 2020. You know, I was, I was uh, a freshman in high school for the, first, for the one before that. Um, but w what was it? It was this massive advertisement amidst COVID, QE, money printing, you know, Fed jargon, policy making, whatever. Well, Bitcoin's inflation, Bitcoin's issuance getting cut in half and no one can do a damn thing about it. And so... Each time that reinforces like a really powerful message that us in this echo chamber understand. We're like, yeah, obviously 21 million, like the having, the difficulty adjustment, but we're nerds, right? Like not everybody is in this echo chamber. Not everybody thinks about monetary policy, I promise you. And so, so when this, you know, when this event is like, again, 
It's like, oh, well, look at Google search trends. Bitcoin search is you know, way down. And it's like, well, yeah, people have heard about Bitcoin and they've had that second or third touch point, but they've done no digging. Right? It's like, oh, having, what, the number of coins is cut in half? Like, how many times I've gotten that is, like, is, is pretty wild. So, and I'm sure everybody here has had similar uh, conversations. So like, from a buy side catalyst, it's like money managers, average citizens, investors, you know, well, you can't do a damn thing about this, and it's getting, you know, the flow is getting cut in half. And it's like, well, damn. Meanwhile, Japan's printing, the Eurozone's a mess, Jay Powell's quaking in his boots, and it's like, it's powerful. So that's my, that's my opinion on, on the halving. Uh, the stock-to-flow model is wrong, but the concept of stock-to-flow is correct and important for Bitcoin. As long as the stock of Bitcoin is not held entirely or a majority by long-term hodlers, the supply will mainly come from the stock uh, and that'll be more important. So it's only eventually uh, that the flow will be that important. So I, I think now in the short term, we're still in the short term, the halving is more important as a kind of narrative and reinforcing the idea that it's limited in supply rather than really changing that much the sub supply structure. Well, the timing has been good a couple of times as well where the uh, mainstream media financial news has been talking about quantitative easing and Tara and I have been talking about the halving as the quantitative hardening, right? So it's the opposite, right? So they're printing more money, Bitcoin is reducing the rate of uh, new coin emission. I just agree with what everybody has been saying. <laughs> okay, well, what about growing the DCA army? Can it be done? Is that an important factor? Is that something we should all, should we all be obnoxiously growing the DCA army? Or is there other fact, are there other factors that matter more? It's happening all the time. I mean, we see the empirical data, and uh, of course, I mean, anecdotally, uh, it's obvious that other uh, asset classes are gradually replaced, or there's a tendency to think about replacing asset classes because a lot of like the learned wisdom is, is refuted <laughs> empirically. So you start thinking about other safe assets, and then uh, it's, it's a small step. First, you add a little bit to a portfolio, then more, and then you shift uh, asset classes, and that's already happening. Of course. I just love the term fiat mining. <laughs> That's all. Well, I mean, look, and here's the other thing, right? I think there's a lot of focus on things like, well, no, uh, to be clear, uh, it's not a lot of focus, but as an example, people are focusing on these, like, as an example, 1% back for buying with Bitcoin. But I think the other big driver is how many people are earning in Bitcoin. And even if you can't directly natively earn with Bitcoin, are you just, you know, are you stacking with it or are you using some kind of service that auto flips it into Bitcoin and then you're hodling the savings from that? Maybe that's the big driver in terms of growing that, uh, that upwards uh, passive flow. Yeah. But fiat mining is the other way around, right? Yeah, I guess technically you, you mine fiat in order to DCA. Like we work in the fiat mines and then flip, our, <laughs> flip that into sats, you know, that's the... Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, the DCA army is obviously impactful. The hodlers set the floor. Um, one of the things I think is, is different this cycle going into it, um, you know, post-2020 world where, I mean, we already we saw, you know, 10K to 60K in a few months, basically a straight line. But what that cycle brought was, and, and you know, Bitcoin's been a macro asset for people that understand it as such for a while, but it brought a legitimization to it, even though price crashed and it did Bitcoin's normal boom and bust phase at just an order of magnitude higher, it brought an, a, a class of investors that did not participate or could not participate previously. Like Mass Mutual took like, as a big insurance company in the States, put like 20 basis points or like 10 basis points of their like trillion dollar portfolio and it's like $500 million. And, and they're not selling that for 30 years, right? Because they have liabilities dated out 30 years. And so they, they're going to hold treasuries and they're going to hold a bunch of boring stuff, but they're going to buy the, as much as a million, you know, DCAers, and so are all of their buddies this next cycle. You know, the, the, the passive flows that, that come to equities and bonds are unfathomable. We can't, like Bitcoiners, it's just like, Bitcoin is just a joke. Like, and when we say they can't even buy it yet, it's because it's so small that even half of half of the flows that they want to put in, they can't yet because it would send the market, right? And that sounds crazy, but the flow is so constrained. Bitcoin is hodled so tight, which is a feature, 
right? It's so illiquid, it's so inelastic relative to demand that marginal flows come in and Bitcoin's price rockets up. So these guys, like, it's, they want to buy Bitcoin. They understand, a lot of them understand this stuff and, you know, they go home and watch Michael Saylor on YouTube. But the, a $10 million purchase is not, is, you know, they don't think twice about that. So they, like, it's not even worth the conversation until Bitcoin's 50K, 100K. And that sounds ridiculous, but it's not because there is so much capital out there that's just passively buying S&P 500 indices, passively buying BlackRock corporate bond index, long-dated treasuries. And so when Bitcoin just gets included in that conversation, as it just barely did last cycle, in my opinion, then, you know, whether it's ETF or whatever this cycle, Bitcoin's going to capture this much of those flows, and it's going to be massive because there's just such a massive ocean of, of assets out there. Um, yeah, so um, another kind of glass nose type metric that was uh, being discussed a few months ago was the, um, the number of whole coiners. So looking at the number of UTXOs that own one Bitcoin or more, and it reached one million. So, you know, one, one point is people who've, you know, dollar cost averaged or accumulated and got to one Bitcoin are probably not going to sell that because that was a target they were trying to build to. And the other thing that it kind of started a conversation about as well, you know, how many more whole coiners can there be? You know, if you say, well, could we get to 10 million whole coiners? The answer is probably not because the price, they would push the price way out of reach, right? So it's just to say, I, I don't think it's, there's really, you know, too much, you know, too much more people dollar cost averaging. I think that alone could cause the price to run away from them accumulating a, a, a whole Bitcoin. And as I think we were talking uh, outside, uh, we were talking about this concept of unit bias, but actually acting in our favor, right? And so this is obviously people have, you know, for years we've been, people have been whinging about unit bias being against us because people go buy some random shit coin because, because they want a whole coin. But then don't forget, there'll be high net worth people who want a whole Bitcoin and there's not enough. So uh, do you, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, and also they, they'll want, you know, if they can't get a whole Bitcoin, they might want at least a million Satoshi or something, or 10 million Satoshi, you know, so th that's Unibuy's working in our favor. Um, something I just wanted to comment on briefly is, is there's a thought I find really tantalizing, which is just imagining uh, some, some random central bank, be it a large one or a small one, they're doing the board meeting, and uh, somebody brings up, like, hey, like, have you guys seen what Tether is doing? You know, they're DCAing. These guys are, it, you know, the, maybe the beginning of a DCA army in the institutional world. Uh, wh what about, maybe this is like some younger associate, like, what if we diversify a little bit of our, like, government bond portfolio that's starting to smell real bad into, you know, very small Bitcoin purchases? So, so I think that the central bank world is a whole world of, potential uh, dollar cost averaging that, that could just, you know, could be around the corner. Yes, yeah, so and there's a social psychological principle we both mentioned in our talks is the mimetic desire that will drive the whole <laughs> coin of competition. Well, yeah, look, I think, that's, I think there's a lot of comments there. Uh, we've, we're pretty much out of time now. I think it's been a great chat, though. So everyone, please put your hands together and thank, to, thank you to Rahim, Tua, Adam, and uh, Dylan. Thank you. Well done. That was a fantastic panel and a great way to finish off the day. Well done, gentlemen. I think it's also amazing that we started off the day speaking about 80 IQ plebs and we round off the day with the 120 IQ big brains. That does make me the midwit that took you on that journey, but it's also been my pleasure. Um, so thank you very much to you all for attending today. It's been a fantastic first day at Baltic Honey Badger. I believe Max is going to um, hopefully tell us where we're all drinking this evening and, you know, interacting with one another in the meat space. There he is. And he's also the guy that put it all together. So please welcome him back to the stage. It's his home. Well done. Yeah, guys, thank you for an amazing day, for an amazing panel. We're going to drink actually here. So you just go outside and there will be open bar and you can drink as much as you can. <laughs> See you tomorrow, guys. Don't drink too much.